I was fucking in the lab late one night when my eyes beheld an eerie sight. For my monster began to rise, and suddenly, to all my surprise, he did the mash. He did the monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. He did the mash. He caught on in a flash. He did the mash. The monster mash. Happy Halloween, welcome to Boo Roke Cannon for three more on theme facts. I went as 12 last Halloween, so it only makes sense to stay on theme, as I have come this year as Matt Smith's forehead, apparently. As for the singing, I do not apologise. I've had a few and singing is okay on holiday specials. The Monster Mash is also a bop, so there's your first fact. Jot that one down. Today, me and the Matrix have got dressed up. We've got vampires, witches, and zombies for you. Matrix, do the Matrix Mash. Ah, uh, goddamn, I was using the Great Matrix as a karaoke machine. Vampires. The Hooniverse is absolutely full of vampires. Second only to the Daleks, they are genuinely one of the most commonly returning foes in the series. Mostly because they look different every time they return. Sometimes they're hammer horror, sometimes they're monkeys, sometimes they're old ladies, and sometimes they're just fish. Under this bracket, we also have to count the Haemovores, who aren't just vampires in name, as the book Vampire Science tells us there are different strains of the same ultimate species. More contagion. Different waves of an infection. Or a curse, if we're being gothic this evening. The Doctor recently wound up in the Great Eternal Vampire Wars of Gallifrey in prehistory. Brilliant story. Rose got blooded. Rassilon is a black woman. And the vampires look like Nosferatu. The Doctor has vampire hatred burned into his bones. The Time Lord Ruif, childhood friend of the Doctor and all-round bad influence, eventually fell into a vampire cult and helped vampires invade Gallifrey. Like all Time Lords, the Doctor has to restrain his own murderous instincts when coming upon a vampire. And as seen in State of Decay, every single Time Lord, if they come across the Great Vampire, have a duty to kill it. And you know what? Fair enough. More of the Doctor's companions have been turned into vampires than Cybermen. There's Rose and Nyssa, Romana was blooded in a timeline where Rassilon was beaten by the Great Vampire. There's Hex's mum, and even Tegan. Jumping around the place, biting on necks and cowing like a mad woman. Standard Tegan behaviour. Paul Cornell was having a vampire phase. That's fine, we all do. Blood Invocation is the story that gives us this amazing panel. What has Mr. Davison seen? Well, a vampire cult on Gallifrey. For Blood Invocation is one story of many to tell us that Gallifrey has a big vampire problem, as the Doctor discovers that many of the Rassilon committees are in fact bloodsucker cults, operating out in the open for anybody to stumble upon. And that's where we find this. Rassilon the Vampire, we worship you in the long night. Rassilon the Vampire. And combining that with accounts from other stories does kind of cement the rumour that Rassilon probably was a vampire the whole time. We know that Rassilon the Immortal battled them in her first incarnation, but this was the same form that accidentally unleashed the great vampires into the universe in the first place. Amidst the eternal war, Rass became obsessed with killing, namely, the King Vampire. Interference Part 1 will tell you that Rass was exposed to vampire biodata in the war, which does add up with everything else we know about his character. Inspiring his obsession with living forever. I will not die. Whilst also punishing other Time Lords who wanted the same thing. It's unsurprising that Rassilon would end up confusing his prejudice as vampires and Time Lords shared 98% of the same biology. Whilst Time Lords had 14 regenerations, vampires had 15 covens. The vamps colonised with bites, whilst the Time Lords colonised with cats. Since then, vampires have turned up everywhere in the Hooniverse. The War Doctor watched on as they were thrown at the Daleks in the Time War. Where suddenly, oh damn, that looking a bit hench. From Chicago, where the Seventh Doctor let the Vampire Messiah loose on the town. To East Space in Vampire Town. NASA, of all people, conducted vampire experiments on necrobiologicals. And the Forge was, of course, originally established to create a World War I vampire super soldier serum. Uh, a sentence that somehow sounds completely normal when listening to the Project Trilogy. In context, that's a very serious story. <laughs> With Vampire Super Soldier Serum. Fact number two! Matrix! Work! 
Oh man, I'm gonna need to take this into the shop. Witches once ripped off the doctor's head. From the neck. Blood and guts and all. Uh, let, let's talk about this. I'm sure there's a simple resolution. Hold his head, sister. And push him to his knees. You don't understand. I came here to warn you of danger. Kill the anti-god. No. Behold the head of the desecrator. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but not talk about those witches, not those ones. This is Necromantia. Probably the most graphic and infamous Doctor Who adventure, known as the one where a companion is suggested to be raped. Yeah, I never said all these facts were going to be fun. Mild trigger warning for just about everything in the segment. Necromantia is the one that threatens Fifth Doctor companions with sexual assault. And yes, it's grim. But it also doesn't really happen. In all honesty, I was a little bit disappointed by Necromantia. When these Wilderness Years stories get mythologized and notorious as a result, my brain doesn't think, ooh, uh, that sounds dodgy, better avoid. My brain thinks, uh-oh, Doctor Who's trying some new ground. And I think most people would regard this as a failed experiment, to put it in the nicest of words. And it's definitely the shocking ending of part two to which people are referring. As Eremem fights off a mercenary trying to molest her, Perry wakes up naked in a room about to be sacrificed, and the Doctor is separated from his neck by a gaggling horde of witches, and this all happens simultaneously. I know this rubs people the wrong way, but what a cliffhanger. In reality, I think this story and its content has been a little bit over-exaggerated through the years. Perry does find herself butt naked, but with a respectful man who averts his gaze and gives her clothes. Someone not trying to ogle her, for a change. The Doctor wakes up in a weird Neverland cricket-themed afterlife at the 2050 Olympics, because of course he did. And honestly, by my account, Eremem seems to fight off her attacker. What is funny and deliriously dark is that the day is saved by sacrificing a cat. Eremem's cat in the TARDIS that we spoke about a couple episodes back. Sacrifices itself, probably possessed by an alien intelligence from a few audios prior, and jumps into the abyss, saving all of our main characters. Not many other stories you can say ends on that note. During production, Peter Davison got writer Austin Atkinson discontinued from Big Finish, presumably for the slightly sleazy treatment of his female regulars, but also for ripping his head off. There's just some things you don't do with Doctor Who. I, for one, absolutely disagree. Nobody tell Peter Davison about the goddamn novels. Oh god, should we dig one of them up? The only opposition are parcel women. That wasn't fighting. It was fun. It was a pity the general had ordered that the women shouldn't be armed. But where was the harm in a bit of friendly rape? That'd be doing him a favour. There's some very weird stuff in this era. In Blood and Hope, Perry Brown says the N-word. And even the Doctor's on a roll. Being distinctly out of character. Very well, said the Doctor. I'll do what I can, but I promise you this. If Perry's dead when I return, or if she doesn't recover afterwards, I'll kill you both. <laughs> right, Peter. Why should I give her priority when there are so many demands on me? Because I'll wring your neck if you don't, you conceited little swine. Doctor, calm down! Leaning forward, the Doctor fastened his teeth into the creature's neck, jaw muscles bulging as he clamped down hard. Well, can't blame him. She's a hot little piece right enough. Maybe he'll pass her around when he's done with her. He does that sometimes. Excuse me, Doctor Who? Imagine hot little piece, said in Peter Davison's voice. Anyway, I feel dirty. I don't want to touch this anymore. Necromancy is a fine story compared to some of those books. Judge it on its own merits, make up your own mind. It's a story about traumatic things happening. That doesn't mean it's tasteless. And fact number three. Birth of a renegade. Cybermen count as zombies, right? This story has a bizarre amount of similarities to the Timeless Children. I would call it a beta Timeless Children. Oh yeah, Chris Chavenel didn't just rip off Andrew Cartmel and Supremacy of the Cybermen, but specifically a Radio Times 1983 short story. This is my theory anyway. Birth of the Renegade is an origin, 
At first, the core mystery suggests a master revelation, but really, the renegade is referring to the Doctor. As back in their student days, the master incited a bunch of student riots attempting to assassinate the president. One is a movement, two is a hobby. In the master confronts the Doctor and his companions, and with the Cybermen he plans to overthrow the Time Lords legally by exploiting their constitution. Now that part doesn't sound very Whitaker. But the Master, revealing Time Lord hypocrisies and hidden secrets, reveals to the Doctor that the Time Lords wiped his memory of his earliest days, revealing the Doctor's backstory. As Lady Lan, otherwise known to us as Rose, otherwise known to us as Akiti, or otherwise known to us as Susan, is not actually the Doctor's granddaughter, only referring to him as such as a term of endearment. You know when people say we shouldn't have a definitive Doctor Who origin story, there shouldn't be any one reason we shouldn't ever see him leave Gallifrey or learn why? Well it's because of weird 1980s oddities like this. Susan isn't related to the Doctor because she's a descendant of Rassilons. But now with Gallifrey leaderless, the Master plans to take Susan as his puppet and rule Gallifrey with the Cybermen. I don't know what the Cybermen are bringing to this plan, but that's fine, they'll never stop Chibnall. Of course there's one big problem in this genius plan, Susan does not want to help the Master, and instead shoots him with his own tissue compression eliminator. Not your best plan, Ainley. The Doctor, Susan, Tegan and Turlow return to the TARDIS, chased by Cybermen who clearly have no clue what is going on and did not factor into this plan one bit, where they return Susan home. The Master reacts by being consumed by hatred and allowing the TARDIS to collapse around him. So he didn't take that very well. Goodbye, Doctor. I will now spontaneously combust. You heard it here first, the Doctor and the Master both left Gallifrey over student riots. And the Time Lords wiped his memory for it. Incidentally, a happy <laughs> Christmas to all of you at home. So reel me in, my precious girl. Come on, take me home Cause my body's tired of traveling And my, and my heart, heart don't, don't wish to roam Merry Christmas. It's a holiday, so I'm allowed to sing again. It wasn't very good, but that's fine. It's just a rip-off of Al Wilson's The Snake, anyway. So, we made it to Christmas. I hope you all found solace in this nightmare dystopia of 2020. I certainly did, in mountains of Who-themed homework and unusable Doctor Who trivia. So today, I leave three more facts with you before I take back off into the night. I've been told to keep this one upbeat, Matrix, so no existential revelations or necromantia smart, please. Matrix, go! Oh ho ho ho! A mythological character known in Britain? You better believe the Doctor's met him, beaten him, rewritten him out of history, met him again, slept with him, probably is him, because honestly that's just what I've come to expect at this point. Father Christmas, Saint Nick, Kris Kringle, Santa, Jeff, may or may not have been a fictional being. Many different sources and even different Doctors have different accounts on this. The Twelfth Doctor, for instance, isn't allowed to believe in Santa because he's the Doctor who doesn't believe in magic, despite many of his episodes containing magic. Whereas his successor actually met the big guy back in 2018. On Christmas Eve, his ride breaks down, whereupon he calls the TARDIS' home number on his iPhone. Whilst contradictory, yes, I love the idea that children's characters are debating whether Father Christmas is real or not. Much like Doctor Who's demographic in real life. Do you really believe in Santa Claus? Idiot. Grow up, Clara. The 11th Doctor claims that he knew him personally as Jeff. Now this does sound like something a kid would make up on the school playground to impress their mates, but no. In the Titan Comics Holiday Special, she genuinely asks the elves to speak to their manager. Meaning, the Doctor does know Father Christmas personally. Or 11 met someone he believed was Father Christmas. Maybe a guy in a mall. Maybe a mall Santa. Well if Krampus, the anti-Santa is actually real, does that mean Santa is too? Ah, now that would be telling. <clears throat> yeah sorry doctor, we're eating Christmas dinner with actual elves in Christmas land. 
There's an elf companion in this story as well, a secret agent elf who says he was sent by Jeff. So I'm gonna go on a wild whim and say that Father Christmas is real, yes. And then as if to confirm it in the epilogue, she leaves out a treat for an old friend. That's right, the marks of Balhoon. In fact, it seems that Jeff was a close friend of Doctors 1, 2 and 3. Get a girlfriend, Jeff. In a Christmas story back with John and Gillian, the four of them find Santa's workshop under attack by demon magicians. Ah, uh, it must be the demon magician that Santa Claus mentioned. I love how the comics have stayed just as silly throughout the years. In this story, the North Pole's gotten too crowded and noisy, meaning he now lives in Christmas Town. Not to be confused with the town called Christmas. Unless. John and Jillian dispatch the demon magicians and save Christmas by cheerily jettisoning them into space. When the second doctor crashed into Santa's sleigh, he becomes the man who nearly killed Christmas. <gasps> but he's too fat, isn't he? Oh, no, that won't do at all. Upon this, Two learns that Santa uses a temporal wormhole generator, not magic, to cause time loops so he can deliver all the presents in one night. So this now non-magical Santa, who honestly could just be a Time Lord or a Time Agent for all we know, has Santa clones. Bunch of clones of Santa, which go wrong when Two tries to take over Christmas duties. After being shot out of the sky and a quick musical number, he decides that maybe Father Christmas should handle Christmas, and that he needs more wormholes. I'm reading this anthology at the minute to get myself into the Christmas spirit and ah, some of these stories revert me back to being a little boy. The Doctor and Nardo hang out with Clive. The Tenth Doctor battles The Wire, which has taken on the image of Justin Bieber. But the Nine story is my favourite. Hey, remember this line? Are you beaming away like your father Christmas? Who says I'm not Red Bicycle when you were 12? What? Oh, you thought that was a playful quip too? No, because everything is hyperlitual at all times now. The Doctor slightly hinting he's probably Father Christmas is the ultimate Moffat tease. If you then avoid the ominous connotations and stalker behaviour. The Twelve Doctors of Christmas shows us Nine sneaking into her home, her childhood home at the age of 12, and leaving a red bike that she always wanted, until suddenly it's stolen by the mechanical horror Jingo! And you guys keep saying they've run out of ideas for Christmas specials. They haven't even brought back Jingo yet! At first it was unclear when this story takes place. If it happens right after Rose, that's um, troubling. But in it, Rose seems very interested in what rules of time and space you can't break, probably situating it before or after Father's Day. My question is, did the Doctor technically groom Rose into being his companion? <sighs> Best not to ask. The Tenth Doctor never met Father Christmas, other than, of course, in Mr. Men form, in which a Mr. Men version of Ten and Donna ambushed him, thinking he was a pilot fish. Maybe this is Jeff? The Mr. Men multiverse is a strange, buggling thing. Who else is there? Uh, Tortured. Tortured 1, in trace memory. They know that our Father Christmas exists, and part of their duties for Queen and Country are to track his actions and deal with his presence. I get why Doctor Who has to be coy about Father Christmas existing, but Tortured? I love this endlessly silly series. Talking about endlessly silly, Iris Wildtime also teamed up with Santa when Merry Christmas, or <clears throat> Mrs. Claus, kicked him out for having an affair with Wildtime. In revenge for stealing her husband, Merry Christmas stole and drugged Iris's companion, Panda. He's just a little guy though. In response to this panda-based war crime, Iris chose to regress Mrs. Claus's mind and reverted her back in time effectively wiping her memory and sending her brain back to a time in her life when she was happy with him. Um, I'm suddenly very frightened of Iris Wildtime. And then there's Father Christmas. Father Christmas? Christmas. He, on the other hand, is a whole other guy and the foundation of the Santa Mythos. A curator of faction paradox who was nothing like the legend based off of his likeness. Angry and corrupt, he dealt more in time eddies and drug conspiracies than Cookie's milk. Oddly enough, despite being a fairly major player in the Faction series, he's a strangely boring character. Just a normal, grounded bit player who is also called Father Christmas. 
I doubt that this is Jeff. Matrix, fact number two. I'm on the I'm on the clock here. Okay, hands up. Who's played the VR game? Well, not me. What do I look like? A gamer? I may have not played Doctor Who Edge of Time, but I certainly have watched somebody else play it on the internet. Which was equally painful. I'm just saying, between watching a four-hour feed of janky controls and repeated Whitaker lines on loop, or reading the Ashilda book, I'm picking the book. In this game, you play as the Doctor's new companion, a random, faceless, voiceless customer of a laundromat, and this laundromat is abandoned, when suddenly, who appears on the TV, but famous drama actress Jodie Whittaker. This Doctor is about to send you on a number of trials, guiding you through Professor Layton puzzles and Attack of the Grask-style logic problems, because she is stuck at the end of time. It's almost a pleasant escape room of an afternoon, until you're thrown at a Dalek, a house of weeping angels, and put in front of a world-ender cosmic deity who wants to kill you. Yeah, cool, thanks, Doc. You could have told me this story was on a cosmic scale of stakes. Now, I know firsthand from the wiki that the Doctor is one of the few exclusive gamers of the Doctor Universe. A very exclusive list, including Ryan Sinclair, Luke Smith, and the first Doctor. Not everyone's got what it takes, but it turns out it's the Doctor playing the real games. As when the Doctor returns you home at the ending of Edge of Time, she says this. But because the first lives, she's effectively in a time loop. She will try time and time again to unleash the virus and wipe out all of sentient creation. Her threat will recur over and over. She will always return, which is why you must always be there to stop her. I'm taking you back to where it all started. The little laundry in London. I'm sorry I misled you. I had to. As 13 rewards your world-saving efforts, jumping through all her little key-collecting hoops, what's your payment? You're gonna have to do it all over again to save the universe. You get to do it all over again, as she drops you right at the beginning of the adventure. Oh, joy. We have been tricked into a never-ending time loop by our good friend the Doctor. An inescapable Groundhog Day of this traumathon. That's dreadful and easily the worst thing the Doctor has done. Well, you know, and that, and that. Why ever did the Doctor do this? Well, A, they needed an in-story reason to be able to replay a short three-hour game, and didn't consider the horrifying ramifications of the Doctor reverting back to a short Scotsman to doom an innocent life. Or B, sequel setup. I swear to God, if the follow-up as Ten stick his overworked head in just to put it all right, he'll only be undermining Thirteen a little bit more than usual. Nope, it's a collectathon with a tenant TARDIS to circle a few times. You walk around the console for a bit. Modern gaming. That said, the free DLC involves you collecting key items from the Time Lord Victoria story, which is quite cool. Meaning at some point, the Black Scrolls of Rassilon, a sacred Cotterer judgment stone, and Brian's orb have all gone walkabout, just left around the place. Sorry, protagonist of the Edge of Time. Uh, this is your life now. Your reward every four hours? You get to look at the TARDIS. You gotta be in the TARDIS for about a minute and Jodie doesn't even show up. And lastly... You would think a world without the Daleks would be a better place. But no, the comic event, The Lost Dimension, has a fourth Doctor and Romana story, for some reason, confirmed that the world is maybe just as bad without them. Doctor Who rarely follows the Darren Shan Back to the Future time travel template of if you change something in history, something else will just come and fill in the void anyway. We're all interchangeable. But it seems that the Daleks very much are, as in this timeline that the Doctor stumbles into, the Ogrons, the Crotons, and the Quarks are the ruling species. Do not move! Do not move! You are now war booty of the Croton Imperium! I'm sorry, what? Fun fact, the Crotons is the last remaining TV story that I've never gone around to. I'm saving it for a rainy day. But do those crystal boys really say booty? Sadly, these are not the Crotons of our world. <laughs> I think they're a far cry from that, don't you? It seems that without the Daleks, they managed to come into their own, terrorizing the universe, filling the void by reaching their full potential. The universe is a treadmill. 
Now, instead of a deadly time war, I suppose the Time Lords just let these three species duke it out amongst themselves. But I don't like the look of those Ogrons, and you can never trust a Quark. Those adorable little guys will absolutely rise to power and do a time war too. Simply put these two wires together, and the Quarks will be written out of existence. Do I have the rights? Trust me, yeah you do. You know how the 2005 series almost didn't get the Daleks back because of uh, legal issues with the nation estates? Imagine the 2005 series where these are your recurring villains now. Ugh, no thanks. Just a whole show that would have to bring back, uh, Tetraps. Doesn't bear thinking about. It's a really cool little side story though, we get to see what these species would do with their turn as main series villains. The Ogrons, for instance, take on more of a Star Trek Federation approach, because they have just decided to become Klingons. Haha, <laughs> nerd thing. I know Star Trek now. The Quarks just trundle around the place like usual, getting wiped out. <clears throat> Babies. Whilst the Crotons have become the most dominant life form in this entire universe, and are still defeated by a parasol. The universe eventually snaps back in very complex and tedious reasons, which I'll probably explain in the future. And the Doctor decides to go back to the world of Daleks. I'll never complain again, he says. Probably. And there are my three facts, enough to tide you over till 2021. Now for a special Christmas message. Remember to be good. Bye bye. You, me, handcuffs. Must it always end this way? And now presented entirely without context, a passage from the novel Half-Life. Fitz knew it was a dream, but it was no less disturbing for that. He was standing in the TARDIS console room, facing the main doors, and he was naked. That would normally have bothered him, apart from the fact that he could feel something cool touching his buttocks. The fact that he knew it was another pair of buttocks was slightly disturbing, but knowing, in the way that you do in dreams, that they were the doctor's buttocks, it was just too much. But of course, as it was a dream, there was nothing he could do. He was rooted to the spot rubbing bottoms with the doctor. Doctor, he said in the awkward way that you do when you're cheek to cheek with your best friend. I take it this is all very symbolic. Now, as stimulating as that was, I ask you just to put it away and save it for the end of the video. Please, dear God, have some self-control. Maybe it would be strange to talk about sexuality in a 60s children's TV show, but it's not as if they didn't consider that at the time. It was decided that Susan Foreman should be the Doctor's granddaughter just to dispel any weird idea of an old man and a young girl travelling alone together. Because while sensibilities surrounding sex have changed since the 1960s, they were still clearly a factor. Fiction was conscious of what to show and what they could never, ever show. Because it's such an unavoidable factor in our own lives, a core essential. So yes, today we're talking about sexuality in the Doctor Who series. No snickering at the back. Now I know what the Ultra Nerd is saying. Looms. But I'd like to remind you that the first and second Doctor were portrayed as human. Sophisticated humans from the far future, but still very much human, and the fact that he has a granddaughter implicitly tells us that the Doctor does the dirty. I have had some experience with the fairer sex. Thank you, Moffat, for giving me that image of William Hartnell getting down. But of course, if he has a family, it only stands to reason he has done the deed. Today's video is less, does Doctor Who fuck? And more so, is the Doctor genuinely asexual? An incredibly interesting topic that I am about to do no justice with. For proper asexual angles to the series, please follow fans like Friends of Ace and Lauren Fox, as there certainly won't be any thorough analysis or lived experience here. John Pertwee, Paul Cornell, Tom Baker, John Nathan Turner, Colin Baker, and maybe everybody in the 1960s BBC are adamant, word of God, definite that the Doctor is asexual. The Doctor is a very valid and very natural piece of ace representation. But like everything with Doctor Who, it's not that simple. Now, it's obvious that the 60s were very sterile. There were even few allusions to romance, never mind sex with Ian and Barbara not even allowed to kiss on screen. In his own opinion, Baker said that love was a very human emotion, whereas the other Baker explicitly stated that's how he played the character, completely unaware of human sexuality. Well, you're a beautiful woman, probably. As fans are reminded frequently, John Nathan Turner had a strong no hanky-panky in the TARDIS rule, which is bizarre, as this is the man who gave us Perry Brown. 
and chameleon. It all changes once the eighth doctor hits the scene. Not only does the show change target demographic and finally begin exploring adult material, but the doctor also looks like this now. With all of these new emerging writers desperate to push Doctor Who as a franchise, it was inevitable that Doctor Who was going to get a bit more frisky, shall we say. For the most part, Eight is still portrayed as asexual. Questionably romantic, but definitely asexual. Except, except. All of those romantic quips, all of the flirting with Fitz or Charlie, and even at one time, Izzy. Now fair enough, those could be jokes, passing quips. But you know what isn't a quip? That one time you spent the night with Gallifrey and Monk, I am Foreman. Yeah, that's one for another time. There's also the Eighth Doctor's heavily implied sexual encounter with Bernice Summerfield. And Ohila of the Sisterhood of Khan has also got naughty with the Doctor, which is just uh, upsetting more than anything. Which incarnation is it? We will never know. Moffat, stop doing this. When the revival comes round, the main relationship, the core dynamic, is a romantic one, with Moffat's first script of the series pushing the question. Does the Doctor dance? You know, it's not a subtle metaphor. It's such a strange priority, but it's only natural coming from a comedy sitcom writer. Jokes about the nuclear family or jokes at the expense of gender roles are kind of part of the course. I'm not criticising Moffat's angle here. I love the Doctor dances and I think has much loftier ambitions than most people give it credit for. The Empty Child marks a mid-series point where the Doctor and Rose do stop and ask each other, so what am I to you? Romantically, where do we stand? I think it's more playful than Moffat just driving home the point that the Doctor needs to have sex to be happy, but regardless, Russell T Davis is using this to further a character arc and a relationship. Series 2 continues Russell's intentional, beautiful relationship, but it's very innocent. A series of time and space dates and discussions about domestic life, but never the physical. Whilst Moffat is giving Ten moments like this. That there comes a time Time Lord, when every lonely little boy must learn how to dance. So it seems like these two are in a wrestling match between romantic and physically intimate. Some people rightly criticise Moffat as writing the Doctor as a specky nerd in the 80s. Maybe even a reflection of themselves at a young age. Go on the fireplace is either a fairy tale about the Doctor discovering love or the Doctor discovering sex. That sounds crass, but that's exactly what it is in the text. And then you get to Eleven, who really embodies this, coded as a small child and claiming to not even know what sex is. To then put that Doctor in a relationship with hypersexual femme fatale River Song is, a little bit dodgy. It also leads to really uncomfortable lines like this. Impossible girl, a mystery wrapped in an enigma squeezed into a skirt that's just a little bit too tight. Maybe 12 was the better match for River, a Doctor who canonically, canonically, enjoyed BDSM. <laughs> no, I'm not expanding on that. Have some faith. Now that we know that every single new series showrunner is admittedly horny, it's by and large Moffat who was the biggest contributor to this. Something that stretches in motive all the way back to his forum dwelling days. Yeah, take a read of some of these, they're really interesting, and tell us that to Moffat, this is part of the ethos of the character. The Doctor's sexuality doesn't really make sense or have any consistency because the Doctor's origin doesn't have any consistency or sense. For as romantic and vain as the Tenth Doctor was, this is the first mention of him implicitly doing anything physical. Good Queen Bess, well, let me tell you, her nickname is no longer... <clears throat> anyway. Whereas Moffat tried to write him as asexual as possible, he had to follow from the framework given to him by RTD, but in the day of the Doctor novelization, he shares a bath with one River Song and refuses to even take his shoes off. And I get it, he's a fan operating in the wilderness years, but come on. For more of its history than it hasn't, the Doctor has been asexual. And I think we're back to that. There are many active asexual Doctor Who fans, and it's no wonder to see what attracted them to a series and a main character like this. But much like how the show is catered in different mediums, different eras, for different audiences with different tones. 
I think it might be a bit fruitless to try and pin down the Doctor as any one thing. Maybe the sexuality and his interests do change every regeneration, but maybe it'd be more poignant to fixate on a writer. Showrunner to showrunner, you know, decade to decade. I wasn't trying to write an essay on asexuality in Doctor Who in this, I'm just broaching a bro-canon topic with a bit of comedy thrown in. But it has become a relevant and ever-changing aspect of the series. A long series of unrestricted and uncensored material. Anything that can happen in Doctor Who, inevitably over 60 years, will eventually happen. The revival is very insistent on the subject, but also very inconsistent. It's very easy to picture Moffat as the figurehead of this. After all, it is a fixation of his as a writer that extends all the way back to this. How could I possibly forget the only time traveling companion I've ever had? You've had lots of companions. The only time traveling companion I've had. Oh, right. But there's a lot of factors that led us here. The puritanism of the 60s, the eyebrow raising lack of it in the 80s, the counterculture of the 90s, and uh, th for the 70s, I don't know, jump out to it, probably be like, uh, a gentleman never tells. Yeah, all right, Doc. Liz left because they had an awkward fling at work. It was during a work do. Things got awkward in the office. Personally, I don't like my sci-fi to be sterile. I find that so much science fiction and fantasy is void of even anything remotely passionate. But that doesn't mean that explicit sexual intimacy is required. So on a serious note, in a very unserious video, I genuinely understand every perspective on this. I do think sexuality has a place in Doctor Who. Just maybe not how it's been done prior. I know nothing is sacrosanct in a show like Doctor Who, but some things... Some things can be sacred. Do I believe this is the be-all and end-all of Moffat's relationship with the character? No, because then he wouldn't signed off his tenure, driving at home so hard how Doctor Who is a show for young children. There's lots of angles, I like them all. Frankly, you're not fooling me that none of this TARDIS team are into each other. It's just, come on, it's just not happening. I am sorry, John Nathan Turner. There is very much hanky-panky happening inside your TARDIS, for better or for worse. And no conversation could be had about Doctor Who without including Doctor Screw. That guy, he's a stud. Unstoppable. And now canon, thanks to Chris Chibnall. Why do they call it Spider-Man? Don't they like it? Broke canon. A video web series concerning the oddest, most niche of Doctor Who corners. I may have taken a couple months absence, but I never stopped writing them. We've got enough to go through to series three, so please stick around, otherwise that'll look quite awkward. Dispensing Doctor Who trivia on the internet is already a bad look. I don't need to be dispensing Doctor Who trivia to an audience of 15. I am terrified of obscurity and my own death, both of which are inevitable. Welcome back. Matrix, I'm feeling rejuvenated. Please give us our first fun fact. Let's talk about The Stranger. The Stranger was an erotic novel published by Virgin Books. Yes, the Doctor Who publishing company. As a part of their special black lace range. Yep, I'm pulling no punches this year. Okay, where do we begin? Author Portia da Costa gets a gig with Virgin Books in 1997. She does not have a license to use the Doctor Who character, but it also could not be any more obvious. And now to prove it, I will read actual erotica again. What happened to this channel? What she had taken for a jacket was in fact a long Edwardian frock coat in black crushed velvet, which she wore with grey trousers, a black and grey striped brocade waistcoat, and a wing collared shirt that was unfastened to show his chest. Slung around his neck was a rather mangled length of heavy grey silk, which appeared to be the remains of a cravat. And there we go, now you believe me. The well-spoken, well-dressed, long-haired stranger could not be anybody else but the Eighth Doctor. Just this week I uploaded a video discussing sexuality and the role of sex in Doctor Who. I did not include the stranger, everybody, because it's all anyone would have been able to talk about. So, like any good porn, you want to know about the plot. Claudia Marwood is a 42-year-old widow owning a large, rich estate, who finds a naked man bathing in a stream on her mansion grounds. He had exactly the kind of physique she had always preferred in a man, spare and lean but strong looking with fine, straight limbs and a chest that was deep and nicely defined, 
but free of air. His swinging penis, oh my god, his swinging penis was substantial and distinctly perky. Okay, I think this is the point of the video where we say uh, skip to this time point if you're 12. It's good to do that sometimes, yeah? Jesus Christ, is this what it's come to? Claudia decides not to wolf whistle Mr. McGann, but instead watches him as he slowly masturbates into the water. She could still hear his broken cry of triumph as the semen hit the water like strands of white silk. Oh my god. Hey, what if this was actually written about the sixth doctor and he's just wearing a cravat? I don't know how I'd feel about that. <laughs> this is quite liberating, my boy. Later, the masturbating stranger appears at her door, which would be creepy in any other context other than a smart fic. My initial assumption was that this was a converted fanfic, like say Fifty Shades of Grey, where it's clearly based on existing characters and then we change the names around. But uh, no, it's very upfront that this is Doki Who. For instance, the doctor freaks out every time Claudia says the word doctor, and he doesn't want to be sent to a hospital because he would be treated like a freak. So instead, the good lady and the Time Lord, who isn't a Time Lord for legal purposes, have a long, romantic shag. The young man was bigger and harder than Gerald had ever been, although her late husband had possessed a penis to be proud of. Claudia quivered inside. Her vagina fluttered as if to express its hunger, as it then devoured him whole. No, I made that last bit up, but her fluttering vagina is described in quite a bit of detail. Are we getting to the monsters? When can I place the story on the timeline? I just keep reading and reading. Edwardian love poets, a lost boy, an alien sent to pleasure and enchant her. Yep, tick, tick, tick. It's Doctor Who. We know. We get it. Soon, Claudia is ravished to such a degree that she is blessed with a new power. Able to have multiple orgasms just at the thought of actor Paul McGann. And I mean, same, but keep, keep it yourself, lady. And then it does something very strange where it's gone from a Doctor Who porn parody, a sophisticated Doctor Screw, to then thinking he's in the plot of the movie with Mayo and I, as he starts retelling the plots of him and Richard E. Grant in the British countryside. Why? Look, it's okay. Someone was bound to get a sexual awakening watching with Mayo and I, but you can't throw all of Paul McGann's roles into one. With Mayo and I is not a sexy movie. At this point, I did stop reading because it's actually a fairly weighty bit of writing. But interestingly, there is a character called Melody who comes to join them. Do that, big finish, I dare you. There's a BDSM orgy. A lovely Frenchman named Comte Le Dallonville. We find out the doctor has a pee kink. A urine kink. Uh, can we move on? Yes. Yes, we can. But not before I tell you the best part of all this is that this was then referenced in the main Doctor Who range, as writer Lance Parkin gave us this line. The Doctor stopped what he was doing and grinned to himself. I was in England, spending some time with a friend, a young widow named Claudia. My word. Thank you to the people who recommended this to me. I want to burn it out of my brain. Matrix, next fact. We know the name of the Doctor's mother, because we have met her before. No, not that, not that. I have her Gallifreyan name right here, and that name is Lilandred Lumswagina Chegizima. <laughs> or as we know her, Leela. <laughs> and in the industry, that's what we like to call a mic drop. I have before tried to read Lung Barrow. Look at me jumping into the finale of an entire range of books and being confused when I don't know what's going on. To my credit, I was new. I assumed they'd be like the episodic new series range. For the most part, I like to dip in and dip out of stories. I will just pick one up. But not here, as I was acquainted with the reading list that would be consuming the next decade of my life. Lung Barrow was the final V&A and it's a very infamous one, because it practically gives you a finale for the entire classic run of Doctor Who to that point. It's very lore heavy, it's very dense, even just to read as a book, 
It reads as a book that does not want you to read it, but I do want to read it because it's got all these juicy secrets in there, this forbidden knowledge, such as Lady Leela being the doctor's mother. Mark Platt decided that the best fan service was all the fan service, as Leela and Andrid had a half Gallifreyan, half human child. The seventh doctor came to the realization that this child had to be him. And then he asked Leela to name their child after himself. Had a baby boy. Oh, brilliant. What'd you call him? Doctor. Really? <laughs> that actually happened. That's actually what they went with. So Leela raises a little baby doctor so that he would become the other, a key founding member of Gallifreyan society. Yeah, uh-huh. The other, as we certainly all know, is the doctor. Through one method or the other. Ah, that's a bag of worms, we're not touching that one yet. This means, of course, that the Seventh Doctor not only engineered the methods of his own regeneration, but also his whole birth. He brought himself into existence. A full circle. A paradox loop. Oh, boy, boy, boy. Although not all of this intent ends up in the finalised book, Platt told Doctor Who magazine his crazy, insane ideas. And now they're a part of the show forever, until they're immediately discarded. Look, don't come crying to me about some timeless children, okay? Look at the shit we happen to deal with. The Doctor travelled with his own mother for two seasons and didn't find her anything better to wear. This fact is crazy, but it's good to remember it's just one origin of many. Number three. Forget the ghost. There are actual Marvel superheroes who are canonical in the Doctor Who series. Let's talk about Marvel's Captain Britain, a very tertiary Avenger, but he still sees a lot of prominence in modern arcs and runs. Captain Britain is a persisting Marvel character. So why does he battle bad guys from Gallifrey? Famous comic writer Alan Moore, of Watchmen fame, contributed a lot to the UK arm of Marvel Comics in the 80s and 90s. One such contribution was the Guardians of the Galaxy-esque Special Executive. A changing group of time-travelling mercenaries, these guys are in Marvel encyclopedias as coming from the planet Gallifrey and being born via looms. There are Marvel books out there that talk about looms. And even Doctor Who fans don't care about them. Their members included lovable fan favourites such as Lady Burning Fish, Thug Bodybag Joy Boy, War Dog, Cobweb and Zeitgeist. And who could forget Viridian, the Brain Feeler? These fan favourite characters have stuck around very slightly, crossing over with Saturn, the X-Men, before eventually becoming Captain Britain villains. Now, as discussed previously, this would make sense. There was that brief window of time where Transformers and Marvel Comics and Doctor Who all played in the same play pit. For example, not only are Captain Britain and Doctor Who friends, they, you know, go to the same parties and run in the same circles, but I was also delighted to learn that unlike Captain America, Captain Britain was given his powers by the magician Merlin. But ah uh, ah, uh, uh, Doctor Who is Merlin. And you can't tell me that writers like Alan Moore didn't know that at time of writing. In this series, the Doctor is an all-powerful cosmic wizard who defends the Omniverse with his daughter Roma. And oh my god, don't you think his family tree is getting big enough, Doc? We are fighting a time war. The special executives were created by Rassilon. Genetic experiments with the first ever looms, that's why they don't look anything like Time Lords. And then they were used to fight the cat people of Gallifrey which is weirdly accurate to Gallifrey lore. Eventually, the terrible Rassilon splits up this fighting team, ordering a purge of the Wombborn, forcing Wardog and his brothers to flee the planet. Who knew the Rassilon created an ultimate ragtag team of battling animal Marvel superheroes? <laughs> oh, I'm so tired. I'm one episode back in and I am exhausted already. Excellent. Broke cannon, cannon, broke cannon, cannon, broke cannon. Welcome back to the Matrix. Well, 
Last week's return went well, a lot of positive feedback, which I don't deserve. But in amongst the copious amounts of sex bots came comments, complaints about the new color of the Matrix. It's blue now. Well, you don't like it, I listen to constructive criticism. And you know what? I'm gonna put this right. And oop. Matrix, give us our first fact. Let's never speak of this, it's never happened. Back to blue. Blue's fine. So, quick bit of trivia for the real fans. <laughs> yeah, you. I like keeping you on your toes. Who did Susan Foreman leave the TARDIS for and marry? That's right, everybody's favourite character, David Campbell, from the Dalek Invasion of Earth. Or at least, from one account of events. Oh, see, this is how I get you. The first Doctor was ecstatic to get rid of Susan. Now, this has been a fan conception for decades. It's a very strange companion exit. Very sudden, very out of nowhere, very heteronormative. Oh, there seems like a strapping young bloke that I have spoken to maybe three times. Let's abandon my dear Susan on a ruined earth. That's as close as you got to characterization for companions in the early seasons. Ultimately, I think Susan actually expressed desires to lay down some roots maybe twice in the TV show. Whereas every mention of her in expanded media seems to characterise herself as having nowhere to belong. Oh, grandfather, I want to do wifely duties. But luckily, thanks to the omniscient narrator of the target novelization of The Crusade, we know a little bit more about the thought process that went into this decision. As writer David Whitaker let us know that this was the easiest decision Doctor Who had ever made. <laughs> Brutal! But no, 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 in fairness, David seemed like a strapping young lad. And the Doctor was visibly distressed by this for the rest of his tenure, even going to the lengths of kidnapping vaguely similar looking girls. We've definitely seen companions leave for worse reasons, but none of which were rejected just as strangely as Susan Foreman. Or should I say, Susan Cameron. Because in the 21st Dalek ruined century, Susan got all she ever wanted and got married to David Cameron. Huh? No, wait, sorry, did I read that right? No decision was more difficult for Susan or easier for her grandfather who knew in his heart that she must share her future with David Cameron, a young man she had met and fallen in love with during that terrible struggle between the Dalek and his arch enemies. Uh-oh. Although we associate Terence Dix as the main writer of the Target novelizations, the most fun contributor was definitely David Whittaker, as he would half remember and write stories from scratch. We'll come back to some of them another time, the gold. When these books came out, there simply wasn't that information readily available. Which hints that David Whittaker adapted these stories without even the script to hand. And then of course there's the fact that it was for 1960s and nobody cared. Hilariously, no one informed David Whittaker that the person that Susan was left behind with was one David Campbell. Coincidentally predicting the rise of beloved British Prime Minister David Cameron. For the record, David Cameron doesn't exist in the Hooniverse. Not where he's meant to anyway. In 2015, we have this Prime Minister who became a sea devil. And then there's this comic version of Maggie Thatcher, which just looks like David Cameron. Mr. Whitscut, you weren't to know. You weren't to know, but now the words exist there like concrete. And now for arbitrary, joyless reasons, I must abide by them. In this version of events, Susan Foreman married David Cameron. Hmm, how do we make this work? My headcanon is that the Doctor himself is the narrator of this text, and then suddenly him getting a name or five wrong is very in character. Oh yes, 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 we need a referendum, Mr. Campbell. Cameron, come along, Chesterfield. Ches, che, Chesington, world of adventure. Haha, <laughs> he was ill. But I think on this matter, we really do have to respect the artist's vision which is ex-Prime Minister standing side by side with Susan Foreman. She does go on to get involved in politics. 
Okay, number two. Maybe something a bit more substantial. The doctors are the mother. This family tree is going to be the death of me. You might remember last time in a roundabout way that Leela of the Sever team is the doctor's mother. Not a sugar mama, that's Clara, but his actual genuine birth mother from a species who are not born. Very strange stuff, but maybe that's because the doctor was not loomed. The doctor is half human. Oh my god, oh my god they're at my door. The angry mob, that, they're at my fucking gate. How do you keep getting my address? Safe to say, angry mobber fans and all, the Doctor being half human is not a popular fan idea. Even though back in the 60s, the Doctor was mostly regarded as a whole human, 0% alien from the far future, I, to this date, see no problem with this idea. It makes perfect sense and you know it. For the Doctor's true mother is a human, a 19th century lady called Penelope Gates. And Penelope Gates <laughs> was the inventor of the time machine. <laughs> it sounds so wrong to say as a modern fan, but I think I like this more than I let on. Penelope Gates had adventures of her own. Her first trip to 1996, picking up companions before getting trapped in Japan, where she was saved by the seventh doctor before settling down and having a secret child with the Time Lord Ulysses, a heroic adventurer member of the Supreme Council. Two travellers meeting across time and space, giving birth to a new species. Or, if you like, a hybrid. It's romantic, but it's so wrong. But that makes it all the more romantic, but canonically so wrong. In fact, I think it's rather lovely. It's intimate, it combines the Doctor's current origins with his contradictory 60s ones, and unlike some revelations, actually lends itself to new stories. Feel free to drop one of the two arbitrary arguments you lot always have, but ultimately the Doctor still fell in love with Earth before he learned his mother was from there. It still isn't his home. I don't know, I kind of like some of those Americanized 90s ideas they had floating around. But I guess being raised by the TV movie will do that to a kid. And this is just one I'll have to take to the grave. May it come any day now. It's very telling of the 90s and where the series was currently at. It's also eerily similar to the plans of the TV movie spin-off, where the series ever to pick off in America, where the Doctor and the Master, secret brothers, had to come together to find their father. I just wonder how many books in the range knowingly were trying to fulfill on this premise. And I'm all the sadder that because of fan backlash, this idea has been completely abandoned. I did not know who Penelope Gate was this time last month. Whereas the Cartmel plan is frequently discussed, pretty much embraced at this point, and very relevant, whether we like it or not. Its influences are everywhere, whereas this idea did not make it out of the 90s. Even though I genuinely believe it would open the creative avenues for new stories more than the timeless children ever could. I think Penelope Gates would have been a character welcome in the revival. There, I said it. Maybe I'm just biased towards stories with generational storytelling in them, but uh, they've got a history. The Castellan of their parents' generation, Marlin. Merlin? Marlin? It begins with an M. Found out about their secret child and almost jeopardized their existence. And to defend themselves, the Doctor's mother and father pulled a human nature on him and wiped his memories ditching him on 1883 Earth. Yep, that's it, go have fun. <laughs> he doesn't know who he is. For those more interested in the exploits of Penelope Gate, the wiki actually won't help you that much, but it didn't neglect to tell you that neither of the Doctor's parents told him about sex. Thanks for that. Sayward, writer Kate Orman, creator of Penelope, intended that Ulysses left the Doctor's mother to raise him on Earth, which is why in Black Orchid, the Doctor says, I always wanted to drive a steam train when I was a boy. The Doctor's father, Ulysses, was also a recurring character in the series. Another vagrant from Gallifrey who renounced his title as a Time Lord. Ulysses, though, liked to party, with the Doctor even having to clean up after him in his blatant disregard for the web of time. Which I think is funny, anyway. And I think his writers knew he would not be a mainstay fixture of the series because he was erased from the series, wiping every record of him in the Matrix, and his true name made forbidden. Does that sound familiar? So if Gallifrey themselves are retconning him, 
I guess we are too. And fact number three. Uh, this one's dumb. <laughs> Cybermen keep showing up in soap operas. A soap opera was a type of televised entertainment. Supposedly. On paper, by definition. Really, they are a pure, concentrated artifact of British misery. Offensive to my ears and antithetical to what I go to media for, I've said before and I'll say again, soaps are the bane of my existence. They're the anti-who, yeah? Complete opposites in genre, variety, ambition and charm, and yet they both persist. Doctor Who and Corey, parallel. Coronation Street began in 1960, Doctor Who in 1963. At many points, characters have been shown to be avid Doctor Who fans, even going to exhibitions, hanging out with canine. But sometimes there are also actors on an actual TV show that exists in the Hooniverse. We know this because many different companions watch the show. Sometimes they even appear. Sometimes as actors, sometimes as themselves in character. There's a lot to say about dimensions and time, isn't there? And none of it by me. Moving on. Rose Tyler, for instance, was a fan, and when she went back to Earth would catch up on past episodes. I cool bullshit. Haha, <laughs> yeah, nice, she's London working class. I don't think Rose Tyler was the biggest fan of domestic life, do you? Silence, bigot! You know, the doctor's back there in East Enders land and we're stuck here in the past. Silence, bigot! In short, both series exist as TV shows within one another. Trust me, don't try and solve that one. Frankly, I'm sorry that I don't have more evidence to show you, but I've seen Cybermen in the background of multiple episodes. I'm sorry I can't go check 15,410 episodes for you. I guess you'll have to take my word on it. Here's the characters at a Doctor Who convention in 2008. I see you are sad. The Cybermen will remove sadness. Oi oi, Gov, my name's Bentley, and I'm having a serious moment in front of a big slave. But of course, the Cybermen's biggest takeover of a soap opera was in EastEnders. Nah, that's a great scene. And don't get me wrong, I am ecstatic to see Cybermen keep being drawn to British TV, but it does make me question how they got a Cyberman to appear on Jeremy Kyle and film a long work day. Stay cool. Blend in. But I think the kookiest link between Doctor Who and soap operas comes in the form of Emmerdale because they share a writer. Lance Parkin of the Doctor Who book range was the showrunner of Emmerdale for an extended period of time, which is probably why he wrote the Eighth Doctor into an Emmerdale novel. <laughs> what? I'm not reading this. I'm not gonna read that. I'm not strong enough. <laughs> why are there Emmerdale novels? But it does go both ways, as Lance Parkin wrote in many soap opera characters into the stakes of some of his Doctor Who novels, including the Gallifrey Chronicles, which, if you've read that book, is a very strange cameo. Specifically detailing that members of the EastEnders cast were decimated in the aftermath of the Vor invasion, which is honestly the best news I've heard all week. But sadly, like Doctor Who, Corrie persists. You know that theory I have where I always say that long-running series have to change? Well, that's true for everything but soap operas. They're an evil little outlier. A stain on creativity and media. I am sorry to all of the Dimensions and Time fans out there, but First Frontier told me that it was a dream sequence had by the Seventh Doctor. So... Mm. If the themes discussed in tonight's broadcast have affected you, please call our support line at 0707129330 and somebody at the BBC will make sure to send you a condescending email. I am Count Dracula. Hello and welcome back to The Matrix. And say hello to my new expensive microphone. Just don't tell me it sounds worse than before, otherwise my little heart won't be able to take it. Welcome back to The Matrix, where we debunk any notion of canon or continuity existing within the Hooniverse. Something I try to stay away from are fan theories. Namely, because that's what this series actually replaced. Go check them out. They're just like these, but 
very neglected. But this week I came this close, this close to including a fan theory because I was convinced that the Doctor Who series had crossover with the world's biggest IP, Pokemon. For in this world, the Doctor is a looker. Detective for the International Police, operating under a pseudonym and battling extraterrestrial threats. A series regular who bears a striking resemblance to one tenth Doctor. 2008. What a year. Powerhouses. Is this fast footed, fast talking Master of Disguise a homage to Mr. Tennant? Well. I bought into this theory hook, line, and sinker, but then I realised it'd been a while since I played Pokemon Platinum. So for research, I did just that. And, um... Yeah, the internet lied. Imagine that. When I heard International Police, I thought it'd be more like United Nations Intelligence Task Force with a police box. But it turns out in this world, they have phallic, terrifying elder gods to handle space and time. So that was a letdown. There goes that segment, which is embarrassing. But on the bright side, Platinum has an age today. Although it does say he suffers from amnesia. Haha, <laughs> gotcha. Pokemon has a Doki Who confirmed. Matrix, please take us to our actual first fact of the day. Oscar Wilde is a famous vampire. The world renowned poet playwright Oscar Wilde, who never wrote about vampires, for the record. But when I think Doctor Who and vampires, my childhood brain goes to one story in particular. Not Vampires of Venice, not State of Decay, Bat Attack, from the early days of the Doctor Who Adventures comic strip. Bat Attack is a story about the Tenth Doctor and Rose meeting Bram Stoker, as the real, actual Dracula comes to London to punish Mr. Stoker and kill him for his horrendous book. Or sorry, I should say Frederick von Dracula, the great great descendant of the Dracula family. Because you know, that'd be silly otherwise. Doctor, help! They're gonna make me a vampire! Like last week when they did that. But it's also a story that is predominantly gay subtext. Dracula was a novel in part inspired by the sentencing of Oscar Wilde for his homosexual identity. The Doctor Who Adventures comic strip always was more geared towards kids and as a result was a lot fluffier, although a lot of weird ideas and actual pitches for solid episodes have been found in there. The year 1897. The Tenth Doctor and Rose are hanging out with Inspector Lestrade of the Sherlock Holmes canon? Uh, okay, good start. Almost immediately they find themselves surrounded by vampire bats. Because of course they do where they meet Florence Stoker, who get this, unbeknownst to Bram, is also a vampire in a completely unrelated affair. Yeah, we're not talking alien vampires or fish vampires or things that are a bit like vampires. Count Dracula exists in a fucking castle in Europe and he is not a happy boy. I have many things to say to Mr. Dracula, but I shall hold my tongue for now. But oh no, the Virgin Florence is madly in love with Oscar Wilde, and many years ago went to go live with him in Ireland, where she contracted the vampire virus. That's right, Oscar Wilde was blooded and left alive so that his burden could be passing on the vampire virus to all of humanity. Luckily, the Doctor knows exactly what to do, as every single Time Lord within them contains the genetic antigen to be able to undo vampire conversion, which is convenient. Could have told you when that would have come in handy. And the 10th Doctor creates this within himself and expels it via a burp. Now, nah, hang on. Florence is caught by the burp and returns to her old self. See, now that's what I expect from a kid's story called Bat Attack, not homosexual subtext. And there's a lot of it as well as Oscar Wilde mirrors his vampiric curse to his homosexual tendencies. The comic outright states he was put in prison down to a terrible scandal. He has unnatural urges to kill or turn the things I love. To which the doctor tells him, that unnaturalness was you, you were born that way, or made. 
Yeah. Nice and subtle. Doctor Who Adventures. Creators of Strax and the Time Shark. There's even a prison rape joke. Who asked? Who asked? Where does a story called Bat Attack get its fucking kicks? Nonetheless, I love this little oddity. I would recommend it, but frankly, I don't know where you would find it. This isn't the only story with Oscar Wilde, it's certainly not the only story with Count Dracula, and it's also not the only story that the Tenth Doctor saves the day via burping. Make of that what you will. Fact number two, please. Matrix! You don't have to do him like that. The Matrix is getting a bit personal today, it seems. General Stahl, the undefeated of the Temp Sontaran battle fleets, namely from the story The Sontaran Stratagem. Stahl has a naughty little history. This isn't his only appearance. If you really want to go into it, the Doctor has met Stahl before. In the Mr. Men range of Doctor Who books. Stick with me here. Uh, I see you turning your nose up at Mr. Men books. Snobbery. Snobbery is what that is. As in the sacred text, Dr. Tenth, Star was busy trying to invade a far-off planet for sausages. See, I can respect that. That's a noble crusade. This planet's resources shall be added to the glory of the Santaran Empire. Specifically attacking the planet of the Ogrons, because they have communally decided that they make the nicest sausages. Which, you know, is nice. They've got a side hustle. So if you ever wondered what Santarans get up to in between shooting and marching... It's mostly chats like this. But after an Ogron gets a bit tetchy, Stahl the Undefeated... ...is defeated! The Doctor saves him from this encounter, dishonouring him horribly, and tells him he doesn't need to invade and take all the sausages, Stahl. You can just shop here. Just buy them, man! Something that seems to be a genuinely new concept to the Temps on Haran battle fleets. Star decides, you know what, this Doctor guy, he's alright, and they sit down for lunch together. An encounter so memorable that both of them forget it by the time of their next encounter. Honestly, this book is top 10 for me. Top 10, 10 stories, easy. And it kind of makes the Poison Sky a bit embarrassing in retrospect. Star, he saved your life. Remember those memories you had together. Stahl's arc is a complex one indeed. Now I hear there may be some detractors amongst you thinking that this is the Mr. Men universe, a different universe of Doctor Who universe. Wrong. Definitely wrong, when there are so many crucial moments to the Doctor Who timeline within this range of books. Doctor First battles a bunch of unruly hippies. Doctor Second battles Yeti in his first ever encounter with them. And Doctor Ninth. <sighs> Look at him. Exuding big dick energy even from the Mr. Men version. Well, he's battling Autons and meeting Rose Tyler with his existing companion, Captain Jack Harkness, who is travelling with the Doctor before Rose. Huh. How dare you call these non-canon? How dare you, sir? There's a good theme going on today. It's all been child-friendly for once. Matrix, give us our third fact. God damn it, who's picking these goddamn facts? All right, it's me! Time to talk about Inferno. Can you quiet it down? I'm trying to do a video here. Inferno is a story I like to keep away from for the most part because I know it means a lot to a lot of people. It's not a favorite of mine, and I don't say that to be contrarian. I think it's a claustrophobic story wrecked by sound design and terrible monsters and bizarre pacing. Not for me, but I certainly couldn't call it bad. I mean, after all, what a premise. After a power accident at the Inferno Project, the Doctor finds himself in a parallel version of Earth. One where Liz is a Nazi, the Brigadier tells the Eye Patch story, and Great Britain is a fascist regime. Wow. So different. Although the seven episodes of Inferno feel unending, we actually don't get to see that much of the world, as we're stuck in this one base, primarily from the Doctor's point of view. But being such a popular story, it's appeared back in the years since, with lots of different explanations. The Quantum Archangel, a sixth Doctor novel, concerns itself with Inferno, for strange reasons. A world where Mel is the Prime Minister and battles an evil Third Doctor. 
Sixy theorized that the Inferno universe diverged from the main timeline about 50 years before he entered it. So the 1920s. Oh yeah, no. Nazis makes more sense now. <laughs> no doctor equals Nazi England. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that one sometime. But another source says that this timeline was the creation of the Great Intelligence. What's he up to these days, eh? Such an iconic villain that nobody gives a rat's ass unless he brings along his yetis. My god, that's true. Man cast Richard E. Grant and Ian McKellen, and still nobody remembers him. What a villain! The book Night of the Intelligence actually proposes that this is the main timeline and the Doctor Who universe with no Nazis is the divergent one. And I think I'm starting to buy the Great Intelligence theory because Edward Travers actually finds himself dead in Tibet before even encountering a single yeti. So Great Intelligence wins, apparently. That's depressing. And then one Oswald Mosley forms the political party known as the British Union of Fascists. It's a good name. Actually, honest. Somebody eventually sat them down and told them to rebrand as just the party, which isn't much better. Oswald Mosley then meets the parallel version of the Doctor, who was instead exiled to 1930, and they become good friends. In fact, when Mosley is eventually killed, who steps up but Docky Who? But Big Brother Nasty Who, if you can imagine such a thing. Daddy, when's Doctor Who gonna battle the Daleks again? I feel like this story chain went a bit far. Doctor Who can and will be everything, but this is a very real world story that Doctor Who doesn't belong in. It reminds me of those Star Wars or those Warhammer fans who get a bit too into the imperialist fantasy of it. Keep an eye on them. Thank you again to Chubby Bub for letting me know that the well goes even deeper. As in the BBC book, The Face of the Enemy, written by David A. McKinty. Oh, are you ready for this? Depicts the master of this universe, never becoming the master, and actually a savior of Earth. They don't swap places, per se, but uh, that book sure do be about the master and unit teaming up. Sorry, the master, unit, and Ian and Barbara teaming up to save this world. Because, uh-oh, someone gave the human survivors of the Inferno world a time machine. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. Oh, they lose, by the way. And the Doctor locks up the Master and gets the government to torture and kill him. So, that's the face of the enemy. Spoilers? Look, there's just one thing I need to know, okay? If there's a fascist England and a fascist Brigadier and a fascist Docky Who, is there a fascist Joe Grant? I don't know if I could deal with that. Don't let there be a fascist Joe Grant. Joe, you are ruthless. Oh, just keeping it in the family, darling. Welcome back, Whovians. Whovians? Who maniacs? Dweeks. Whovenile delinquents. Nice. Hooligans, friends of the hood, unearthly children, whores, homosexuals. Oh man. Scum, dirt, lowlife, cunts. <laughs> Great. Pieces of shit, bastards. That's just cunts again. God, this is self deprecating. Anorak clad wanker. That's one for the oldies. Virgin, wah wah. Loomers, white supremacists. Oh wait, no, that's one of mine. Who fans? Cool fans. Hell yeah. Lonely. An individual specimen of the human species whose brain is higher than average, simulated by long-running British TV show Doctor Who. People who need a better hobby. You're all correct. Welcome back to The Matrix, where oppressed fans like us can form and discuss the nuances of canon. Such as... Joe Grant died a horrible death. Okay, this isn't going how I planned. What a terrible start to my day. Although Joe Grant is a currently active character in the Hooniverse and even saving the day from her home in... Kent? Her various children and grandchildren said goodbye to her in the year 2028. Not sacrificing herself in an alien invasion, not defeated by Daleks or kidnapped by the Master, Joe Grant died in her sleep in a house fire. <sighs> 
And there's not even just one account of this, this isn't one story being very mean-spirited, because a ghost Joe Grant appears in this story as well and says the final memory she ever had was being at home. Hey, it was a long life, but don't get me thinking this kind of way about Joe Grant! I'm sorry, it's just a sensitive subject. Worse still, Joe finds this out for herself in one of the adventures to the year 2040. There's a whole novel of this, that year is fucked. Can't wait. Oh, Miss Grant, your iris matches the complete perfect description of this woman who died down the street. That's weird, her name was Joe as well. So that's rather grim. At the age of 77, Joe Grant becomes a ghost. But oh, that's a whole other story. Joe Grant's most recent adventures in her later life involve colluding with Unit, teaming up with Captain Jack Harkness to defeat more maggots. Let her join Torchwood. Let her join Torchwood. Becomes a karate master. Defeats Autons from her porch. I count it, and is kidnapped not once, not twice, three times by the Masters, the Nine, and Adam Mitchell. Yeah, God bless, things never seem to slow down for her. I don't remember at what part of her life she joined Iris Wildtime as a companion, <laughs> which is funny as is, but she did tell her off for drinking too much, which is <mwah> adorable. Two years ago, I bought this box set because I heard there was a story called The Sacrifice of Joe Grant, and let me tell you, I wasn't okay. Big Finish had me sweating that week. And frankly, how dare they even insinuate that? Joe Grant is a darling sweet angel, and I will defend and fight for her with my own bare hands if need be. The title's a tease, everything's safe, boys. And there's um a couple companions, actually, who once they get plonked back on Earth have really mundane, tragic, normal deaths. It, it's actually way more upsetting. Tegan seems to be fine these days, I think they've retconned it, but the gathering gave her cancer. She'd finished surgeries even. But I think with the passing of Liz Sladen, we've kind of cottoned on that we don't want these nasty endings for our beloved characters. These will immediately be forgotten about, I promise you. And thank God, because Miss Manning looking like a dime. If anyone can get in contact with Miss Manning's agent, I don't want to collab or anything, I just want to let her know that I have a crush on her. Katie! Fact number two, is there not enough sleaze for you in Doctor Who? Then may I suggest Torchwood. Is there not enough sleaze for you in Torchwood? Then may I recommend The Sins of Captain John. With his American accent dropped almost entirely, Captain John Hart heralds a Big Finish spin-off. One of the funniest, because there's almost no plot, it's just him going from location to location having time travel sex parties. On this box set, he briefly becomes sober for the first time in what seems to be years because he is horrified by the sensation. And the plots reflect that lots of banging, lots of screwing, lots of stealing and lots of flirting. If you thought Captain Jack was innuendo incarnate, <laughs> he got it from this guy. Terrible company, as Captain Jack learns in The Death of Captain Jack, where finally their time and space romance rivalry comes to a head and John Hartz wins. Getting the Infinity Gauntlet, sorry, Resurrection Glove? Locking up Captain Jack Harkness for the rest of human history and marrying the Queen of England. The death of Captain Jack tells the story of King John and the massive space-time paradox event that happens when he decides to reshape the world in his image. Imagine Sound of Drums mixed with Turn Left except one guy did all of it. What is his motive for turning England into a fascist empire? Well, it's mostly for fun, stealing Jack's life, running Torchwood, and my god, every single change made for 20th and 21st centuries imaginable, over the top of existing Doctor Who lore. There's this scene where Torchwood discovers a void ship and John drunkenly says, yeah, no, open up. <laughs> Dalek invasion. London massacred. Unit disbanded. But who needs them when the royal family now has access to mechs? Queen Elizabeth in a Gundam. This story is mad and brilliant. Halfway through the story, I actually found myself rooting for him because this version of British history was just infinitely better and somehow less sleazy. But then there's this. We want 10%. We want 
percent of the children of this world. Are you particularly fussy about nationality? Because if not, I think we've got ourselves a deal. That's just about the gutsiest joke I think you could make in the universe. But then, it gets personal. Captain John decides to recreate Torchwood Cardiff with himself as leader. Recruiting Owen, killing off Tosh, getting Gwen killed by driving too fast on a freeway, and turning Yanto into a maid. Yes, that kind of maid. And Yanto's weirdly into it. That does make me question how he would react to certain Torchwood stories. Like, come on, Susie, dead. Cannibals, dead. Abaddon, blam. Reese and his mother, way dead. Sex gas, hmm, you can stay. Some other things John gets up to with complete control of Earth. It's fake the Roswell landing, steals Jack's immortality away from him, and uh, oh yeah, kills Queen Victoria, the Queen of England. Making Captain John Hart the true hero of the Hooniverse. I won't say how this story concludes, but the John Hart timeline is a valid timeline. And it's not reversed as a cop-out like you think it might be. <coughs> I find it very interesting that Captain Jack's shadow character, who's just a lousy time agent scumbag, could do more damage and find more success than the Doctor's shadow, the Master. Still, more for him. I know who I'd rather live under. Could it really be that much worse? Beep 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 boo! Topical. He might be the universe's most rapey character. Well, but at least he's not a nonce. Anyway, before I get hung for treason, let's head to our final fact of the day. How about that time Doki who bought a companion at an auction? Going once, going twice, going to the scary Scottish man who keeps wagging around a UV light. Oh, don't worry, the Twelfth Doctor isn't a slave trader. The Twelfth Doctor is an art collector. Today we're talking about the companion Josephine Day, bought by the Twelfth Doctor and gift wrapped to the Eighth. I have seen worse presents. So, what are the moral implications of this? The Eighth Doctor, looking a bit like a fuckboy, returns to his home in Wales. The Eighth Doctor's got a lot of property, where he meets Josie, a painter, whose drawings have come to life and are attacking the village. They travel together for a couple of stories, where the Doctor confirms his theory that she herself is a living painting. Coated in, get this, anime particles. Dizzle, dizzle. Yare, yare. Sorry, Josephine, you are a painting of another lady. Which, when you really sit down and think about it, is horrifyingly existential. Lo and behold, the big bad of the mini arc is Lady Josephine herself, coming face to face with the billionaire she was modelled on. Man, just be a painting. It seems like an easy gig. This powerful woman commissioned the monks of anime. Weebs. A sentient likeness of her, a portrait, to carry on after she is gone. Which maybe would work if A, she had any memory or recollection of being this woman, and B, she was put to auction where the doctor bought her. Here's Twelve and Clara like dropping her off, giving her a home and the doctor a mate when he needs one the most. I wish my future self could drop off a girl right about now. Just a mate, just a chat, anything at this point. Send some of those future friends my way, hey? Eh? Josie is a character exclusive to the Titan range, and not even many of them come to that. With only four odd adventures under her belt, and a run that was cut short for no reason, Titan. This is one of those Eighth Doctor companions that just won't find a resolution. It's unclear whether the Twelfth Doctor knew that the painting was a sentient woman, but he bought her nonetheless and wanted to hang her up in his house. There's also an alien species called the Anima, tiny microscopic creatures from the Time Vortex that feed off of weird energy, allowing them to possess small household objects. Because, <clears throat> get this, all inanimate objects have the potential to be sentient. That's a fact in the Hooniverse. Imagine Toy Story, but for everything around you right now. Horrifying. Terrible. In Sock Pig, they take on the form of a small sock puppet, but can gain in power, able to turn themselves into a sentient house, a street, a museum. I don't know if that's the same thing, but it's the same idea. The anima are fantastic, and once you've introduced a monster like that into your world, anything can happen story-wise. 
Imagine the boneless, but they just want to party. It's a shame we're never going to see Josephine again, but you can pick up that entire mini run in these issues here. But it's also online if you know where to look. In my personal headcanon, the doctor put her back in the painting and hung her up on the wall. Welcome back to the Monsterverse, the home of crazy lore and titan sized trivia about the world of Godzilla. Last time, if you remember, we covered the origins of King Kong's Thunderhammer, Ultraman's copious tax fraud offenses, is Mothra actually a moth? And more. So let's see what mysteries the Hollow Earth holds for us today. Is it giant monsters? What else would it be? First up today, let's talk Dokuta Fool, a Japanese terrorist scientist. In English, known as Doctor Who. Doctor Who was a recurring villain of the King Kong show and battled many a kaiju. First released in 1967, could this be an intentional crossover with another series? Enter niche British sci-fi fantasy series Doctor Who, a serialized woke kid show that began in 1963. Originally a spin-off of Blue Peter, this show depicts Dokuta Fu and his friend Bru Peter battling all manner of evil robots, giant monsters and orientalist villains. It's for this reason that English weirdos have drawn a connection between this Doctor Who and the Toho Godzillaverse. Is there something there? Well, whilst Doctor Who certainly was not popular, or even broadcast to Japan at this time, this Doctor Who's resemblance to beloved Kong villain is admittedly uncanny. Wearing Dokuta Fu's iconic costume, sharing his obsessive goal to destroy all monsters, and saying his classic catchphrase, This isn't the last you've seen of me, King Kong. There certainly is more than a passing connection. As of course you all know, Dokuta Fu was a mad scientific genius. With a secret hideout in the North Pole, Dokuta Fu could be anywhere in the world in a flash. In the film King Kong Escapes, Doctor Who stole the plans for a robot duplicate of King Kong, a perfectly innocent operation. And what does he do? Use them to construct his ultimate creation, Mechani Kong, so he could mine the highly radioactive Element X for Madame Piranha. But when Doctor Who is betrayed by his assistant, Susan, King Kong defeats Mechani Kong, meaning Doctor Who must go to Mondo Island and use his brain control powers to control King Kong. That's how you create a classic cult character. This control did not last for long though as King Kong broke into his ship and killed Doctor Who and all of his henchmen on board. That brave, sometimes heroic ape. Japan salutes you. Dokuta Fu has been referenced in a Doctor Who novel since. Sadly, in the Hooniverse, Dokuta Fu seems to be a fictional character. Or a pre Hartnell Doctor. I hate making that clause. The Tenth Doctor claims he was present for the events that inspired the King Kong movie. A throwaway gag, but I absolutely need you to expand on that Doctor Who. Matrix! The, the bit's over, the bit's dead. There's our real fact. Unit, on the other hand, do have access to Kaiju. But, 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 but Sam, I hear you say, voice like a shriveled coward. There's lots of giant monsters in the Doctor Who verse. How are they Kaiju? Well. Japan doesn't appear often in the Doctor Who verse, but when it does, it's being besieged by giant monsters. There's the story Big in Japan, where Unit and the Japanese army deploy a giant mecha to battle... Uh, dinosaur? Oh, sorry, no, the Kaznak Simu system, which is a 3D video game technology that generates giant monsters. So that's a lot more sensible. Then the Doctor teams up with the Japanese branch of Unit again to take out the Axon, so if turn themselves into a giant golden baby. Hell, Japan gets a really stereotypical bad go of it, huh? Let's not forget the time the master set it all on fire for fun. But no, I'm actually referring to British soil. British kaiju. No, sorry, I mean the other one. In the comic official secrets, the Doctor Jack and Rose come across the 1970s unit team, who are battling astrally projected giant monsters. Yep, that Pacific rimming it. Just plug a guy up to a giant crab and let him loose. 
What was originally technology is then passed on to a kid who biologically inherited it? Did I get that right? Like, I'm sure I did, but that sounds too silly to believe. And with the Doctor's help and his laser cannon, he becomes King of the Monsters and saves the day. Meaning this technology still exists and is actually taken away in the next story. So, um... Unit in the 70s, or the British government, have access to astral projection, kaiju. And it just never comes up. This is the maddest Doctor Who story in a hot minute, and that's really saying something. This incident had so much collateral damage, and Unit's leader Harry Sullivan being so reckless, that Unit is actually shut down for a number of years. Which, hey, factor that into the Unit dating controversy. Now, whenever there's a massive season finale, my mind will be thinking, why doesn't Unit just use the giant Megalodon? Dalek Invasion, summon the crab! That's insane technology for people from 50 years ago to have. Um, maybe it's a good investment? I think you got a couple invasions coming your way in the next 50 years. Are the Doctor and Clara drift compatible? Number two, we're actually gonna speed things up a bit because I spent so long talking about Kaiju. What can I say? King Kong vs Godzilla 2021. Not showing in cinemas right now. Matrix, do the boobly boop. The Doctor can sense evil. But only sometimes, because sometimes the Doctor doesn't even believe in evil as a concept. Hardly anything is evil, but most things are hungry. Hey, great line, good philosophy, not compatible with the series we've seen so far. Let me introduce you to Grey Man. This is a member of the very first species ever created, and his people created the binary system of good versus evil. Not as in a faith or a religion, but an actual physical entity. An actual battle happening amongst the stars. The Doctor himself originally was a ardent believer in evil, because according to Twice Upon a Time, it's one of the most central reasons he left Gallifrey to begin with. There is good, and there is evil. I left Gallifrey to answer a question of my own. Why does good prevail? That sounds like a guy who's convinced that evil isn't just a philosophy or a matter of perspective. But no, some doctors, namely the Scottish ones, insist that it's not that literal. The very same doctor that battles physical manifestations of evil and hatred on the daily. And I don't just mean like the master or the Daleks, hell even the Daleks think they're the good guys from their point of view. I mean the true chaotic gaseous balls of hate. I am evil incarnate. All right, buddy, chill out. The Seventh Doctor battles Femric and legitimate elder gods of chaos and general mischief. There is something evil here, and we must stay. Evil? Don't be daft. Evil is what I meant. The Doctor has a very complex relationship with the concept of evil, but he shouldn't because he has an actual sense in his body that tells him when it's nearby. Don't believe me? How about this scene? You know there's something alien about that tower. I can sense it. Good old London. I, I, can, I can feel it. It's got something sort of powerful. It's... Look at my skin. Look at that. I've got that pricking sensation. That sensation again, the same. Just as I had when I thought the Daleks, those Daleks were near. Ah, uh, well that was just the 60s. Who could be surprised if they gave him a random superpower one week? Can't you sense it now? Sense what? Evil. There's evil in this place. Yeah, but surely not in the revival. Look at that. What? Something very not good indeed. What thing very not good? Look there, in the window of the church. I know evil when I see it, and I see it in that window. The Doctor has a spidey sense. He can smell evil, which would help in stories like this, this, and this. That itching feeling he gets when he's around Daleks, well that comes back in Evil of the Daleks. If the Doctor knew Daleks were nearby, stories would go by a lot quicker. So look at these other Doctors trying to be all measured and grown up. Doctor, you battled a physical manifestation of evil yesterday. Its name was the Mara, Fenric, actual Satan. Some people don't believe in evil, Rose. They say it's all subjective. No moral absolutes. Well, take a look at them. Literal embodiments of evil very much do exist and we have met them. The Black Guardian, a massive dork, but still an everlasting constant born out of the physical evil out there. Hell, when you go up against a character literally called the Shadow, it's time to dismiss claims of subjectivity. The real world has that line, the Hooniverse, 
does not. I love it when series give their main character an ability to sense evil. On whose grounds? On what judgement? I have that too, it's called a brain. If either of these doctors are admitting that the binary model isn't correct and true, that means we were fed a bunch of propaganda about these guys. I don't like that idea. Doctor Who kind of struggles on the moral grey. On the subject of evil incarnates... Torchwood's Gwen Cooper, emotional heart of the team, supportive mum, no. Gwen Cooper's true purpose was to be the ultimate, destined host of the Fendal. <laughs> this one's a fun one. Not that I remember much from Image of the Fendal, but I distinctly remember it ending with the Fourth Doctor dropping the Fendaline into a giant supernova. Amazingly, this doesn't kill it, and somehow off-screen makes it stronger. So it returns to Earth and tries again, this time embedding itself into the Cooper family tree. Remember Gwyneth from The Unquiet Dead? Turns out Torchwood is actually doing something with her. Her ability to look into the Time Vortex was thanks to the suggestions of the Fendal. Now that's a retcon and a half. And whilst Gwen doesn't have that ability, she does know that there is an alien entity inside of her body. From birth? And again, it's just never mentioned in the show. Knight of the Fendal tells us that Gwen took tortured training to control her demons to resist mind control. The Fendal made one big mistake when they tried to take over this planet. I could have been the perfect victim, born on the rift, right genetics, right job, but the wrong bloody character, because I'm nobody's victim. They tried to use me anyway, so tonight I used it back, played along, let it think it was in charge, and I found out what it wanted, and now I'm done with it. Just like that? Just like that. This raises the question, why did Big Finish do this? Apart from the fact that they could. A, it's an excellent idea. B, they had to put Gwen up against somebody. This was part of a quadrilogy where tortured members went up against Doctor Who monsters. Jack battled maggots, Reese battled autons, and Susie Costello got to hang out with Margaret Slavine for an evening. A ladies' night. I bought all of these stories the second they were announced. I hate how predictable I am. Gwen joins a smutty film shoot, with the cast and crew are carrying out actual murder sacrifices to appease the Fendal, just so it can appear and make a cameo in their movie. Yeah, amateur film budgets be like that sometimes. Gwen, pretending to be under the Fendaline's control, plays along, leading it to kill every single last one of them. It's um, it's a really good story. Gwen Cooper 1, Doctor Who 0. So uh, yeah, Gwen Cooper is the physical manifestation of evil. Certainly explains a lot of things, like the cheating, and becoming a cop. I wonder if Russell T Davis knows this pretty significant change. Probably doesn't care. But I do. This story wasn't even a tortured mission, it was just Gwen Cooper settling some beef. Gwen Cooper is one bad bitch. Walking on set to a six foot two dog man. Welcome all to a very special episode of Broke Cannon. Thank you for joining me today, where I must sadly announce the departure of my lovely, lovely dog, Dusty Springfield, who passed away surrounded by loved ones at a ripe old age in the late hours of last week. Despite her various tax scandals, she was a beloved dog. She was a festive dog, and she was very well loved by the internet. Her favourite pastimes involved poor and reading the comments. Thank you for leaving so many nice ones. And in her honour, I thought, how do I apply this to my incredibly niche and insular Doctor Who web series? Uh, well I can't really. Apart from the big cheese, there's really not many dogs in this verse. Like a disappointing amount of dogs. Why can't we meet the famous dogs of history? Toto, Lassie, Beethoven. Napoleon's dog. Did he have a dog? But most of all, Scooby-Doo. Today I thought I would rank the Doctor Who dogs <laughs> and see if that was anything. In tribute to that lovely, silly rescue dog. Number one, K9, the most famous Doctor Who dog. Some versions are capable of friendship, some versions are capable of warfare and espionage, but all of them are capable 
of snobbery. You see, K9, he's a good boy technically, but that's because his programming dictates he must be. A good dog is a dog that can humiliate themselves. K9 may be a convenient trundling plot device with an inbuilt stun gun, but these are none of the features I look for in man's best friend. Look, I have a dog to feel better than something. It happens very rarely. A smirking supercomputer that can beat me at chess is the exact opposite of that feeling. Pros, algorithmically loyal. Also a good guard dog. Cons, you can't take him anywhere with a bad terrain. He's very fragile and he also might run for office. Bad dog. Then there's Leaky from Image of the Fendar. Owned by Adam Colby, this dog discovered a dead body setting the plot into motion. Without Leaky, how could Doctor Who have ever saved the day? He then does nothing else in the story. Then there's Fifi, Helen A's pet dog. It's an alien dog, but we take those. Seen in the Happiness Patrol and also terrorizing the streets of EastEnders, this thing was rat nasty, and that's why Ace decided to blow it to pieces. Prisoner Zero took the form of Barney Collins whilst he was in a coma. Guy was dreaming about walking his dog, so, that's a good owner. Being a Rottweiler shoots you right up my score list. Packs of dog were common and wild in the 22nd century during the Dalek occupation of Earth. Bad dog. Oh, Rose. Rose, come to mummy. A parallel pup from Pete's world. Is that technically a bad wolf? According to the wiki, there has been at least one dog companion called Butch. Sadly, this is from a 1966 annual story, so his fate remains unknown. I hope someone remembered to feed him. Cybermen love dogs. They turn them into Cybermats. Cyber dogs, Cyber shades, Cyber wolves? There's a million good uses for dog parts. Man's best friend to the end. There's dogs on the planet Mechanus, Ice World, Trenzalore, and even Vulcan, as there's a dog just heard barking in the background from Sound Studio 5. Yeah, explain that one. And then of course, the planet Barcelona known for its dogs without noses. But then how do they smell? Awful. So we've got a clear winner in this 2021 national dog contest. Surprise, the contest was rigged. Dusty wins. I'm just sad that there's so few to choose from. I'm clutching at straws. Series 13, you can do better. Space for all, there better be. The main dog I want to talk about today is Laika, the first dog in space. A Russian mongrel, Laika made history, but was also cruelly abandoned, roaming the stars forever. In 2017, in Big Finish's Short Trips competition, I entered the Laika Link, a 12 Clara story revolving around the titular hound. I was pretty happy with it. Laika's place in history is a very sad one, but then Big Finish messaged me and politely reminded me that they have done a Laika story before. I was not happy. To this day, that is the most correspondence I have ever had with the Big Finish company. That story is 1963 The Space Race, where she was rescued by an alien entity and given human level intelligence. I think that's my favourite audio cliffhanger, is the ending to part one. That's not a human, Perry. It's Laika. Oof. And if that wasn't enough of a spoiler, may I just tell you now? that Laika is the main villain of this piece. You were the chosen one! Oh my god, that's better than anything I could have written. But that's not all. She also gets a mention in the book Alien Bodies, where the third Doctor and Sarah Jane laid her to rest on the planet Quiescia. 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 Simultaneously, the Doctor lands on a planet of dog people in The Good Doctor and just states that they were descended from Laika pretty big leap to make. When even Laika the space dog has many contradictory fates in the Hooniverse, I think your cannon's gone out the window a long time ago. Man, just make her a companion already. Matrix, fact number two please. Doctor Who has a comic strip. That might not come as a surprise for a series that talks extensively about Doctor Who comic strips, but I mean in universe. Steady on, Metal Mickey. We inferior? You must be mistaking us for someone else. I'm the Quantum Hurricane, the Blazing Supernova, a chrononaut from the planet Galahad in the system of Karagactus. I'm the Time Surgeon, and this is my assistant, Nurse Kara. My diagnosis? You're running out of time. 
steampunk hipster to 12 doctor with tattoos and piercings. Did somebody peek at my Christmas list? But you see, this is not the doctor. This is the Time Surgeon. From a very popular comic run that takes influence from the Doctor's life and all records of him and his battles. The Doctor and Clara first discover this comic in a battle against the Boneless, a story that resolves itself by the Doctor becoming one with a comic book, a favourite pastime of Titan Comics. Comic books save the day! Yeah, right, of course they do. But 12, predictably, is not impressed. Not because his likeness has been stolen, not because he's not getting paid royalties, or that his secret is blown. No, he just thinks it's um, inaccurate. So, in the story Invasion of the Mind Morphs, the 12 Doctor invites the comic book artist and the comic book writer into the TARDIS for adventures to see how it really is. Because if anything, more of this confidential information should be out there in the public. Good idea, Doctor Who. Do you want a Linda situation? Because that's how you get a Linda situation. It's a far cry from the Doctors of Revival's past. Nine deleted himself off of the internet. Eleven doomed a guy to an infinite time loop for selling any of his information. I got too big, Dorian. Too noisy. Time to step back into the shadows. But no, Twelve's all over it. He's more so giving notes. The fact that comic book creators have the docs arrive on their doorstep and give them access to all time and space, totally not artist self-inserts, means that the bar is lower than ever. Where was Elton's invite onto the TARDIS? What did Clive get for his troubles? Shot in the face. But then, the 12th Doctor was never really concerned about a low profile, meaning that now the Doctor is a famous pop culture icon. It would make sense, he is best friends with Doctor Strange and Spider-Man, but when I'm watching his episodes back, it just tickles me. Do none of these university students read comics? Did Clara give clearance for using her likeness? Wouldn't 12 be able to remember Clara's face from said comic? How do Unit feel about all of this breach of confidentiality? What are these feelings that Steampunk about is bringing out of me? The questions are positively limitless. And I know he's all over our history, our mythology, and our culture, but not, um, you know, this literally. At least he's usually called Loki or Father Christmas or something. Not battling death roids and the minister. I would read The Time Surgeon in a heartbeat. Sonny and Val get a couple travels in the TARDIS before eventually being dropped back on Earth to continue their work. Where presumably a unit SWAT team was on them in seconds. Weird story. And fact number three. What's this? Something's trying to come through. In my courtroom trial? No, it can't be. I have come to reveal from within the Matrix itself that you are the timeless child. That strikes me as unlikely. Who are you? My name is Russell on Productions and I make audios and stuff. My most notable project is Doctor Who Dark Days, which features every Doctor, and like Broke Cannon, it treats Cannon like a playground. Hello? Can anyone hear me? Nah, fuck it. I am here to talk to you all about a video game named Dalek Attack. It's a game in which you commit several genocides as the Seventh Doctor. Which, let's face it, that's pretty much his day job at this point and get to go around using the Doctor's signature arsenal, such as a laser gun and grenades. You know, casual Doctor Who weapons. The plot is basically Davros decides one day to steal the sacred time ring, which we all know is a fundamental part of Doctor Who. The Time Lords get a bit mad, as they do, and send the Doctor to do their dirty work. Screw Genesis, this was the first act of the Time War. You travel to the sewers, London, the bouquet that is Paris, New York, because the Doctor has always had a great time in America, Tokyo, and finally, Scarrow. It was released on a few Amstrad and Atari consoles in 1992. Spoilers for the game's ending if you're going to go play Dalek Attack on your Amstrad device. It ends with the Dalek Emperor being blown up by the Doctor with his sonic screwdriver, and the Time Lords arrested Davros and placed him in stasis. And that really went well for them in the long term. As this is Doctor Who, this video game naturally has other versions of itself that contradict each other, with some versions having the 4th, 5th and 7th Doctor as playable characters, 
So, basically, after a remembrance of the Daleks, the Seventh Doctor decided to go on a murder spree because he hadn't had enough of killing Daleks. After the genesis of the Daleks, the Fourth Doctor changed his mind and decided to commit the genocide anyway. If anyone has experience of shooting Ogrons, it's the Third Doctor. Another fun fact about this game is apparently, this game and Dimensions in Time was a dream by the Seventh Doctor. Now, I just think this is the Seventh Doctor going through denial of, you know, slaughtering a bunch of Daleks and mimes. Let's never forget the mimes. May they rest in peace. There are a lot more enemies than I thought in this game, such as a rat, red ogrons, trapped hostages, which you can choose to either save or kill, robotic dogs, gang members, mummies, and mimes. You can kill mimes in this game. So overall, this is a pretty run-of-the-mill Doctor Who game. You know, I'm just waiting for a Victor Kennedy dating simulator, if I'm honest. I mean, just come on, give the fans what they want. And back in. Okay, sorry about that Nostalgia Critic cameo. Hopefully we don't have any more of them coming up. I am a human Dalek. Welcome back to The Matrix. If there's one thing fans don't like, it's being told no. No, you're not getting answers to this. No, you cannot know who he is. But where do they come in the timeline? That's what the cucks say. <laughs> oh no, Sam. Yeah, I've got a new channel picture. I'm like two steps away from becoming a Ransona channel. Oh, arms crossed and everything. Ugh. And since there are so many questions we will never get answers for, fan writers come in and they answer them by force. What are the Time Lords? Who are the Morbius heads? These are nothing compared to the real question. Who was Jim the Fish? Oh, Jim the Fish, how is he? Still building his dam. <laughs> Jim the Fish. <laughs> well, we all know Jim the Fish. Jim the Fish is a recurring, mysterious figure only referenced in episodes by Stephen Moffat. It's a cute nudge nudge wink wink joke that the Doctor and River have had adventures that we have not seen off screen. An ongoing reference that everybody in this universe seems to know but us. Well, sorry Stevie, somebody gave an actual concrete answer. I did a lot of research for this one before I even knew there was an answer. I'm embarrassed by how far I had to look into Jim the Fish. Like, some real devotion to the bit here. Give me some credit. One such rabbit hole led me to Jim, a 79 year old gardener. Unfortunately, this does not seem to be our Jim the Fish we're looking for as he lives in Sussex and isn't fictional, so it seems unlikely. Though he has been walking the River House for 60 years, so, you know, hands up to Jim. Moffat's Day the Doctor novelization tells us that River and Eleven quite literally met a fish building a dam. There is no bigger mystery to it. River was very fond of Jim. The way they talk about him, I don't know whether he was the Doctor's companion or one of River's husbands, but there's a history. Which, if he is an actual fish, has many moral implications. Eventually, it's the PS3 game The Eternity Clock that gives us our answer. Oh dear. Uploading data to cyber control. Uploading data to cyber control. Uploading data to... You will be deleted. Get past these strangely voiced Cybermen and you can find a collectible unearthing River Song's diary. During an archaeological dig on the planet Anterior 16 Quarterbane, the Doctor took her and Jim out to a bar. One of Dorium's bars, where they all got blackout drunk in the 48th century. And although everybody knows the story of Jim the Fish, none of them do, as the Doctor and River have no memories of the event. This is bad, because the rest of the universe seems to know about it. Put these three in a bar with a time machine and shots? That's gonna get messy. It's like a Doctor Who version of The Hangover, and the only clues they have of the night is a song from the far future and a video recorder with the tape missing. It turns out that a future civilization worshipped Jim the Fish. There are ancient sandstone slabs that river unearths of Jim the Fish in that suit, in that bar, singing that song. Gills flaring, teeth sparkling under the glitter ball. 
River, the Doctor, and Jim the Fish accidentally believe they created a love religion. And, uh, yeah, use your imagination there. You don't need to Google that. And it's a religion that's popular enough for it to be common hearsay. The Doctor is a household name as a sex god. Which is hilarious and would be fine if it wasn't Matt Smith's Doctor. You have no idea how good that feels. Ah, uh, you know, I'm more of a Troughton guy myself. There is no such thing as a mystery in Doctor Who. You cannot hide from us. Matrix, fact number two. Hybrids are near impossible. This comes from a statement haphazardly made by the Ape Doctor in Creed of the Crowman, who says that two species were hardly ever able to interbreed. And then the revival came along and the next 20 years of storytelling were principally about the fact that there are weird human aliens all around the place. But that never for a minute stopped Balstrek. God rest his soul. I am the last pure human. The others mingled. The character of Cassandra O'Brien doesn't really work if interbreeding is near impossible. Cyber humans, cat humans, wasp humans, time lord humans. The future looks awesome. Cut to Moffat and suddenly the word hybrid gets a bit more sensitive, as series 9 is spent teasing us with possible combinations of characters and species. They pop up every episode. And now, a list of every single hybrid I can find in the Doctor Who series. Green Baby in Delta of the Bannermen. Flisk Humans from Snow Globe 7. Everybody on Raxacoracophalopatorius. Everybody in End of the World. Blue People. All of Susan Foreman's children. Melody Pond. Rose Tyler and the Parallel World Doctor. Uh oh. Uh oh! The woman from Spiral Scratch, whose dad was a Silurian. Luke Smith? Adelaide Brooks' descendants. One day, a brook will even fall in love with a Tandonian prince, and that's the start of a whole new species. King Peladon was part human, I remember that. Mrs. Kids, Mrs. Quill's kid, Ice Warrior humans. Dog Bolter and his daughter are part frog. They're scary cat children from Gridlock who say mama. Mama! <laughs> Ugh. Perry had kids with Brian Blessed. Let's not get started on Daleks. For a species who love racial purity, they sure are bad at it. Dalek Sec is right there, man, and he's crying out of his one little horrid eye. Okay, yeah, yeah, you at the back. Uh, I was wondering if Dalek Sec reproduces asexually? Get out of my class. Oh me, oh my. Frankly, the idea of interspecies crossbreeding being nigh impossible. It's kind of a rocky road, morally. Especially when we have fans in our own fandom who are trying to crossbreed with greyhounds to create the ultimate racing dog, part human, part man. Mr. Roberts, no! What are you doing? There's hybrids all over this show. The 70s didn't have a problem with it. The 80s got a bit freaky with it. The 90s made the Doctor into one. Really, the only one that doesn't is Stevie Moffat. Which is funny, because the criticism is usually that he is too overtly sexual. And then, worst of all, and I saved this till last, for those of you who don't know this already, uh, you're in for a shock. Spoilers for Corpse Day. PC Andy and Owen are kidnapped and thrown into a basement. The basement of a terrifying Welshman called Glyn Lewis. Glyn Lewis is the most evil depraved character in this entire verse, and that's saying something. <laughs> Mr. Lewis, a serial kidnapper of women, was given a weevil to raise as his own child. This is Sonny. And what Glyn does with Sonny is that <clears throat> he gets his adopted son a lot of women. Some for eating, some for the other thing. The plot of Corpse Day is a man using a weevil to impregnate women. Yeah, I, I, I think, Doctor, that hybrids are actually pretty common. More on that another time? I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever be up to talking about that one. Matrix onto the last fact of the day. 
the world of River Song. In an attempt to jump the shark and go full Moffats, Series 6's season finale has River Song wreck the world. All time and space happens at the same time. And for reasons, this cannot keep going on. Even though everybody seems quite happy with the arrangement. There's hot air balloons, and the ecosystem is better than ever. Silurians are finally living in harmony with humans. Charles Dickens is on TV! Maybe I haven't watched the episode for a while, but I would be content living in one minute for the rest of eternity. As much as I dislike this episode, River Song refusing her captors and fobbing off all of reality to save the Doctor is a power play. One that the Doctor spends the entire runtime berating her for. Man, I love stories where Doki Who just scolds everyone for doing good things. Now let's jump over to the comic The Four Doctors where Paul Cornell shows us each Doctor's worst timeline. The biggest mistake they could have potentially made in the multiverse. And that's an inspired idea. In their tenures, what is the most terrible thing Doctors 9 through 12 could have done? Well, we don't have to imagine 12s because he did it. And 11s is obviously kissing a lesbian without consent. So maybe more aptly, what is the worst timeline? 12 sends away Clara in the beginning moments of Dark Water. 10 leaves Wilf to die and becomes an Emperor, a Time Lord victorious, only to get assassinated by a Raxacoracophalopatorian. Uh-oh, that's been done, buddy. But the 11th Doctor's is a lot more interesting, as he just decides that the River Song timeline is the one for him. Gives up being the Doctor, gives up his Time Lord responsibilities, and settles down with her as all of time coalesces. This means that the Doctor was seriously considering this in the Series 6 finale. Giving up and giving in to River Song. The power of this woman. Sorry, Wilf, no exceptions for you. Just leave me. Okay, right then, I will. Of course, this little slice of happiness is done at the expense of everybody else in the universe. It's incredibly selfish, especially as they could just do this whenever they feel like it, and eventually do. The brilliant book 2012 has a short story detailing everything that went on in this topsy-turvy collage world. It turns out that all of human history happening at once mostly involves historical figures being part of 21st century morning TV. William Shakespeare writes for EastEnders, whilst Jane Austen wrote for Emmerdale. Sorry Lance. Emily Bronte and the Joan of Arc hosted Loose Women, oh dear. Sherlock Holmes was a host on Detex Factor for ITV1. Bad pun, man. And Winston Churchill, Napoleon, and Vincent van Gogh all follow Cleopatra on Twitter. There's also a talent show called Dinosaurs Have Got Talent, which I presume was run into the ground by being aired non-stop for 25 years. Who knew that all of time and space and human achievements was so dull? I like River Song's world, I wish we'd spent more time there in a good story. As it stands now, it does feel like Moffat just saying, hmm, I'll do a Moffat thing. Wibbly wobbly timey world. We've done no time, now let's do all time. Is how I think Stephen Moffat's creative process works, because I'm a sardonic prick. This is a really cool timeline, one that I could see Eleven doing. Yeah, it's awful, but remember how beat up he was during this arc. If only one Doctor in the multiverse did it, the Daleks could weaponize it. Which is probably why they find the Ninth Doctor in a cafe at the end. I reckon I know the real reason why he wasn't involved in all this. Yes, the Vord couldn't find even a single timeline in all those billions where he was anything other than fantastic. Ideas don't come more ludicrously high concept than that. You sound like a Welshman. God help me, I've gone native. Welcome back to the Matrix. Hey, does anyone know how to get any of the Dalek set -like hybrid masks on the cheap? Like, don't even talk to me about the dark net, right? I got scammed there once and it's never gonna happen again. I got a VPN, I got Bitcoin, just someone put me in touch with the right guy for that. I'm a man, I've got needs. Today, what's on the agenda? Doctor Who trivia just like the previous 32 times. And for our first fact, roulette wheel go! In Doctor Who, Cornwall is an independent 
Nation. Now this one's funny because I'm not going to direct you to some obscure comic or audio play from the 1920s. It's not a reference to a throwaway line in a Radio Times comic strip. This one's actually in the show itself. Big thank you to Employee426 on Twitter for bringing this one to my attention. As in the Series 1 episode of Boomtown, if you zoom in on that newspaper cover, right down in the small print, on a high quality enough scan, it reads, Margaret Blaine also revealed that at one point Wales had nearly lost the project to the newly established Independent Republic of Cornwall. Which would have been unthinkable. Yeah, so thank Employee 426 for being the kind of person who reads the small print. We've got to talk about that, right? For those of you unaware, Cornwall is a small county in our southwestern tip. It's mostly moorland, a lot of fishing, a lot of mining, and a lot of tourism. If I could choose to be somewhere in the country right now, it would be Cornwall. Cornwall is one of the poorest areas in the United Kingdom with a GVA of 70.9% of the national average. That was back in 2015. Don't ask how I know these things, by the way. My knowledge extends to very particular weird areas, as you know, watching this series. And technically, technically, Cornwall is a unitary authority. It's a very weird oddity. Since 1889, we've all just been acting as if Cornwall is an English county. But uh, no, it never formally got annexed or taken over. And yet despite this, there are many, many people who actually do want Cornwall to become an independent republic. It's not just a gag. This is a real thing. Um, good luck to them. Them and the Scots, <laughs> jump off of this ship. God help me, I've gone native. But by the time of 2005 in the Doctor Who universe, they're a very powerful republic, to the point where the United Kingdom, still in the EU, needs to trade with them. Is this the most petty fact I've covered so far? Absolutely yes. One production designer put that on there as a quick gag. No one was meant to see it. Maybe Eccleston would get a quick laugh out of it. But here it is. That's a creative decision. But what does this mean for us lowly Brits? Is independence the true way forward? Do we give too much power to unspoken traditions of the past? Margaret Slavine seems to think so. I often forget that Margaret was an actual mayor, a representative of the people. For some reason, she didn't steal some new skin, she ran for office. A democratic Slavine. She was the mayor of Cardiff, with tortured right underneath her nose. What is with Davis's distrust of authority? Oh wait, yeah, that'll do it. Now, my immediate reaction to this as a paranoid Brit is, do they have a military? Are they armed? The Doom Coalition story Beachhead tells us, yes they are, and they have an anti-terrorist division. Take that, Vord. Cornwall shows up a couple of times in the Doctor Universe, most of the time in the past. There's the Stones of Blood and the Smugglers? But it seems that as suddenly powerful as this Republic of Cornwall was, they didn't last very long. As in the year 2017, Stegmore is specifically named an English seaside town. Hey look, I know, it's a contradiction. Either the Doctor's history is not up to scratch, or Nicholas Briggs did not know about this one tiny detail in the episode Boomtown. Both inexcusable. Maybe one day we will annex Cornwall and take out that fucking smug-ass Doc Martin whilst we're at it. I'm done with your bad bedside manner, old man. Number two, give me a fact from my favorite episode of Classic Who. <sighs> Don't you mess with me, Matrix. My true favorite episode of Classic Who is within The Chase. The one with Dracula. I am Count Dracula. You heard the man. What's with Sam's weird vampire fixation? More like what's with Doctor Who's weird vampire fixation? In the final events of episode 4 of The Chase, Journey into Terror, Vicky is left behind as the TARDIS just materialises without her. Yeet. Look Doc, I know The Chase is on, I know you're being rushed around a bit at the minutes, but please, please check if everybody is inside, especially the young girl that you kidnapped. Is there a chance of going back for Vicky? Yes, of course it's possible, but it might take months, even years. But Doctor, if we all work together, if, if Ian and I helped you, surely it's worth a try. Yes, my dear, I know it's worth a try, but you don't think the Daleks are going to sit back and allow us to tinker, do you? The team decides we have to go back for her. We left her with Daleks. And Frankenstein somehow. 
But what we didn't see was a hidden secret short story. The Target Storybook. Its main theme is that it likes to inject events into stories that we know and love. Did you know the Seventh Doctor went on five side missions in remembrance? Did you know that Adric Anissa took a trip to Slave Trade America during the events of the Visitation? What? Why? It seems that everything in Doctor Who is happening off screen. And the short story Journey Out of Terror tells us the exact events that happen in between episode 4 and episode 5 of The Chase. Somehow Doctor Who and the Daleks arrived in the land of fiction. A couple seasons early. You mean if we share stories we combine those forces? Exactly! You nurture it and it grows! But enough people will believe the same thing. It can achieve existence. You're talking about a realm of make-believe, Ian scoffed. And by closing their eyes, joining hands and clicking their heels together, they wake up in the book Monsters from Outer Space. Immediately they meet Bunny the dog and Julia Jett, a young girl. Trapped in outer space without her parents, the doctor starts really building up a bond with young Julia. The kind of vulnerability Barbara notices, they only shared with Susan and Vicky. Look, all I'm saying is, this old man kidnapped every single one of you. Ian and Barbara created an environment that enabled him to do so. They didn't speak up. How many more young women will we let this monster groom? And it's midway through this story that Barbara starts to get angry and really worried that the Doctor is considering replacing Vicky. Remember, this is early Doctor. It wasn't long ago he was hitting cavemen with rocks. As both Julia and Bunny <laughs> are given invitations to travel on the TARDIS. Whew, that's cold, Doctor. This poor girl, trapped on a Dalek ship? Hell, there's plenty of feckless young women out there. Plenty. Eventually, the Doctor realises he can't take Julia with them, as she is a fictional character, and completely rooted to this plane. Could this be the first of many attempts the Land of Fiction makes to ensnare Doctor Who? Keep him there, by giving him exactly what he wants. Eventually, they get Vicky back, with ne'er an apology. Ian and Barbara decide, nope, we've seen enough, and they bounce as well. Please let me know if there's any other stories where the Doctor just left without someone by complete accident. It's so funny to me. And finally, fact number three. <laughs> Gwen almost left Reese for an alien. Ah, series one Gwen Cooper. She couldn't even stay faithful for three episodes. Many people have taken issue with Gwen Cooper's early characterization, leading her to cheat on her fiance, Reese. Although from the TV stuff, just from our knowledge, it's only Owen Harper, along with a series of suggestive looks to Jack. Oh, and that one brief thing, but that doesn't count because of pheromone sex gas? I don't know, look, I'm not re-watching that episode to find out. I didn't want to have to be the one to break it to you, but in Torchwood, these hoes ain't loyal. Cheating is a real world, dark thing that real people do. And I get it might be disorientating for a Doctor Who companion to do it. Clara. Rose. But if you're not going to explore such subject matter in Torchwood, what show are you going to do it in? But the one constant of the Torchwood series, no matter what form it takes, is that Reese Williams is a genuinely down to earth, good constant in the world. He deserves better than this. And hey, he gets his happy ending. After almost dying twice, going on the run and becoming a freelance member of Torchwood. Hell, he even had an excellent barbecue that time and invited everyone to it. I haven't listened to that one yet. I don't know if that's what happens in it. But I've been reading the Torchwood novels lately. The early releases. Border Princes is the maddest novel you can imagine. It's like trying to do an entire series worth of ideas in one small book. Everything from fish aliens to rift ghosts, the dark destroyer Abaddon, to one tortured member called James Mayer. And he's the one we're going to be talking about today. Sorry, Abaddon turns out is just really boring. I don't know, he's uh, Satan's brother? But whew, this is one busy book. An alien from another dimension who integrated himself into the Torchwood team as if he'd always been there. Just like the series 2 episode Adam. Oops, you did the same thing twice. You think they'd stop falling for this? James was a border prince. Sort of hosts of the Rift. It was their job to inspect and understand everything that comes through it. Suffice to say, they weren't very good at their job. 
But James forgot he was an alien, genuinely believing he was an original member of the Torchwood team. I say, let him stay. He's not doing any harm. But when Gwen takes a trip out of Cardiff, she realizes that she has no recollection of James at all, as the gang have to come to terms with the fact that one of their best friends doesn't actually exist. It's that episode of Rick and Morty with Sleepy Gary. You're real, Jerry. Remember our vacation? Now this affected everybody on the team. But most of all, Gwen, who had not only been having an affair with James behind Reese's back, but was ready to leave Reese for him. Ugh. No wedding, no baby, We're gonna run off with an alien. Which isn't the strangest thing in this series. It's fair to say that a lot of ideas from this were lifted for the next series of Torchwood the year after. The episode Adam goes a lot further in some places, and actually is a lot tamer in others. Right, James may have been a catfish without ever knowing it, but he didn't sexually abuse the team. He didn't trick Yanto into thinking he was a murderer. And now I've just got this cartoony image of both of them trying to infiltrate Torchwood at the same time. Oh hi James, you remember me? Yes Adam, I'm James. You remember James? In the end, James had to be killed. An alien bodyguard arrived in the hub and shot him to death, releasing him from his earthly body. Leaving Gwen in quite the awkward predicament. I'd call it karma, but now we know that it's just the Fendal, so I guess I can excuse it. Hey, honestly, good luck to her. Sometimes we have to settle for second best. Third best. Fourth? Fourth best. Hey, it could be worse. You could marry PC Andy. Dump her ass, King. Her name was Ashad. Welcome back to the Matrix. Just earlier this year, NASA landed a probe on Mars, tricking a kind robot into going to space and then sending us his holiday pics. Thanks, Gadget Gadget. So why am I feeling so uncharacteristically topical today? Because of our first fact. Space. Humans in space. A nightmare waiting to happen. Sometimes I think about how lucky I will be if I don't live to see the first space colony. Because you know, you know that one of the first buildings I'll construct will be a bank. Or a subway. Or two subways. It makes me utterly depressed. The end point of capitalism. Whilst we still have 31 years until Bowie Base 1, human history in the stars is well documented. And as you'd expect in Doctor Who, none of it fits together right. Alright you guys, all of you, all the writers, I'm calling a round meeting. The Doctor Who version of the space race is fairly intact even though you, you and you were all pulling strings in it. Hell, the fourth Doctor personally commandeered Apollo 8 and revealed that the entire NASA mission was just a unit foil to get him some emergency space parts. Be a good chap and fly them up to me, will you? Trust the Doctor to weaponize a historical event. Multiple times. Seeds of Death correctly predicted that in the far off future of the 21st century, century, humanity will grow bored of space travel and will have mostly given up and lost interest. Which... <clears throat> seems unlikely. Too many contradictions to even know where to start and don't even get me started on humanity's first contact. <laughs> it's a whole series of alien encounters. But when the public aren't in denial or having their memory sucked into a crack in time or hung over, it's generally agreed by Earth in verse that the first contact was 1996 by the Ice Warriors. But then also 2006 when the Slovene threw a pig at a London landmark. Yeah, let's ignore all those other ones. How will they explain this tomorrow? You'll all forget it ever happened. The human superpower, forgetting. Then there's Empress of Mars, cheekily reminding us that this isn't our past nor our world. Screw historical accuracy, the British were so good at colonialism that we pledged our way to space in 1881. Rule Britannia! But hey, as we know, the 21st century is when everything changes. And you gotta be ready. And we were. Alien Species wants to fly over, you gotta deal with Torchwood, Unit, The Forge, Bannerman Road, Cole Hill, Ryan and Graham, K9, ICIS, Probe, The Department, MI5, The Governments of the World, The Ghost, and Doctor Who. 
it is defended. Early into the 21st century, there's so many competing space agencies that uh, Oz, Spain, Germany, and the Philippines all rush out into space as well with their own space programs. But obviously, naturally, Britain got there the most. I can't put my arm down. Arm, stop being evil. Damn, turns out I do have a single patriotic bone in my body. And it's my humerus. Then in 2049, the timeline behaves itself suddenly and says that natural disasters almost push us to extinction. Oops. So Earth is often inhospitable, despite many other stories also being said in this time of no acknowledgement. I mean, pff, it's gonna happen, but the poor sod who decided to situate their story in the 52nd century didn't do their homework. Then the most beautiful moment of the revival happens. Fuck you, and humanity wants to step back up and explore the majesty of the universe that they have just been reminded of their place in. Almost immediately, we ruin everything. Humans ruin space. We meet the Daleks, we start a war with Mars, and let Earth rot back home as the climate continues to worsen, the United States fall and Britain without hesitation puts its colonizer hat back on, and we become the dictatorship of New Britain. Presumably around the same time, Scotland splits off and get their own ship. And now, the best bit. By the 45th century, by two different accounts, the Earth was just gone. J it just disappeared. It's okay though, it came back. By the 42nd century, not only have we rediscovered the marvels of actual slavery, but casual space travel is now common. It's going to take another 20 odd centuries for the everyday person to experience space travel. That sounds healthy. Doctor Who views humanity going to the stars as a beautiful thing. I'm inclined to disagree. As every single story set in the future, bar a couple exceptions, is about the long, bloodthirsty, awful legacy we leave in our wake. We should have just stayed home. A species that cannot conduct themselves without the constant supervision of a kind alien clown man uh, should not be given the keys to outer space. You know, airports. Yeah, if we ever go to space, everything's just gonna be like living in an airport. Bring on the future. Now you've seen the future, now about we go to the past Rose Tyler. Here, have a chalky milk. The origins of one Mr. Stein, first name Franken. Mary Shelley is the mother of science fiction, the progenitor. Situating her in a story to meet Doctor Who is an idea so natural that it's been done a couple times. But that exact fated night, the one where she was influenced to write Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, it's a busy night. Not only do you have 13 and the fam gate crashing in a morally dubious, very overrated episode, I fucking hate it, can we stop talking about it? But as many of you know, that same night, another doctor crashes through that door, the eighth. With, get this, no recollection of his memories. Pull the other one. The company of friends then makes the eighth doctor out to be the influencer crazed madman. I don't see the correlation myself, but that's okay, because Mary Shelley then joins as a companion. Only for a very limited run, but enough to see the full extent of Doctor Who Gothica. The Silver Turk introduces her to a Cyberman. Brought to life by lightning. And trust me, I've tried to make it work. These two stories simply don't coexist. In the Villa di Adari, she stands there so mawkishly like, Ooh. It's such a disservice. Which means that the second this story ends, Paul McGann must barrel through the doors, right? Everyone's feeling remarkably calm about that last traumatic 50 minutes they went through. But then, there's a the third story. There's actually, get this, three different influences for the story of Frankenstein. From the 10th Doctor comic, The Creative Spark, Mary ran into an alien creature wrapped in bandages, shooting bolts of lightning, called Zazik. Hello, Mary. You remember when we battled the Bone Lord? The idea that Mary in one night met 8, 10, and 13 is ridiculous. Did they come in one after another? And can lightning monsters please leave beloved author Mary Shelley alone? By the time we get round to series 12, Mary Shelley and the gang are just used to it, I guess. 
Don't you love the trend of classic writers not having one ounce of originality in their body? That's an old Doctor Who tradition. Mary Shelley, for the record, is an excellent companion. This was a young woman who was historically documented to tell spooky stories in churches and fucking graveyards. So, she's my queen. My, my, my goth sci-fi mummy. Ugh, oh, that sucked. Fact number three. A shielder killed her kids. Look, I love you, right? I sat down to read the Legends of a Shielder book just completely as a charitable act. And I actually got really invested in the plight and story of a shielder, me. This isn't a character I ever expected to fall in love with, um, even though I do enjoy her episodes in series 9. She's a walking metaphor. Every single line of dialogue they share in this story is just setting up Hellbent. She is the foreshadowing queen, so what would her story even look like if you removed Clara and Twelve? It turns out really interesting, as this book has her sailing with pirates, going on adventures with Sinbad, and deciding which one of her children should live in the Black Death. Hey Doctor, do you think you could have just left like a checklist of like, key events to watch out for? Hey, in fact, scrub that, just drop me somewhere. It's really the least you could do. And as a result, the Doctor custom made a sociopath. There really was no other path for a shoulder. it's really sad. And it's in these stories you get that sense of perspective. Immortality is impossible without losing your humanity. And that's exactly what a shoulder loses in this last story by Jenny T. Corgan. In The Girl Who Died, the Doctor actually makes two Maya immortality things. One for her, and one for whoever she decides to spend her life with. An interesting gift slash curse that she considers giving to many people in these stories. So when all three of me's children catch the plague... GG! It's a real Sophie's choice, where you decide which one of my children will I let live. There's no right answer. How are you going to make this one funny, Sam? But the first two are beyond saving. And her baby, Little Rue? Oh my god. It's harrowing. A tough read. Will it be my brave, my brilliant Essie? My sweet, my loving Johan? Or my laughing baby, whom I do not even know? And then I think, it cannot be the baby. He would be a baby forever. And I look at my girl, my boy, and my heart, which has been kicked from pallets to ditch, from shore to shore, is stabbed anew. And I am looking at my girl, my boy. My girl, and my boy. I tear my eyes away from my beautiful son who is gazing at me. I cannot look at him. I take one more step towards S, my skin crawling with horror at what I am about to do. Then suddenly Essie groans in deep pain, and I freeze and I shudder. I do not know how this alien magic I carry works, nor what it is supposed to do. What if... What if it freezes her? Not just as a child, but as a sick child. What if it keeps her in this foul state forever? Could one imagine a worse torture? My hand flies to my mouth in horror. I was in good health when he did what he did to me. If I only could truly curse the man who did this to me, if I could pull his blood out across the stars, slowly, drop by drop, whilst he screamed to the heavens apart, then I would. In a sudden stroke, she walked out the door. A shoulder? is just off screen in the visitation, kissing her children goodbye. Oh wait, she doesn't. She just runs out on them. But guess what? All of this could have been averted. Because get this, the doctor was nearby. There's a deleted scene in series nine where the doctor's revealed to be wearing the mask of the plague doctor. Turns out the plague doctors on earth were an alien species of scientists using humanity as patient zero. Kind of hinting that they did the Black Death. It's a good thing that scene was deleted, because if there's actual alien intervention going on, the Doctor has no excuse not to save her dying forever children. It's just cruel. Shilda is so desperate to get off Earth that her best game plan is to offer up her children as test subjects so that they take them away and her into space on their ship. Hey Doctor, do you think you could have at least stopped these guys? It's a solid read. Colour me surprised, as she would have decided that on principle, she could not subject anybody to her life. 
just an eternal plague baby forever and ever. And so Ashilda's kids died covered in black spots all alone. Thanks for joining me on this upbeat episode of Broke Cannon. You're fucking welcome. Please do not throw hands at me. Good evening. Welcome back to Broke Cannon. Happy Pride Month. While you're going about your business today, please just spare a thought for the various gays of the universe. Bill Potts. Clara Oswald. Yanto Jones. Ah, uh, not you. Sil. And Dalek Thay. I think this guitar is working fine. It's never let me down before. And so to celebrate, let's get a fitting fact. Matrix. Bill Potts and Heather, the sentient puddle, lived a happy, long life together. Without bodies, but also sometimes with bodies. You know, for such a friendly, accessible episode, the pilot befuddles my brain. I could not tell you what the actual plot is, because I don't think they really satisfyingly explain what Heather is. Bill just has an alien stalker for 45 minutes. I've heard about wanting people's dirty bath water, but she wants to become the dirty bath water. It might be an understatement to say that Bill Potts didn't get the happiest of goes round, but through the power of lesbians, <clears throat> but through the power of love, Heather managed to take her away from a corporeal body and they floated around all time and space together as a big cosmic puddle. See, that's what Pride Month's about. And this fact isn't particularly shocking, interesting, or even that funny. It's just there to remind you that Bill Potts had a lovely long life. And everything since Twice Upon a Time has just sort of hit that point home. Everybody just collectively wants the best for this companion. Right after the Doctor fell, the two went on a cosmic road trip, as Bill took Heather to all the places that she and the Doctor never got to go to. Like Barcelona, or a good monk story. Paul Connell made a couple additions to his novel of Twice Upon a Time. It stands to reason that the testimony avatar of her would contain all of her thoughts, even up to her final moments. And we know what they are now. The last thing she remembered was Heather standing over her. Heather kissed Bill and cried as Bill died of old age, and Bill encouraged Heather to go back out and continue travelling the universe. Another eternal out amongst the stars, where she presumably ran into Clara and Ashilda going on their own bisexual adventures. So that's, um, lovely. This time last year, we got to catch up with Bill, played by Paul Mackey. Hey, Nardi. As you know, me and Heather are on a break, and I'm back at St Luke's. It's a good, positive move, actually. It's not been easy. I mean, you always think you're dating a goddess at the start of a relationship, right? But if they keep on being a goddess, it gets really annoying. Woman got shot in the chest, turned into a Cyberman, died in battle, became non-corporeal, and then just returned to Earth to finish her studies. Yeah, well, yeah, picked the right year for it, Bill Potts. All the time and space, and she chose COVID-19 England. It's a bit tricky down here at the moment, but keeping it positive. She then goes on to tell Nardo about Black Lives Matter. Not to bring the mood down or anything. Sadly, the mini episode does not show us Nardo's reaction. I want to know his take. I want to know what he makes of this. Oh, wait, shit, maybe I don't. It's said that during this time, the two were on a break from each other. Which almost sounds sad, but Heather is uh, omniscient, so she predicted the pair would be back together in four months, two weeks, and three days. Uh, how does that relationship work? Are they both omniscient? That sounds like the worst relationship ever. Bill just decides at some point she wants to be a human again. Kind of lucky that she can do that. The two of them purchased a home, owned many cats, and grew old together. Yeah, there's no punchline. I just thought it was really neat and nice. Sometimes you need that. Right? Stop being so cynical. Fact number two. Alright, alright. You know me. You know I'm all about equality. I must have a heterosexual fact around us somewhere. Bingo! Classic series writer Chris Boucher keeps trying to make the British sci-fi series Blake 7 canon. It seems to be the goal of his career. Fun fact, I have not watched Blake 7, I am a 24 year old man, and if you thought I was going to watch 4 seasons and 52 episodes for this one fact, you have overestimated me today. 
This is a rabbit hole that goes strangely deep. Not just once this happened, it's an ongoing project, stemming back all the way to the Robots of Death. As far as space operas go, Blake 7 is not the most far removed from Doctor Who. Not only are there shared sets, props, actors, and the BBC's wardrobe department, but it was also devised by creator of the Daleks, Terry Nation. Way back in the day, Tom Baker and Terry Nation wanted to do a crossover, with the finale of the second season seeing Blake's crew battling a squad of Daleks. Why not? Why not? Because the BBC have no sense of humour, apparently. Decades later, Chris Boucher would put a fix to this. We can muster a better Blake 7 crossover than Time Lash, surely. And so, in the BBC Books range, Boucher decided to return to his Robots of Death scripts and published one of the best received Doctor Who books around. Walking around on the same base as the Fourth Doctor and Leela is Carnell, a character who originated in that TV show. It's the 2000s, literally nobody is going to care. Sorry Nation, your intellectual properties have become a subsidiary of Doctor Who. So a Blake 7 character has met the Doctor. Not as a funny aside, like a face-to-face -face meeting. That's as concrete as it gets. No, I will not be taking questions about the Next Generation comic at this time. I think it's pretty neat. Maybe you don't have a sense of humour. But then it goes one step further as we step into the real niche where characters from this specific novel, this sequel story, get their own spin-off. Caldor City uses the characters, situations and settings that appear in Chris Boucher's Doctor Who novel Corpse Marker to tell a complex tale of sex, money and death. I knew Robots of Death was kind of glam rock, but I had no idea. On Pride Month? I dived in very briefly into this series, but I felt more alienated than I have in my life. It's a rough around the edges sci-fi space opera, but beyond that, it's pretty much impregnable. Jesus, Iris Wild Time, Faction Paradox, and how Caldor City does the reading list ever end. Caldor City has many faces that we've seen in Doctor Who properties before, from Iago, who, you know, Paul Darrow, he's the main character, that's Rog. And Ulvanov who's this fella from Robots of Death. If you've ever been watching Robots of Death and stopped to think, what's this guy's deal? What's he really like in his off hours, his domestic home life? Then boom, this is the series for you, I guess. Boucher in general seems to be a very incestuous and self-referential author. Uh, Caldor City has references to Fendal, for God's sake. This man was crafting a fictional universe out of his three stories he got onto television. And honestly, I think he should be admired for it. If I ever became a big hotshot official Doctor Who writer, I would put references to Sooty and Friends in every goddamn story. Hi guys, quick tangent, interrupting my own video just to let you know, perhaps the best broke canon fact so far, Sooty the Bear. He's canon. A good, close, personal friend of one Iris Wildsome. Sooty and all of his friends live in the Hooniverse. He had his voice stolen on the planet Metabilis 4. It's a good life. It's a good life. It's a good place to be. And now, an extract from a short video I made on my old Doctor Who channel in 2008. Back to the video! Look at all of the mileage you can get from one culturally iconic and beloved story from the 70s. Big Finish not only have the rights to make Blake 7 stories, but also have their own Robots of Death spin-off series. Because of course they do! This is what happens when we give the slightest bit of praise to an old Doctor Who episode. Someone will make a universe around it, and then all of a sudden, seven seasons later, they're meeting the Paternoster gang. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, Bernice Summerfield knows of a terrorist cell called Blake Seven, <laughs> which I, could be them. Caldor City does frequently hint that Paul Darrow's characters were the same guy. Also, sorry, I'm just reading now. 
There was a Robots of Death stage play? Oh my god, there was a Robots of Death stage play! What on earth? Paul Darrow's character, Iago, who we were just talking about, he replaces the fourth Doctor in the story. And the robots were performed by mimes. <laughs> oh my god, there's two of them. Ugh, oh, the world just never ends, does it? Bring me the third. The Doctor has a dumping ground. And no, I don't mean the power state. Oh! Newsflash, science fiction fantasy rules don't always make sense. Uh, for example, can you travel faster than the speed of light in the future? For to Doomsday Doctor says no, that's impossible, and that's what the entire plot revolves around. Frogman's plan fails because that's just a scientific impossibility. But then that's exactly what they do in Sharda, and the third Doctor conducts his own experiments into this, believing that he can recreate that using only 1970s Earth technology. Einstein's special theory of relativity said, said that you cannot travel in space faster than the speed of light because the speed of light is a limiting factor. If you travelled more than 180,000 miles per second, you'd encounter the time distortion effect. In the Time War, I remember the Daleks had like a thousand worlds and they wanted to throw them all at Gallifrey and apparently that was 50 times the speed of light. So, the rules are bullshit and science fiction rules even more so. How dare you science fiction fantasy authors for not pioneering a new era of science, laying out the law of rel relativity. I think it comes down to how much of a scientific stickler the writer is. Bidmead would be having none of it. The Doctor has complete freedom of movement on the map. He can go anywhere. But what Einstein realized is that we can't have freedom of movement, otherwise we'd run into trouble. Now let's talk about prehistory. Hands up class, how many of you can name a story or a time that the Doctor has gone into prehistory? References something or meet something that existed before the dawn of time. Because just a reminder, the Time Lords did invent time. You can thank the VNAs for that one. We just had an event about it like a few months back. But this also, according to several stories, is impossible to do in verse. Hey, here's a fun game. Go on the TARDIS wiki and type in event one, as in the first event, what started all life in the universe. Just check out every single story that has something to say about it. You've got the Eternals and the Beast and the Solar Tract. They all existed before time did. Thus, the Time Lords existed before time did. A bunch of different things did. Ragnos, Immortals, Vampires. It's a card that the Doctor Who series likes to play. Things definitely did exist before our universe. The Doctor learnt about it in the Matrix once when he became president. Stars were the shapes of green donuts. So this is interesting, but where's the contradiction? Which scientific rules is this breaking? Well, the Doctor was fine in the dark times, walking around having adventures like normal, but some stories specifically underline the fact that without time, nobody can move. We know this because there are times where the Doctor not once, not twice, three times on the record took an enemy and dumped them into prehistory, defeating them by stripping away time. Doctor Who is OP. The second Doctor tricked the Vist to travelling back before the Time Lords evolved so they could claim ownership of time. This led them to right before the Big Bang, and with no time for them to move across, they got stuck. The 11th Doctor did a similar trick with the Kin, just kicking him out and dumping him in the void before creation where he could do no harm to the universe. Where are all these books coming from? What? I have a lot of Doctor Who books. Where are they coming from? My question. Why doesn't he try this with everyone? Maybe he does. Maybe those are the adventures we don't see. Hey, question. How does the time machine get out of pre-time if there is no time? I'm way too deep in. I'm gonna go have a lie down, I think, actually. Just go forward in your beliefs and prove to me that I am not mistaken in mine. Welcome back to the Matrix, where things are gonna be just a little bit stripped back today. For I'm sorry to announce, the Matrix has been deleted. 
eons of knowledge lost to the sands of time. And by knowledge, I specifically mean gigabytes. And by lost, I mean deleted when I absolutely fucking wrecked my hard drive. So yeah, I had to take the, the Matrix into the shop. Let's give a noble, low-res salute to the broke cannons that never were. Lost to the digital never. Personally, I blame the Time Lords. So please take this very patient journey with me as I start from scratch, essentially, and give you my first fun fact from the world of Doctor Who. Matrix! Ah, oh, shit, right. Uh, beep, 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 Cool. Let's talk about the moon. But Sam, we spoke about the moon last time. Yeah, maybe, but one of these days I'm going to sit you down and talk about Kill the Moon, and you're going to like it. For reference, go to your window right now. Look up at the sky. That right there is probably the moon. I don't know, there's like a 50-50 chance. In Doctor Who, that moon right there, sometimes referred to as Luna, is a real point of contention. Beautifully, non-ironically, an orbiting dragon egg. Since then, it's been visited by interested parties from Draconians to Cybermen, Jadoon to Silence. The Ice Warriors also think it's theirs. It's also where Iris Wildtime lives. But the baby dragon egg was originally part of a double planet formed with the planet Mercury. Does that make sense? No, not really. And we have seen the moon being formed before in the Doctor Who series. Doctor Who can't even decide who the first person on the moon was. In Imperial Moon, it's the British Empire who unsurprisingly won the space race before it even began in America and Russia. In 1878, three ships are launched from Scotland and all made it to the moon within the day. Within the day. That means they'd have to be traveling three times faster than Neil Armstrong. The first man on the moon instead was Professor Boyes Denison. I think this is what he looks like. And then I'm told there's a comic story called Moon Landing, which just makes the whole thing worse. Now claiming that the first moon landing was in 1970. Have you really thought about what it would take to fake a moon landing? To be fair, they hadn't landed on the moon yet, and they recognised the TARDIS as a police box, which probably means they were British as well. Because of course they were. Hey Americans, Americans this is how we feel watching every single movie and TV show you put out. Strangely, the Doctor makes no mention of Courtney Woods to, to John and Gillian. <laughs> Thank you to Ben Hollings for that fact. and. Rule Britannia, I guess. Another account says the moon came from somewhere far out, way past our solar system, housing the genesis of Cathacatlos. <sighs> Fuck you. As a floating ball to terraform other worlds. Was it the remains of the planet Theia when it collided with Earth? From the story Moon Blink. Man, I don't know. I'm just a guy with a pen and paper. But then there's an audio called Energy of the Daleks. You may have even heard it, it's free on Spotify right now. Apparently I had, and have no recollection of listening to it, so it must be a good one. Energy of the Daleks is set in the year 2021, in which the Daleks take advantage of the energy crisis on planet Earth. But never fear, the multi-billionaires are here, as one CEO, Damien Stevens, formed the Globesphere Corporation, covered the moon egg and solar panels, which the Daleks just loved. Big fans of solar energy. But then you may recall, if you have encyclopedic knowledge, there's another story that takes place in the year 2021 in The Harvest. Yeah, um, Hex is a nurse from 2021 England. If you didn't already have enough reason to love this guy. In this story, an American corporation was stationed in outer space, with the doctor saying that China pretty much ran the moon. And the US Corps have their W stations, and the Chinese pretty much run the moon. But Europe's fast overtaking the other superpowers in almost every other respect. Um, I don't have the heart to tell him. In the Hooniverse history, uh, 2021 also had Europe as a major superpower, and were primed and ready to colonize the solar system. Firmly, no comment. But oh, get this, the United Kingdom lacked a space program. 
Did Big Finish just predict Brexit? But it's okay! England used Cybermen. So the moon's pretty busy, and I guess those 20 years caught up quick since those stories were released. What we did have in 2021 was a Dalek revolution. And definitely not a deadly pandemic. Except, hang on, no, 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 there was a pandemic. Maybe it's not in revolution, but the Doctor Who world did go through COVID-19. So that's kind of fucked. Doctor, it's 2020. It's a fantastic year for memes, but it's a terrible year for humanity. Fact number two. Heading over today to Jacqueline Rayner's Citation Needed, a short story from the Target storybook. This is the story of the Encyclopedia Gallifreya and its journey into sentience. The book is the story's narrator, told entirely from its point of view. I guess it's more of an activity log. And Clara knocked it over in series seven. Nice. That bottle right there is the Doctor's oldest ally. Every Time Lord is given a copy of the Encyclopedia Gallifreya when they graduate from the Academy, it's what actually links their brains into the Matrix when they die. The Doctor's Encyclopedia got a bit confused by the Time War, and the fact that many Time Lords were unexisting and brought back again, and unexisted all over again. Turning the book into a real boy. People who were mere names in my database are so much more than the data records. Vicky, Harry, Adric, Grace, Donna, they lived and breathed and felt and loved and died and hoped and trusted and wept and laughed. How could I blandly log Sarah Jane Smith as Earth female journalist without saying how incredible she was, how brave, how beautiful, how funny, how loyal, how indomitable? I did my job. I will continue to do my job, but I will appreciate every moment that I'm privileged to witness the catalogue. I will cherish every person, every creature, every planet and every bow tie that falls within my purview. The book is madly in love with him. And it knows a lot more than it lets on. If the Doctor had simply consulted the book on, like, any of his adventures, he would have saved himself a lot of grief. The current data on this Time Lord I'm downloading right now is gonna come as a big surprise for the Doctor. Shame the Doctor hardly ever consults me. The oldest companion is also the first Doctor Who fan, as it sits on the sideline, on the bookshelf, cataloguing all of his adventures and feelings. The book is also a major player behind the scenes of Ranskorav Kolos. You'll be able to see what's happening, you'll see me, and you'll come up with a plan that will defeat Zim Shaw without my sacrifice. Just off camera, just off screen, it makes the ultimate sacrifice in the finale of that story. I like being awake, I like being alive. Even the pain now as the axe search through me reminds me that I live. I want to stay living. But then, mistaking the book for a fizzy drink, the fam murder the Doctor's oldest friend. Graham grabs what he thinks is a bottle of Tizer, and its final words, <laughs> as it is slowly ingested by Graham O'Brien, are Time Lord Stenza, cheese, help owl, pussycat quiche chameleon sandwich, Doctor safe hiccup, Doctor safe love, love acceptance, goodbye, peace. And there goes the bravest soul to ever travel in the TARDIS. Graham O'Brien was the true antagonist of series 11. Here's a fun one about the Scabby Master. <laughs> I love this guy. I also do not know very much about this guy. In fact, I only found out recently that these two barbecued boys are very different characters. And the Jeffrey Beavers Master, this one, and Big Finish, is the incarnation after the TV movie. What? What? Make it make sense. I know that there's no reason we have to meet the Master in the right chronological order, but we see Beavers going to Ainley. Is Ainley a late career Master? Timelines! I, oh, I despise them. They add nothing to my enjoyment of the series. <laughs> Number these guys, I dare you. My favourite Doctors are 2, 10 and 12, and my favourite Masters are 13, 25 and 58B. Try not to think about Keeper of Truck and try not to think about Logopolis, and take a journey with me into the story Mastermind from the Big Finish Companion Chronicles. It has me scratching my head. Linking up the apparent gap there was between the TV movie and the Jeffrey Beaver's Master, of which I didn't know there was one. Are there two Jeffrey Beaver's Masters? That would make more sense. <laughs> and I'm not even gonna mention the other Masters that follow Eric Roberts, because there's a ton. This audio story 
is about the master locked up in a vault. Mmm. Explaining his adventures throughout the 20th century like he's a scabby Forrest Gump. The Beaver's master is interrogated by two unit soldiers. No, these are not the characters from the TV movie for legal reasons, but it's a weird little tale. Going into great detail how he survived the Eye of Harmony, how he survived the Daleks, but also a couple other very strange details. Remember previously when I made a big deal out of the master having a daughter? Like that was a game changer for us, wasn't it? It felt like it at the time. Well, we're in season two now, and I'd like to tell you that the scabby master, the beaver's incarnation, played mafia, hung out in the late 20th century in Italy, and fathered many children. Yeah, you heard me right. Look on the mask of my boy. I am, as you see, the master, and you will obey me. Wouldn't you love to hear a story totally focused on that? A box set, even. But before you know it, he's on to the next anecdote about the Titanic and death worm morphants. Like, no, 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 go back, go back. Show me the master be a mobster. I would like to meet this master's familia. I have to assume he wasn't the charred up master that we know from Lair of the White Worm, Light at the End, surely, right? Don't get me wrong, I want to see the story regardless, but it's a strange new element to know that the master mingles, gets down, procreates. Weirder still, this isn't even the only time it happens. The Beaver's master also gets a new love interest in the box set Masterful, the absolute heartbreaker. And uh, yeah, her heart actually is broken when the Eric Roberts master pulls a prank on his future self and gets him to reveal his true appearance to her, uh, making her burst into tears and scream for her life. <laughs> oh, you hate to see it. My man's just trying to get some. And he can't even trust himself to be his own wingman. Imagine pulling a prank on your future self it is truly the definition of a self-own. Oh wait, no, that's the plot of Masterful. So how did the master become a crinkled up cum sock to begin with? Again, there are lots of different answers to this question. I think the main one that fandom embraces these days is in uh, The Two Masters. Haven't listened to these. Somebody spoilt for me that the master sets himself on fire. So now you get to know that too. Excuse me whilst I go and listen to that trilogy of stories and then laugh my ass off at how they explain that. Welcome back to The Matrix. Last time I made a massive ass of myself on the internet. Well, you know, more than usual anyway, as I went on that weird tangent about the monster's timeline with absolute egg on my face. If I just expanded, the real nutty thing is that all of these masters are the same man, with the same personality, the same inclination. It's quite hard to believe that the beaver's master, with all of his class and elegance, is also able to dress for the occasion. In fairness, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. The master's timeline is a wormhole of its own, one that I'm going to pass over to Jacob the Grey. Cool. So I have a whole video for this? You've got a minute and a half. Okay, so let's do the 13th Master from the beginning. The 12th Master, as played by Roger Delgado, regenerates after a battle with the 12th Doctor, appropriately enough, in Doorway to Hell. This leaves us with an entirely non-crispy 13th Master who presumably looks like this. Sometime after his regeneration, he ends up on Tercerus and gets crispin. Whether that be by the events of the Two Masters or Legacy of the Daleks is anybody's guess, but it's definitely the Two Masters. The 13th Master, as played by Jeffrey Beavers, tries and fails to regenerate, producing this pseudo-body as played by Peter Pratt. According to the events of Trail of the White Worm, the decayed Master's use of the Eye of Harmony at the end of the Deadly Assassin heals him up enough to look like Jeffrey Beavers again. Then we get to the events of Keeper of Trocken, and the 13th Master possesses the body of Tremus of Trocken, attaining a new body at last. 
Then he goes through his televised run with brief pit stops in the Expanded Universe until the events of Survival. See, the Expanded Universe had a few different ideas on how the Master gets from the events of Survival to the television movie. According to the Eight Doctors, the Tremis Master finds a snake, swallows a snake, and then gets executed by the Daleks. According to the Virgin New Adventures, the Tremis Master gets his body all fixed up by the Tsun, regenerates after a shot in the chest, and ends up looking a bit like Basil Rathbone. This incarnation would, according to the novel of the film, be executed by the Daleks at the beginning of the television movie. Now, according to Big Finish, the Tremis Master's body gets torn apart by the Warp Core shortly before the events of Dust Breeding, returning into the decayed body that lay beneath the Trachonite's surface. Then he ends up as a pawn in the game between the Seventh Doctor and Death herself in Master. You know, casual stuff. Some point after this, according to Mastermind, the Master swallows the Deathworm Morphant and is eventually captured by the Daleks at the Valley of Kings, and is placed on trial by the Daleks, as seen at the beginning of the television movie. So one of these three Masters is the one that gets executed and looks like his handsome Canadian actor. After the Bruce Master is sucked into the Eye of Harmony, he reconstitutes himself in the Time Vortex. With the Time Vortex breaking down his body, he ends up escaping for the final time in The Forgotten, where he possesses a series of human beings, all of whom would eventually revert back into the decaying visage of the 13th Master. Before meeting his final, final end during the events of Planet of Dust, and then he is resurrected as the Bald Master in The Day of the Master. Does that make sense? Woo! <laughs> ah, the master of the master there, everybody. Maybe he could just take over my show from now on. The Crispy Master has a radio show. So let's jump over to the sensual, dulcet tones of I Am The Master in which the Jeffrey Beaver's master whispers in your ear for 45 minutes. Because every now and then, for some reason, the master cloaks his TARDIS as a recording booth. He has a sound studio. Okay, fine, go with it. Everyone's got their hobbies. God knows he's got the face for radio. By transmitting the broadcast, he radicalizes and recruits new mind slaves, of which you are the latest to hear. <laughs> it's quite funny because as an evil villain plan goes, it mostly consists of charming banter. He's actually quite pleasant to sit down and have a conversation with, which maybe makes him the most sinister master of all. It's when he starts making fourth wall breaking references to um, like well-stocked big finish lunches that I start to draw the line. We love stories. And you are listening to a Big Finish production. What does that mean for us? Is every Big Finish drama recorded from the Master's TARDIS? And more importantly, what does this guy's mic setup look like? I gotta know. For the Master, despite all of his charming storytelling and discussion, has only one goal in mind, like all men do. Whispering in your ear and slyly inserting an earworm. No. Seriously, a, a worm that actually crawls in your ear as a listener. Burnt skeletal men only want one thing and it's disgusting. He revels in telling you stories. The time he became a dictator president of the Galaxian Empire. The time he almost wiped out every single Doctor adventure. You see, sometimes the Burnt Master isn't a complete wet blanket. His plans range from standing around as a statue for decades to wiping out every Doctor Who story. Missing episodes in the archives? Hmm, blame this fella. And you can only assume that this master podcast plan is actually very successful, because you, the listener, become a part of events. It stops being a sit-down Q&A, the master's memoirs, when the Doctor appears. And you, brainwashed little mind slave that you are now, become his human shield. The master kills you to distract the Doctor as he makes his little getaway, giggling and conniving as he does. So that's a sad one. I don't like being dead in the Doctor Who universe. That makes me sad, actually. And also contradicts those other times I intervened with the Doctor Who universe. Now, that's a funny story. A little bit of a fourth wall break. It becomes a pattern when it happens twice. Did you know that the Jacoby Master, the most evil, warlike of them all, did voiceover work for the children's TV show In the Night Garden. <laughs> what the fuck? Eagle Piggle Eagle Onk, we are going to catch. So Derek Jacobi also is the narrator of that TV show, but I guess somebody, one Who writer, <clears throat> not naming any names, decided that in the Hooniverse, the master did this. Not Sir Derek Jacobi, the war master. 
things die. It's just what they do. Every minute of every day, on every world, every galaxy, something dies. Crying over it is spitting into the wind. Death is natural, yes. And now I've got more questions. Like, what even was his plan here? Maybe he just finds it funny. And we know he's got an interest in children's TV. Maybe they should have got Delgado to voice the clangers. And we all know which Teletubby Saxon is in leagues with. So yeah, you think of a master and you think of an evil renegade outlaw. But no, he's actually got a pretty significant and impressive CV. Great voiceover work. It's on IMDb and everything. But soft what light through yonder window breaks, my only love sprung from my only hate. The pawns saved Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, let's talk Shakespeare again. You saw him in the thumbnail. I was never a bard kid in school. Uh, we only studied the boring ones. The good Shakespeare is the off-the-wall crazy stuff. The Tempest. Midsummer Night's Dream is just an orgy rom-com with imp demons. It's great. But no, we always had to return to Romeo and Juliet. So in their Corona we lay our scene, the 11th Doctor rushes in to knock out the poison from Romeo's hand. Hey, as we know, history can be changed as long as the story remains the same. That is a quote, of course, from the Doctor Who story where the Doctor killed Shakespeare. Not gonna mention that, huh? Oh, I learned something new the other day. Uh, Romeo and Juliet might have been real people. That is to say that Shakespeare adapted a poem written in 1562 by one Arthur Brooke. It was claimed that the lovers, their adolescent romance, and their unfortunately timed double suicide was a true event which took place in the year 1303. Shakespeare was pressured to prepare a second version of the play, and Shakespeare decided not to go with the historic happy ending. That happy ending being the 11th Doctor, Amy and Rory staging the entire event so that nobody got killed. The deceased Romeo was cloned in a Sontaran cloning vat, and Juliet was replaced by a Tesselector. But Sam, what about the other deaths in Romeo and Juliet? Well, the Paris killed by Romeo was also a nesting duplicate, and I can only assume Mercutio was a Slitheen or something. Crisis averted, nobody died, the Doctor's been using this get out of jail free card with the Tesselector a, a whole bunch. I guess they owed him two favours. Absolutely silly and bizarre, but most of all unlikely. What skin in the game did the Doctor have? And why couldn't he do this for every tragic, historically recorded event? I don't know. I also don't care. What I do care about is the City of the Saved. Oh god, are we going there? Yeah, fuck it, let's go there. The City of the Saved is another Doctor Who spin-off, first mentioned in One Faction Paradox. The City of the Saved is a afterlife, where every single human being that ever existed goes after death in a new immortal body. An afterlife located within a TARDIS, the interior of Compassion, who we spoke about before, a TARDIS human hybrid companion. Yeah, EDA shit. Of course it's the highest of high concepts. Well, in the city where every single artist, celebrity, and every historical figure resides, he's hanging out, chilling with the best of them. But also in the city is Bardcorp. Bardcorp insisted that the original play, Romeo and Juliet, should have a wedding scene in it. And lo and behold, the sick fact suddenly had a wedding scene in it. One of the most popular, beloved plays in human history. <laughs> Retconned. Hey, uh, let's put on a sex scene as well. And a big sky laser for the end battle. Matrix, final fact, please. There are a lot of silence around the place, and they were established on Earth, obviously, much earlier than 1969. For instance, we know that Torchwood were investigating them. I snapped a quick picture of this inside Time Fracture. When we were in the Torchwood hub, they were investigating silence in the 1890s. Also in there was apparently Da Vinci, who was wearing a silence eye patch. I don't know what the story is there. I'd love to have met him. But in the gap between the impossible astronaut and Day of the Moon, River Song and the Ponds explored America, splitting up and looking for clues. 
It's a road trip. A road trip where you purposely pretend to become renegades hunted by the FBI. So they could all investigate the silence whilst they could still remember across all of American history over many states. There's a big time gap between these. Eleven claimed that he put the gang through this trauma to give the silence a full sense of security. Great plan, until one of Canton's goons or, I don't know, literally anybody else takes him out instead. Good thing for us, the gang were all keeping diaries. Rory went to Texas, Cali and Oklahoma, where he noted that there was massive talk about UFO abductions, hypothesizing maybe that was a product of America's subconscious memory of the enemy. Good, good, I like it. Then he goes on to say that the silence stole the scream because somebody drew a picture of a silence, so they need to suppress that information frequently. Amy traveled from Idaho to Washington to North and South Dakota, finding out that real world alien encounters from the 40s have their fingerprints all over them. A baby silent was photographed in 1943 in military custody. Mm. Amy links this to the Native American belief that cameras were evil, an idea maybe started by the silence. And River was in South Carolina. She theorized that they started the American Civil War as a means of population control. <sighs> Don't know how to feel about that one, River. There's a lot to think about there. Did the silence uh, abolish slavery? That might be the single most offensive thing ever put to the Doctor Who canon. Um, is this why the wiki says that it's non-narrative, non-canon? I don't like that word. River then travelled to Pennsylvania, Kentucky and New Hampshire. And uh, the best part of all of this? None of this investigation helped. <laughs> Not one bit of it. What a colossal waste of time to give the audience a shocking cold open. Ah, you really pulled the rug under me there, Moffat. Joke's on you guys. You didn't see a single silent across your whole road trip. Or did you? Also, what's this mark? Villain! Hello ladies, gentlemen, and variations thereupon, and welcome back to The Matrix. Last month, I held a Broke Cannon competition, and I got an influx of so many good facts that it would be a crime not to share them. Did you know? Oh my god, did someone just shoot a gun? Nobody move. Hands in the air. Look, Ben, Ben, the floor is yours, man. Just, just put the gun down. I came first place in that competition. I'm still waiting for my prize. I'm doing them. I'm doing them, Ben. I'm going to shoot you with my gun. <laughs> I don't want to fucking die. No. Worse. You want to hear some Doctor Who trivia? Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and variations thereupon. I bring the gravest of news. The Matrix has brought me here to tell you about one of the worst things the Doctor has ever done. We're here to talk about Sixie, a Doctor who's clearly no stranger to violence, but he's moved on from Perry and Shockeye and has now come after another beloved children's character. Meet Roland Rat. Just ordered two portions of sweet and sour prawn balls! <laughs> Talking puppet, saviour of TVAM, whatever that is, and a main enemy, according to the wiki. I mean, the Matrix. I'm a living legend! Yeah! In a story beautifully referred to as untitled 1986 TV story, just. Mwah. The Sixth Doctor dared a visit to the Rat Cave Villain! and was given the task, the ignoble task, of introducing an episode of Roland's show on BBC Three. But then, <sighs> Roland Rat dared test the fury of a Time Lord. Presumably because someone showed him Mark at the Rani. Six just can take it. He can let that slide. And now, Back to BBC One for Doctor Who, the series. Rubbish! <laughs> Without mercy or regret, he open fired with the ray gun he just happened to have on his person. I, who gave him that? Where are my books to explain this? Huh, Terence Dix? I have met with the strangest creatures in the universe, Daleks. Cybermen, 
even the dreaded Wogan from the planet Shepherd's Bush, BBC Three presents the slimiest of them all. Roland Rat, the series. Yeah! Still, it could have been worse. At least Roland didn't have to listen to any speeches about stratospheres or whatever. But I'm pleased to inform the fans of Roland Rat that the Doctor missed, as the twin dilemma had already established, that Six is a rotten shot. I'm sorry, Doctor, but even Time Lords have to wait sometimes. Here's Scragtag. Honestly, I'm surprised we don't talk about this more. This is easily one of the darkest stories this franchise has to offer. It goes Children of Earth, The Sky Man, Miracle Day, Untitled 1986 TV story, and then, um, Fixed with Sontarans? Colin? Colin, what are you doing? Colin, put the gun down! Thank you to Mr. Baker for ending that tangent. I'm glad that he was murdered. He wasn't wrong though. In fact, Ben might have been onto something when it actually turns out the sixth doctor had a real presence on British television. Yeah, thanks, I meant on other shows. Smart ass. He was a regular recurring guest. Not only is there a back catalogue of Blue Peter appearances, but the Doctor and Perry, in character, also appeared on Saturday Superstore. Some classic TV back from the 1980s. Taking some very sweet live phone calls from kids and fans. Until he gets a dreaded phone call from his biggest fan of all. No, not Ian Levine. I see we have somebody called The Master on the telephone. What? Next. Hello? Hello? I am the master, and you will obey me. You burned to death, I saw you. Well, he saw you. We saw you. I shall come from the depths of hell to haunt you, Doctor. You can't, you're dead. <laughs> I saw him die, I saw it. How can you be sure? I challenge you, Doctor, in your latest guise. You are the most arrogant of all. Let us decide our feud once and forever. Look at this sussy Barker starting beef on live air television. You wouldn't catch Davros phoning into a children's TV show. I like that the Amy Master is just like around, always heckling him. Just appearing randomly at will and shit talking the Doctor at any opportunity. Oh no, that was his actual role during the Sixth Doctor's tenure, wasn't it? Now I wasn't exactly around in the 1980s, by which I mean I emigrated, I'm actually 48 years old. But the Doctor appearing on British television, uh, using his actual name in character, is something we haven't seen in the Doctor Who canon since maybe... Late Troughton. Where he was a TV personality and celebrity hero of the Earth. Running in those circles in that time period might also explain this scene. Hey, broke canon fun facts. Jimmy Savile is much more frightening than the Sondarans. Much more. I will leave it at that. Colin Baker definitely knew about Savile. Actually, that's not really a fun fact at all. Fact number two. Dying is not an option. Last month I also binged all of Miracle Day, which I did not shut up about. But it did get me thinking. That's a big global event. I love it when Doctor Who does something massive because it's inevitable that other stories would be set within that frame of time. And Miracle Day, I looked it up, takes place over several months, the majority of 2011, starting in mid-March and finishing in late September, according to this story. Now, over in Doctor Who, the Doctor and the Ponds are mostly off-Earth in this time. Series 6 isn't really set in modern day at all. How about Series 5 of the Sarah Jane Adventures? These poor kids, in probably the most threatening season of the show, Hurt this child. If they screw up even one time, <laughs> they won't be fixed. They could be incinerated, chopped up, shot or poisoned, and they would end up like everybody else in the concentration camp down the road. Which for me only adds to the stakes of these episodes. Yeah, don't take it so lightly when a gun is held at a 15 year old kid. This was around the same time that Clyde Langer fell victim to the curse of Hito Comtek. A very scary and unsettling story where everybody Clyde Langer knows is trying to kill him. Sarah Jane Smith draws a weapon on him in this very comfy, safe show. So that's a gut punch. But everybody in this story, everybody in this series, everyone in this year knows that if they hurt or even try to kill Clyde, 
it's gonna be something much, much worse than death. I recently brought myself to finish those final few episodes of the Sarah Jane Adventures, and I'm so sad to report that James Turfus is the final villain of the show. Is there anything this man can't bomb? I expected high-class industrial spies, not mum's net. John Harrison was taken away into the stars and probably subjected to slavery for the rest of his life. Maybe leaving before the end of the blessing means his eternal suffering goes on forever, torturing himself to the end of time. Like in real life! I like to think that one's the case. I don't know. Definitely feels like something the Doctor should have intervened with. <laughs> what was he doing in the meantime? Well, he was on his farewell tour from the 18th to the 20th of April. But in Let's Kill Hitler, that's 2011. In The Impossible Astronaut, the Doctor arranges to meet them all in 2011, the 22nd of April. Amy and Rory experienced the events of Miracle Day. Presumably, so did Melody, who almost hit them with a car. Something their bodies would not come back from. Put that gun down, River, please. You t There's so much worse going on here than Hitler. The same goes for Craig Owens and Alfie. Which kind of works, because the Cybermen don't kill, they augment. But I don't know, that, that Cybermat got a little bit close for comfort. Also in this period of time, Chloe Webber's father was killed in a car accident. It's undated, so I have to presume this happened really early in the year, or maybe it was a late Christmas present. The only outright contradiction is Doris Lethbridge-Stewart, who died in a boating accident during the events of Miracle Day. So I guess the only people immune to the miracle were Captain Jack Harkness and Doris. That detail comes from the Book of the Shadows of Avalon, but even on TV, the Brigadier himself would die that same year, only a couple months later, on Friday the 16th of December. He hung on, narrowly escaping that death camp. Can you imagine? So the Brigadier's timeline, wife dies, He's on his deathbed, avoids concentration camp, the doctor doesn't show up, and then his body is desecrated and dug up as a Cyberman by the master. Rest in peace, Nicholas Courtney. Also, I hope you didn't cremate him. Maybe Miracle Day gave him a few more months on this earth. Grim, grim, grim. But also what comes to my attention whilst discussing Miracle Day is the web series, the accompanying animated, clearly well-preserved series Tortured Web of Lies. Released online to Apple devices, concurrently with Series 4, interactive online content akin to Attack of the Grask, complete with logic puzzles designed for babies. It turns out that the three families, the main villains of Miracle Day, have been keeping track of Jack and actually apprehended both him and Gwen, gave them all of the answers that they spent 10 episodes searching for? Months and months of investigation. <laughs> Web of Lies tells us that in 2007, they just told them all their plans there and then. Kidnapping Jack Harkness and taking him to Chernobyl just to test his immortality. Conveniently, their minds are then wiped with the retcon drug. If you were playing this as it was coming out, you would have gotten the answers to these mysteries before they were even aired. Really cool, in retrospect, but also way to undermine the very piece of media you're meant to be promoting and supporting. Follow Gwen and Jack in a thrilling ten-part installment story as they relearn exposition they were told four years ago. Cut to San Francisco 2011, the real story follows Holly and Miles Mockery, who after a failed assassination attempt, <laughs> that's unfortunate, bad day for it, find that their conspiracy theories aren't actually that ludicrous, because they have information which could have stopped Miracle Day from happening in the first place. There are conspiracy nutters doing Torchwood's job better than them. Torchwood, maybe, but not the FBI. The FBI, according to this short, already knew the entire time. They knew the key to the Miracle Day, they knew it was gonna happen, oh, and they did absolutely nothing about it. Phenomenal stuff. Hey, how did Gwen Cooper survive Chernobyl without a radiation suit? Honestly, I think there's bigger questions at this point. And fact number three. Davros's mum was the first Dalek. The Davros family tree. Oh, damn. First up, this fact was suggested by Men With Ven 28. Davros's mum was the first Dalek. Or 
she would have been, at least. The Eye Davros series has just about the strangest origins you could come up with for this guy. The second story in the spin-off, Purity, introduces the character Calcula. Lady Calcula is the name of Davros's mum, a high-ranking Khaled politician. She had Davros illegitimately. Davros is a bastard boy. For, let's say, reasons, Lady Calcula lost it and manically butchered her family, killing her husband, drowning Davros's sister, Yavor. Eh, no relation. In the family pool. Yo, Davros had a family pool? That's sick. Shame about, you know, before then marching into Davros's laboratory and destroying all of his work. And Davros was the child that she loved. I think he got off lightly, but she didn't. But this backfired when she tried to destroy Davros's latest creation, and Lady Calcula found herself mutating. Davros remarked like a beautiful butterfly, forming one eye, sad pointed tentacles. Davros's mother turned herself accidentally into the first proto Dalek mutant. Like any normal boy, this inspired Davros. Her mutation and then death, he thought, was beautiful. That's the way we should all go. You are becoming what we all will become. But just a little too early. Scaro isn't ready for you yet. The universe isn't ready for you. I'm gonna go ahead and say that this is a dysfunctional family unit. But wait, no, hang on. According to Terry Nation, creator of the Daleks and creator of all contradictory Dalek lore, Davros's mother was killed in a rocket when Davros was only six years old. And there is the origin of Davros, or one of six, at last count anyway. You know what? Good on him. Watching your murdering maniacal mother try and kill your entire family, only to watch her then go through a change of heart as she mutates into a one-eyed jellyfish, then to watch her die in front of you and come back multiple times as a ghost. Those are the moments that life is made of. So whenever Davros talks about his children, just know it's because he's suffering from mummy issues. Nice job, lady. Now that's some parenting. You're human. If they capture you, they'll convert you. Hello, Samuel Davis from the YouTube channel Davis. Um, I would like to submit my fact for the uh, the Doctor Who giveaway competition. So, did you know? This is my fact, okay? Did you know that Cyberman's eye sockets, the Cybermen, yeah, their eye sockets, they're called iPods. Crazy. Thank you to competition loser there, Erin. She doesn't really watch Doctor Who, but she wanted to win a prize anyway. So thank you to everybody else who entered. Back in July, it was a lot of fun. Once I got that stream up and working, I think it was good. Mechanoids of pet dogs. Three doctors loose in Pompeii. What will they do? We got a little Kablam man. I will not be giving him away today. He is mine. The fourth doctor worked as a cabbie. It's my little son. I got him for £2.99. Favourite dinosaur, Billy. You know it's the Diplodocus. You know it's the Diplodocus. Doctor in distress. I'm amazed, honestly, that this is still even going. But many of those facts were too good just to throw away like that. So today I'm gonna try and incorporate some. Off the cuff, on the fly. I don't talk to police. A Time Lord's kryptonite is aspirin. This is a fact that comes up a lot, actually. Aspirin has an effect that can prove fatal to Time Lord physiology. Thank you, Kate Orman. That actually links up with Mind of Evil, where the Doctor declines medication because it's designed for a different metabolism. It would probably kill him. In Burning Heart, the sixth Doctor had so much aspirin, he fell into a deep coma. And then, in a completely different story, Sixie does it again, but quickly counters it by eating chocolate. Character growth. 
Travelling to Earth in any year after 1987 is a death wish for Time Lords. Or whatever the hell the Doctor is these days. But, ah, uh, hang on, we've definitely seen the Doctor taking medication before. There's aspirin in the TARDIS first aid kit! Back when I guessed the Doctor was a human from the far future. Jackie Tyler was this close to murdering the 10th Doctor on Christmas Eve. What about the TV movie? Or, a better example, Spearhead from Space. Nobody thought of getting this man some basic pain relief. Psst, I heard that that's how the Master wiped out Gallifrey. Headache tablets. Can you feel a new era dawning, Doctor? If you want further information, feel free to check out the Gallifrey and Physiology page on the TARDIS data core. Uh, that is too much detail for a fictional species. And I'm the broke cannon guy. Fact number two. The 13th Doctor harvested kinetic energy from primary schoolers, using their energy to move a planet. Mayday! Mayday! Can you hear me? Who are you? Oh, no time for that. Save the world first, make friends later. The BBC loved to give kids Doctor Who themed educational content. It's one of my favourite things they do, in fact. And the Chipnow era is no different. Okay, super movers. Let's see if Doctor Who's TARDIS can travel at the speed of light! Well, maybe a little bit. We need light so we can see things around us. Without a light source, dark woods around us. We see things that give out light or reflect it. Light travels from the object. Our eyes detect it. Who are these three and how did they get inside the TARDIS? Why are they whipping? A couple people recommended this and it's just been a matter of time, but uh, I'm gonna give this to Harasada and Mr. Doctor Gilmore. This is Space, Light and Super Movers, a BBC Live lesson. Everybody listen, we're part of the solar system. Planets spinning around the sun, eight in total, Earth is one. I didn't know things would get into the TARDIS like that. Neither did I. One day I'm going to write a short story where these three are antagonists. Cosmic gods that have stolen the TARDIS. The moon is made up of rock and dust, and it's all but in the Earth. But also it's a dragon egg and humans helped its birth. Now look, I know some of you might be cringing at this, but I personally commend Lydia West for getting that role of the 14th Doctor. No matter how young she is. Good for her. Don't panic, but a ginormous rogue planet from another dimension is blocking all your planet's light from the sun. In these live lessons that I've watched because I'm an adult man, the Doctor needs to save the planet Earth as the planet Tenebris has blocked out all light from the sun. Sorry kids, I guess this one isn't a fixed point. But rather than tow it with the TARDIS, or get any of her god-powered friends to help, the Doctor decides to farm children around the country as a battery. Schools, I need your help. Gather all your children. It's gonna take a big gang of super movers to fix this. And tells them to move about like a hamster on a treadmill. The brave children, presumably accepted, fueled all their power together like Goku charging a spirit bomb and pushed the planet away, destroying its ecosystem. It's a cute little story. I think it's the spiritual successor to Search Out Space, an 80s science quiz that the Doctor once hosted. And it's absolutely not canon, or at least that's what some books will tell you. Cowards, really? You need to control your spaceship with your body, so don't burp or pick your nose, because you could end up going headfirst into a black hole. Good for kids. Pure. Terrifying ramifications for the universe. Any science knowledge I may have gained in this ten minutes is completely sucked out by a vacuum when the dancers appear. And honestly, still not one of the low points of series 11. <laughs> this isn't the first time the Doctor's gone to children either. Hang on. Uh, that sounded dodgy. According to Andrew Luke, the fourth Doctor encouraged a classroom of children to form an anti-terrorist optimist power cell in the middle of wartime Belfast. Tom Baker, I guess, in character, although who could tell, dubs this class the Flying School. Then, 35 years pass, and it stops being just a cute thing Tom Baker did for a day, and becomes a story about him returning to the group of students on the site of the demolished school decades and decades later. And Andrew here actually knows one of the kids the Doctor met. So he's canon? By association? I don't know the rules. There are more examples of the Doctor radicalising or weaponising schoolchildren 
uh, dubious habit, but just rest in the knowledge that if the Doctor wanted to, not that they would, they could drag your entire planet out of orbit using Year 5s. Hey, fun facts, Doctor! Carnival of Monsters has a sequel. Ah, shit, what is it this time? An obscure iPhone app game? The plot of the back of an old serial tie-in? Is it a one-man student play Nick Briggs performed at university? No, this one has an orchestra. Doctor Who, The Monsters Are Coming, was a performance that toured the UK in 2011. This fact was suggested by Mr. Dr. Gilmore, who didn't win a prize, apart from this e-card I just made, but I actually didn't know this, which is strange because it's my era for Doctor Who. I guess I was just under the radar in 2011. Maybe in one of my I'm not into the show anymore phases. A two-part Doctor Who story touring the country with its own band? I don't know, I guess I have a cultural blind spot. Maybe I assumed it was Doctor Who at the prom. Look at us, we're Doctor Who fans. Do we look like we get invitations to proms? Doctor, it's a concert about you! And now two people sitting in the outboard hall get deleted. Deleted? Yes, yeah, so and we just appear in their seats. But the real hole went much, much deeper and was oddly rewarding, especially for me, as Carney of Monsters is one of my childhood favourites. Accredited as the finest showman in the galaxy, Vorgensen has used his father's invention, the Minimizer, to become the biggest act in the fifth galactic sector. Vorgensen is our main character for the evening, and <laughs> get this, Vorgensen is the son of Vorg. Vorg is this guy from Carnival of Monsters. They toured the country with a love letter to Carney of Monsters. Sorry kids, all of this lore relates to a 1973 story. What, you didn't do your reading, Timmy? Huh? Pathetic. Of all the characters, of all the characters to return to. Note how the Doctor and Vorg part on good terms, despite the Doctor destroying his income. There is solidly no beef there but raised on stories of the Doctor and his magic time machine. Vorkinson has decided he wants revenge and wants the Doctor as a part of his collection, and the stage show we're watching tonight is a trap, a law, to bring him in. The plot is bizarrely dense. I hope you like blurry footage and pictures, because this is the best we got. Though, in fact, the whole thing is on YouTube in its entirety. I sat through all of it for this. But it's so boggling and awkward that I don't think there's much more I can do than show clips and condense the plot. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> I don't know what I'm here for either. I'm the middleman here. I'm fucking nothing. So for the first act, Vorgensen's big show is just doing a huge celebration to the Doctor and Amy Pond. <laughs> with special guests, as all the while he's releasing monsters into the audience to spice things up. Including the biggest monster of all, Winston Churchill, as played by Nicholas Briggs. <laughs> yeah, really. Ah, oh, what's going on, Winston? Where are you, buddy? The Doctor arrives at the midpoint saying, hey, this is an incredibly dangerous and irresponsible stage show. Vorgensen responds by unleashing a bunch of Cybermen who then upgrade an audience member in front of everybody. First thing first, let Winston go and then let all the creatures go and then close down the minimizer. Oh, Doctor, you old have it, Kofi. It's perfectly all right. Listen, I have to listen, Edward Winston. You've got some of the most terrifying creatures in the universe down there to do. Clockwork robots and I think I even saw some sexy dance babies. In the final act, the Doctor appears on screen and tells the audience that Vorgensen could have never invented something as sophisticated as the minimizer. Turns out the monsters are coming was a big Dalek plan the whole time. How? Possibly how? In their strangest plan yet, they planted the designs of the Minimizer into Vorgensen's head so that he might trap the Doctor and then they can come along and kill him. It's just shooting him with lots of extra steps. The stage show ends when Matt Smith himself appears on stage using the sonic screwdriver to release the Cybermen and let them duke it out between themselves. Cybermen have developed new weapons, anti-Dalek alien plasma bombs. Exterminate the Cybermen! Delete the Daleks! Oh, by the way, this was written by Roberts. The late Gareth Roberts. Insert Gareth Roberts joke here. 
No, this was really cool. I hope that audience member who was converted into a Cyberman is... at least got a refund. I tell you what though, Mum, I bet you're not amused now. Hello boys and girlies, the Doctor Who marketing team recently released an ERG called Find the Doctor. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for their hard work in decoding it, but I solved it single-handedly. I did. Consider the Doctor found. Because he's, uh, he's right there. Find the Doctor didn't really add anything, apart from this nice painting and this single JPEG. Find the Doctor? More like find the marketing campaign. More like, find the two shits to give. So I've been on a different treasure hunt of my own, with the canon crucial children's search and find book, Where's the Doctor? It's a Where's Wally affair, and look, I love man hunting for that little red and white dude. I also love Doctor Who, so when I find Doctor Who, I point and I say, oh look, there's Doctor Who. Endless fun. Some of these illustrations tell such stories. For instance, here's the Ood Sphere, where you get to see Ood in their natural habitat. Having snowball fights and sledding. Here we have the most adorable depiction of cyber conversion factories ever. Where the doctor seems to be smiling, enjoying the factory. And there's also word of a cyber disco. Yep, nothing wrong here. There's a dog on the cyber conversion line. And an ice cream store. Something makes me think this isn't canonically consistent. I'm just glad everyone's having a fun time. I turn this page and oh, suddenly I'm in Slovene heaven. I guess the spread depicting a family get together where I see a pirate Slovene. Yes. In time of angels, the doctor's gone runabout leaving Amy surrounded by statues. It turns out they were like really outnumbered. And behind the scenes in that story, not only did a weeping angel steal the doctor's jacket, but um, Rory was there. Hey buds, what are you doing in the Byzantium? And then of course there's the silence, and what can I say but mood. This set piece depicts a Viking battle with Daleks, Cat Nuns, Scarecrows, a Slitheen, Amy Pond, Peg Dolls, the Minotaur, and Sea Devils all present for one big battle. I don't know what sequence of events caused this to happen, but I want to see this story. I also bought both of these by accident whilst looking for today's actual facts. So now I just own both of these like a dickhead. Now the real fact I was looking for is the 2019 annual story, Where's the Doctor? Queen Elizabeth II is a lizard lady. Yes, not for the first time in this web series, I am showing disrespect to the crown. But that's fine, so does Doctor Who every other episode. Today, all of our facts are going to be about queens, empresses, girl bosses, you may say. <laughs> oh my god, did I just call Queen Elizabeth II a girl boss? 2nd of June, 1953, London. The coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. A feared interplanetary assassin has come to kill the 13th Doctor, but she's going to have her work cut out for her, as there are currently 13 different Doctors in attendance. Doctors 1 through 13 all present with all of their friends combating alien plans and stopping invasions all happening around the same day 13 different villain plans the first doctor and susan are running away from an alien tripod we must protect her majesty the second doctor and jamie are streaking on the hunt for the devil beastie joe grant is trying to give the queen a present mid parade Four and Sarah have taken this fine dashing gentleman into the crowd. Hang on, the whole crowd are aliens. Huh? Mid coronation, the queen is attacked by a giant snake. Six is there with Perry. The seventh doctor is playing chess against a ghost. The eighth doctor is doing this with nobody noticing. The ninth doctor and Rose are about to stop what I guess is an Auton invasion. And ah, he's also taken Donna, Amy and Bill to see the ceremony. So let's call that 13, 14 different attempts on Queen Elizabeth's life. Eventually our assassin gets so sick of tidying up all these interstellar threats that she just dives into the Queen's car. Right then Liz, I'm after the Doctor. Where is she? Queen Elizabeth II is a lizard monster. An alien werewolf lizard tax dodger. It's insanity. You would think this would be an alien duplicate or an imposter posing as the Queen of England, but 
The story curiously ends like this. Bit of respect, Ryan. This isn't just any giant lizard. She's the queen. Or as I've always called her, Liz. That just raises further questions. But no, there's no ambiguity here at all. On the TARDIS wiki page, Queen Liz, the actual monarch of my actual country, is listed as human. Lizard. Da, 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 da. You gotta wonder what it's like for the royal family watching these. You have to remember, the Queen is a massive Whovian. I've seen her on Gallifrey base. So to see her and her ancestors depicted often as villains must be very strange. Now that we know that she was a lizard the entire time, we can start asking the real important questions as to how did the Sikrax control her on Christmas Day? They're on the roof. Why is she on good terms with the Doctor, considering her family history? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Happy Christmas. And why a fictional Doctor, well, more fictional than usual, attempted multiple times to kill her. They're close friends, which leads me to assume that Liz, the lizard, that is, has to be a benevolent ruler. Imagine having an unelected standing royalty from a foreign power that nobody questions. Mental. According to birthrights, the Seventh Doctor said that the royal succession came to an end in the early 21st century. And I'd say the jury's still out on that one. But in 1997, during the dying days, she was re-coronated, because the Ice Warriors took over and, I guess, demoted her. But Revenge of the Jadoon says she'll be succeeded by King Charles III and Queen Camilla, who, naturally, are also werewolf-lizard hybrids. I fucking hate this series. I am the Lizard Queen! Tooth and Claw catches some flack every now and then, but remember, it's the only Doctor Who story that takes the piss out of Thatcher, and the royal family's love of inbreeding in the same 45 minutes. Can we not tell the far right gang about this one, guys? They'll have a field day. Fact number two, let's roll back the clock and talk about her predecessor, a queen much more involved in the Doctor Who series. Torchwood mission operative, Queen Victoria. Yeah, not only was she the bloodthirsty ruler of the free world, Empress of India, but also a more active tortured member than most of them. Do you think this funny? No, I'm sorry. To date, Big Finish have released a trilogy of Queen Victoria solo stories. So all period pieces, back when Tortured was first established, where she is the main character battling aliens. These are the same people who brought us Winston Churchill the series, so... a strike two, Briggs. Coming next from Big Finish, the heroic adventures of Chris Columbus. We love stories. To their credit though, Queen Victoria is written as a pseudo-villain, incredibly unlikable. A character that makes Yvonne Hartman look modest. In The Crown, the Queen is cursed by a homeless lady, and basically experiences the events of the Curse of Clyde Langer, where nobody recognises her. And old Queen Vic has to live rough on the street for a couple months. Meaning, she has to spend Christmas alone. Moral stories about class? At Christmas? In Fortitude, Queen Victoria tricks one of her oldest prisoners into giving her the Koinor, the crystal that would defeat the werewolf, and then imprisons him on an island to fend off some space-time genie. I promise that sounds more interesting than it is. And then there's Save Our Souls, the most interesting of the bunch, in which a disembodied alien voice wants to advise Queen Victoria. She saves the day and defeats the alien threat by saying no. <laughs> because, and this is a quote, she listens to no one. But it's in Save Our Souls, with hints in the other ones, that Torchwood frequently planned to assassinate the Queen, her own institute turning against her. Even back when it was formed, it was corrupt as hell. Their plan was to depose a queen and then make a pact with this alien entity who could emulate the voice of Queen Vic, meaning that Torchwood could run the world. Which is a good plan until somebody questions how this 300 year old woman is still ruling the British Empire. Do I recommend these stories? Yeah, maybe. For my money though, go read the Torchwood story where they kidnap H.G. Wells in a spiritual successor to Time Lash, of all stories. Yeah, no, that one's great. 
Fact number three. Ice Warrior is a reclaimed slur. In fact, actually, I'd like to apologize for my for my ignorance. I'm gonna censor myself every time I talk about those Martian boys. It's their word, it's not mine. And honestly, the doctor doesn't have any right going around calling them. It's an ice warrior. Oh yes, hello there, young 1960s youth. You're telling me that you've just watched the ice warriors on television? And that at no point they called themselves ice warriors? By Jove, that's crazy. He looks pre-Viking. But no such civilization existed in prehistoric times before the first ice age. <laughs> Proper ice warrior, isn't he, sir? Yeah, in this first adventure, I is just a name one of the scared humans gives them. And because they never identify themselves, that's what the Doctor calls them. Future stories definitely forget this. By the time of the Federation, many considered the term as a xenophobic throwback to a violent heritage. What's weirder still is that the Ice Warriors, the original TV story, is set really far into their future. This book will tell you it's just a friendly nickname, whilst this book will tell you that they called themselves that because as a species, they forgot what they were called. Hey, that actually makes much less sense. Their original title was Saurian Evolutionaries. The Ice Warriors, by one account, were created by the Gandorans as a slave warrior race. And sometimes they just go by Martians. Rise, my ice warriors! Rise! But even then, that origin gets tricky because at some point they're visited by the Asirans, posing as gods, who formed their name and religion and culture. Sorry, Dan Abnett, there is not a cannon plaster big enough to cover this hole. The book Transit also has another slur for them, the derogatory name of Greenies. And yeah, I do feel a bit dirty saying that one. In Empress of Mars, Queen Araxa claims to have been in hibernation for nearly 5,000 years, and this story happens in the 19th century. Think about it, the Ice Warriors are evolving concurrently with humanity. There's no time travel involved. This contradicts so many stories that have tried to make sense of the Ice Warriors. The new series will tell you that they were at their civilization peak around the time of Jesus Christ but the audios differ massively, saying that they fell sometime before the 21st century, or millions of years BC. All this confusion, just because one ice warrior happened to be a good guy back in the 70s. Ugh. You're telling me that these characters only exist to service the stories that they're a part of? I can't deal with that! I have to hyper-literally treat my stories as if they're real, otherwise how do I know if I'm real? Oh, and just to put the last canonical cherry on top, Jim Mortimer's Blood Heat directly suggests that the Ice Warriors and the Draconians were descendants from Silurians who managed to get into space. So I give up. There's the show, everybody. Harry Sullivan is an imbecile! When the crypt doors creak and tombstones quake, spooks come out for a swinging wake. Happy homes materialize and begin to vocalize. Grim gringos come out to socialize. Happy Halloween, everyone. I wait till a special occasion every year to do a little sing song, you know me. So here's three more gothic y, but you know, like Scooby Doo gothic facts I could find involving witches, Dracula, and, um, Pongloy, my gloff, naff, Cthulhu Riley, Wagarnagl Fatagan. Is that Welsh? In his house at Riley, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Oh, shit, well, I don't want to hear any of that. Let's have us a nice fun time. Fact number one. Harry Sullivan freed the Carrionites. For a character who only travelled with the Doctor for one season, I think Harry Sullivan has one of the strange timelines in the series. For reference, this is a character who has become a decomposing zombie before. Gone internet viral famous in hashtag Harry Sullivan. Became the head of unit at some undisclosed point of time. Split up unit about a day later. Had his head turned into a goat's head. And Scratch Man, I didn't like that. At some point, Harry Sullivan has a split timeline because Revenge of the Cybermen and Return of the Cybermen curiously contradict each other, almost like a soft reboot of that TV story. Does that mean two Harrys? I don't know, I have a headache. But also, right before his departure story, 
the free carrier knights from the Shakespeare Code break out of their glass ball and attack the fourth Doctor with Harry and Sarah. I don't get it either. They're in a time machine? So what I can only assume is in the middle of a space-time paradox. In this spooky Doctor Who tale, uh, Carrie Knights drowned Sarah in an attempt to get the Doctor's name out of her mind, so they could curse him. I'm guessing nobody invited them down to Trendelaw. Carrie and I have a weird bit of lore, uh, not thanks to Grubbits. The Eternals banished them at the very beginning of time for fighting a proto-time war with the crap baddies, the ones from Forever Autumn. Which is a real deep dive into Doctor Who book lore. Don't read that book though. Halloween season or not, it's not very good. To save Sarah from a sudden witch invasion of the TARDIS, Harry grabs the glass ball and trips over, shattering their prison and releasing them onto the Doctor. But at that exact moment, there's Reapers outside. Cool. The clap of my space-time paradox has alerted the bees. They come trick-or-treating looking for a snack on the TARDIS doors. The Doctor politely lets them into his TARDIS, and both monsters eat each other. I then assume the Reapers politely left, because the story takes us immediately into the beginning of Terror of the Zygons. So uh, I don't blame Harry for leaving, I really don't. The Expanded Universe tells us that he only left the TARDIS because he got tortured by robot psychiatrists and beaten up everywhere I go. The uh, yeah, fair enough. I don't even understand the technicals of how this story happened in the first place, but it's a nice little distraction for side story. The Doctor must have been as miffed as I am, honestly. Currently in the Hooniverse, Harry Sullivan is still missing, as a certain run of Sarah Jane Adventures but not those ones, started a plotline and then never concluded it because Sarah Jane Smith was needed on television, leaving Harry Sullivan abandoned, not in a lost timeline, in a lost storyline. Over there with the silence and Captain Jack's memories. Before Harry Sullivan went missing, which is also mentioned in the Sarah Jane Adventures, Harry managed to cure AIDS. He found a cure for, for the AIDS virus. Harry Sullivan found a cure for AIDS. Thank you, Damage Goods. Thank you, Russell. Show me that version of It's a Sin, please. Oh, and also he developed a Zygon killing gas. And they could have used it in the Zygon inversion, but the doctor said, no, 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 no. We only use the genocide gas when I say so. Harry Sullivan could have one-shotted the Zygon inversion. No speech needed. Fact number two. Ah, ah. The vampires. Coming up yet again on this show, I don't have a fixation, they do. Vlad, Nos, Drac, I know them all. You know how I always do my shtick saying there's multiple different iterations of this fictional character? Well, Dracula's is actually explained in the text. Lord Dracula, don't laugh, actually existed in the realm of quantum possibility. Jinkies. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? Oh, yes! This means there are many different explanations for what Dracula can be and they can all coexist. Just like every other character in the series. Thanks Faction Paradox for reinforcing absolute canonical purity. Sometimes he is a fictional character. Sometimes as a historic prince that shared the same name. Sometimes he's the real deal. Count Dracula infamously did fight in the war in heaven which automatically makes it better than the Time War. But he also had a side gig working for Meow, the Ministry. Meow is Iris Wildtime's parody version of units, and she often works for them and alongside Count Dracula. Or abandon all hope of seeing the sun again. You stop that. But on screen, I'm talking the TV series. We did it back in the 1960s. Let's talk about the chase. Part four, journey into terror. I am Count Dracula. But you can't be. I mean, not, not really. It's gone. Halfway through the chase, the Doctor and company arrive in a haunted house encountering a cartoony, universal hammer horror, Count Dracula and Frankenstein. Then promptly leaving, without giving a single explanation as to who they were, how they could exist, why they could survive Dalek rays, 
and what drugs the Doctor Who producers were on at the time. This is the best episode in Classic Who, so I don't think I'm bashing it when I say that. I'm glad they've actually come back to this one. Some media since has tried to insinuate this was the land of fiction, and they arrived there a couple seasons early. But the novelization has a much weirder take on it. Like all of the best Target novelizations, this expands on the original material and includes background and scenes that weren't in the original broadcast. This includes an entire backstory on the character Morton Dill. Where are they? <laughs> Just left. <laughs> Let me stress, that's like Chris Chibnall stopping the plot to tell you the entire life story of this guy. You know what? I wouldn't complain about that either. In 1967, he was locked up in an insane asylum, permanently, because he told people about the Dalek that he saw that day. The Dalek that just wandered off, deciding against killing him because it'd be much crueler to leave him to his actual fate. How is that fair? Why does the Dalek have historical knowledge of historical figure Morton Dill? Sorry, I need to move on. Uh, Dracula? The novelization tells us this was a fun fair, and that Frankenstein and Dracula were both robots. Animatronics that can throw entire Daleks. What, are we in the far, far future? What sophisticated society could build such powerful animatronics? Oh, you know, Earth, 1996 in Ghana. The Doctor makes a hypothesis about somehow landing in the world of human imagination. Yes, it exists in the dark recesses of the human minds. Millions of people secretly believing. Think of the immense power of all these people combined together makes this place become a reality. But no, he was actually just completely wrong. But it's really just an abandoned funfair attraction for the festival of Ghana. Unbridled madness. Full video coming in the near future. And fact number three. Lovecraft was right. Um, clarification, asterisk. Write about some things. More about his own mythos and not his racial views. Important clarification. The Necronomicon is real. The Necronomicon is a Doctor Who text. Or maybe it's more fair to say that Doctor Who is canon to the Necronomicon. The Doctor has met author H.P. Lovecraft before. In his sixth incarnation, he vowed he never wanted to cross paths with the man. And he came out of that story with a black eye. But his eighth incarnation had seemingly renounced this moral standpoint and um, joked about going to go and get ice cream with him. As they were good friends. He'd babysit his cat and everything. What was that cat's name? And I know as far as writers go, he's pretty foundational in the combination of horror, fantasy, science fiction. He laid the groundwork for quite a lot of that. It's only natural that Doctor Who would incorporate some of his ideas and influences, even if unconsciously. But I didn't expect the Seventh Doctor to personally go to the tomb of Cthulhu and make sure he's still buried under wraps. With Sherlock Holmes, no less. In the Doctor Who universe, pretty much everything in this book is legit. The nesting consciousness, we said before. That's one of the elder things. How about the web planet? Oh yeah, the big bad of this one all the way back in 1964? Please be 1964, please be 1964. Was one of the great old ones from the pre-universe. Written about, in detail, in the Necronomicon. Wow, look at you, the Animus. Who could have known? I'm just saying the web planet is a lot of things, but... Eldritch? I wouldn't have said was one of them. Also in this pantheon of nightmare gods, we have Dagon, a god worshipped by the sea devils. Azathoth, worshipped by the Silurians and the Shabogans. The Archons, the Archons from this completely unrelated book. What? There's also Fenric, and the Celestial Toymaker. Okay. Lovecraft would have loved the Celestial Toymaker. This fact is really fun because it made me actually have to get the Necronomicon off my shelf for the first time. Now Cthulhu, the big man, as I like to call him, is either a original creation by H.P. Lovecraft or an actual sentient being that the Seventh Doctor met in Haiti. Both of these facts 
have to be true independently because two different stories depend on it. And now it just starts getting silly. Dig deep enough, and there are theories that this outer god, Nialathotep, Lovecraft's most feared, powerful entity, was actually the other, one of the founding fathers of Gallifrey and eventually the Doctor. So chew on that one. He is the thing from the void. He is more than a man. He is the troubler at the gate, the walk over the thousand forms. He is the thing from the void that mocks the blind apes of truth. He is a dark messenger. Yeah. Now again, did H.P. Lovecraft come up with this guy? Or was he named by Rathalon himself? These stories don't go together, surprisingly. There's also thousands of the original Necronomicon. The master owns one in his TARDIS. The original has magic powers. In one of the master's funniest schemes, he gives the book to Jamie McCrimmon, who in turn gives it to the second doctor, who, just by touching it, is teleported to an alien planet, thrown into a trap. Don't accept racist texts from bearded men, Jamie. Mark? Wait, Mark? Mark 7? Anomaly detected! Welcome back to the unending canon wars of 2021, in which it is still, for some reason, our thankless duty to determine what is and isn't canon in a world that doesn't have one. Especially when this is a TV series that frequently invalidates its own episodes. Did you know that the revival has technically decanonized the abominable snowmen and ambassadors of death? I mean, think about it. The first manned Mars probe in the Christmas invasion, when we were apparently very publicly going to the moon every day back in the 70s. The great intelligence being created in the 19th century in London, when it's uh, meant to be hiding out in Tibet from the 18th to the 20th. These don't go. <laughs> what can I say? The conflict continues. In fairness, a lot of the real world's conflicts are over kind of canon, aren't they? War, history, religion. <laughs> We're all just a bunch of guys and girls with our dicks in our hands, arguing over what did and didn't happen. Jesus, am I too deep in. Nissa and Tegan have worn human skin. Great stuff. And I, I don't just mean their own skin, I mean someone else's, another human skin. You pernickety fucks. The 2020 Big Finish offering Madquake pits Tegan, Nyssa, and Adric 2 against the Slitheen family, out on a human hunt. Where's the Doctor gone off to? He's elsewhere in the past in a completely different story. The gang have taken a break from each other. Which is to say the Doctor suddenly left them stranded on an alien world with no intention of coming back for them. I think we could all do with a break. It'll take more than a few waterfalls and sunsets to fix this, Doctor. I meant from each other. Doctor, you're being ridiculous. Now, it's a nice planet, aside from the Slavine. None of his companions got a say in the matter, and Tegan is furious. Adric too is having a suicidal existential crisis. What with being part of Cyberman and all. Whereas Nyssa never wants the Doctor to return, totally at peace with their new home, Kalana. It's a therapy planet, hilariously. The Fifth Doctor checked them all into a clinic and ran. And I don't blame him. If this unit needed anything on TV, it was some couples counselling. The planet Kalana has a healing factor, a calming agent in the atmosphere that's attracted the Slavine. But I should say, in fairness, the Slavine are not all bad eggs. In this story, the results of Dr. Cott turns out to be a defected Slavine therapist. How, what does that look like? Therapy. Delivered to you by someone from a planet where they literally eat their young? I'll pass. The cat fights off the hunting party, giving Tegan the chance to replace the doctor and take initiative. Her plan is to steal the freshly peeled flesh suits. And with nobody questioning the ramifications of this idea, Tegan does it. She impersonates the family head honcho and in character tells them all off. Oi oi fella, better cut out that human hunting business this instant. Or for you, your, your lippy cants. 
That's my Tegan impression, everyone. And lo and behold, the Slovene make a dash for it. Tegan saved the day by wearing another human to stay alive. Look, if she didn't need therapy already, she certainly does now. Grizzly details happening off screen is nothing new with the Slovene. Let's not forget that a recurring element of the Sarah Jane adventures is a need for children being skinned alive. I can't help but think of Ascension of the Cybermen that came out the same year as this. When they're cleaning out the innards of the Cybermen suits. Crikey, as yes. Cleaning out these bodily organs ain't half tricky, my cockle. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay, now I can do an Aussie accent. Now that I'm trying to impersonate Bradley fucking Walsh. Let's go and see what the doctor's up to on the other side of the box set. Whilst his friends wear human skin to not be eaten alive. Thin Time is a mid-pleasant period piece with, with the doctor on a big ol' strop, claiming that he can never travel with people again for there's just too much danger involved. When who comes out to set him straight? It is you, isn't it? I mean me, I mean... I hope I'm not too late. Um... Let me buy you breakfast. What am I doing here? Or what will I be doing here? Me? Uh, I, I've been living in London for the last year. I always liked this year. It's a thin spot, you know. Mm, I do know. Okay, then. Suddenly, a uh, multi-doctor story. Sure. This final scene has the 11th Doctor consoling him and giving his past self advice from the future about his companions. Thanks, Eleven. In a moment of emotional vulnerability, where was that kind of help for the 10th Doctor when he was in this exact same rut? Ah, no, right, he got 12 instead. Still with Blondie. Ah, you get over her, by the way. Jesus, no wonder we got a Time Lord victorious. The 5th Doctor and the 11th Doctor meeting so suddenly out of the blue feels even more random and transgressive than the Slovene. But as sudden as this may feel, it also works quite nicely. I know they've just got Jacob Dudman in a shoe closet down there, and they can bring him out at any time they need, but it's a very clever, intentional use of Eleven here. To be honest, I'm living here in retirement. I shouldn't go into details because, you know, causality. Let's just say I got a little weary of being a liability to others. It was time to keep the world at a distance. I know the feeling. In the wake of losing the ponds, who better to discuss the pain and responsibility of family? TARDIS family. Only Big Finish, only Big Finish could use fan wank to deliver emotional character closure. Wow. Look, don't get me wrong, they're still using the Big Finish story dartboard to write scripts. But damn, can Dan Abnett write? Ace's job at McDonald's. I promise this one is more exciting than it sounds, okay? Five different stories by five different authors all involve Ace working at a McDonald's. The McDonald's branches in Perivale and Tottenham Court Road in particular. Hey Sam, why would this ever be relevant to multiple Doctor Who adventures? Because in her time working there, she met Tegan, the Word Lord, Omega, and the Ergon on shift. She met Tegan briefly, as Ace makes a small cameo in the Crystal Bucephalus. The Word Lord? That's a villain from the Seventh Doctor Big Finish adventures, we'll get to him. He had an evil plan that siphoned off power to himself any time anyone uttered the phrase Happy Meal for some reason. And Omega? Oh boy. I've been sitting on this one since the series began. This is a short comedy story called Antimatter with Fries from the pages of Doctor Who magazine. The Ergon, or as I like to call him, Chicken Man, is scouting the planet Earth for its master Omega. And Omega's, like, really fallen from grace since his initial appearance, huh? Mythical, god of his own domain, to this, to lingering around McDonald's. Oof. I almost feel sorry for him. But again, that's one for next time. 
With no cloaking device or disguise, the Ergon just walks straight into Paraval McDonald's, looks around, and gets in line. Oh, Barry, you silly sod. Is that you? Nice chicken costume. Ace thinks the Ergon is her friend Barry, which is amazing, but also confirms that in-universe, some monsters just happen to look like men in chicken suits. I choose to place this before the events of Ark of Infinity, making this McDonald's order a crucial prologue to that Gallifreyan epic revenge story. Thinking that the Ergon is still her mate, Ace gives the confused chicken man a box of fries, and it takes them back to his master. Back to Omega, who, for the record, is a Time Lord god of legend. Omega claims the chips are... Lacking adequate salt. <laughs> I restate, Omega is the lamest Doctor Who villain of all time, and people who are still vying for his epic return to the new series should probably stay away from watching Ark of Infinity. Oh, and talking about falling from grace, who wrote this little comedy story? Ah, right. God, how many stories did this bigot write? The Daleks pretended to invent the Mavellans. Apart from Doctor Who and Friends, the most reliable ass kickers of Daleks are the Diva Mavellans. From the mouth of Terry Nation himself, anyway. I love talking about Terry Nation creations, because here's a man so ambivalent to continuity that he often remakes his own stories, forgetting that he did them before. It bears reminding that the very first Mavellan story was the one where Terry Nation forgot that the Daleks weren't robots. So, you know, take everything he makes with a pinch of salt. Because they've stuck around regardless. Most recently, as the big bad final villains of the poorly titled Dalek Universe range. Hey, and also minor spoilers for the final box set, because it, it just came out. But I'm going there. The Mavellans, according to Dalek Universe 3, are descendants of the SSS operative Mark 7. Mark 7 is an android companion of the 10th Doctor, and he's actually a nation-owned character, and goes all the way back to the oldest days of Dalek Mania. In the astounding untold history of the greatest enemies of the universe, Mark was recruited into the prestige Anti-Dalek Force. The Anti-Dalek Force uh, blew my mind. Because thanks to their mad amount of appearances in expanded media, we actually know the name of almost every single operative. From their humble annual beginnings, to their involvement with the Time War, to even now. Because, get this, the ADF are still confirmed active in the revival. Able to investigate and combat the new, well, new Dalek paradigm. But that's enough about Mark, the first Mavellan, because there's other Mavellan origins out there. A ton of them, in fact. The Also People tells a dark little sci-fi story of the civilization who created the Mavellans, who gave robots consciousness, and thusly wiped out by them. Then there's a device of death, which tells you that Harry, the Fourth Doctor, and Sarah created the Mavellan timeline as a result of their meddling in Genesis of the Daleks. Somehow, their events there inspired a scientist to develop Dalek killers. But that's the Time Lord version of events. The Dalek line on the matter is that the Daleks themselves invented their most powerful predators. <laughs> No, we meant to do that. We meant to provoke a thousand year war. In War of the Daleks, the Dalek Prime claims that they were their puppets all along, and that they faked a thousand year war to convince Davros that he was in danger and he needed to help the Daleks. If you watch that story, Davros was always willing to help his own Daleks. They just kept killing him. The Daleks made the Mavellans. Yeah. Sure, Jan. It's a proper little Rashomon we got going on here. I don't know who's telling the truth. Is there such thing as truth? 
It looks to me as if the Dalek Prime has a reputation to uphold. And if that is the truth, that the Daleks made them a villains, that must be pretty awkward when we get around to Dalek Universe 3. And Davros betrays his own children for the Disco Droids. And then, the Daleks and the Mervellans unite forces, teaming up on the rest of the galaxy. That doesn't make sense then. Personally, I call bullshit. And if Mr. Nation was still here with us today, I'm sure he'd have five new origin stories for the Mervellans. You wish to fight the will of Omega? Welcome back to The Matrix. Today, brought to you through me. Sorry, it's just me. Um, couple reasons. I forgot I had a DSLR. Also, I want to be in Betty today. I want to be in Betty Bites today. Get the fuck over you little cunt. I have some news concerning the bear. To justify my setup, let's call this a bedtime broke cannon. A, a blanky broke cannon. I've got my blanky here. It's a pyjama party. Sleepover at Sam's, except no one came to my sleepovers because I mostly just dispense Doctor Who trivia. Anyway, on to today's business. By the way, this is my actual childhood bear I found. Almost definitely Harry. We've, we're blood bonded, but he's um a flag shagger. <laughs> and I, oop. Fact number one, please. The Doctor's got ink. Big deal. Everyone's got a tattoo. I've got a tattoo. I've got two. For the record, I don't know what either of these represent. There's an emoji of this one. Sometimes tattoos don't have to mean anything. But the third Doctor's very much does have a purpose. In this scandalous scene from 1970's Spearhead from Space, eagle-eyed viewers may be able to see a tattoo of a snake on the Doctor's right forearm. If you're not distracted in other places, Really obsessive and devoted fans in the wilderness years, Paul Mars, came to the collective fan theory that the snake was a tattoo given to him by the Time Lords. Because what sense would it make to regenerate into a person who already has a very specific tattoo? Biologically, that seems unlikely. About as unlikely as regenerating into a man who has... fillings. What's your head cannon for that one, guys? No, this tooth. It's a time tooth from ancient Gallifrey. So the tattoo of a snake in the shape of a sea, it's the equivalent of a prison tattoo. To denote exiles, convicts, this is the Third Doctor's convict tattoo. Yes, Doctor Who fans love minutiae and will cover their asses on anything, it seems. Why does he have it really? Well, John Pertwee got it in his naval days as he blacked out drunk for a birthday party and woke up with his arm in a bandage, revealing a snake with the letter C denoting the woman he was seeing at the time. C, 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 C. Silesia, the Chancellor. Cronodus, the Corsair. Chancellor, Castellan. I think we'll crack the case. According to his autobiography, John Pertwee did not stay with this woman, Carlotta, for the rest of his life, meaning now thanks to weirdo Doctor Who fans on the internet, she's been immortalized in canon. Does it really explain why future incarnations don't have the tattoo? I'm not sure. Yeah, the body does reset, but according to Book of the War and Christmas on a Rational Planet, it has biodata in it, smart nanogenes that can track the criminal's whereabouts. So if that criminal regenerates and resets their body, it's completely useless. In Christmas on a Rational Planet, Romana frees an entire prison complex full of criminals and they all get a dragon tattoo on their arm. Grandfather Paradox, a fact from Paradox, we're not going there today, Cut his arm clean off so he can't be tracked. I would have liked to see the third Doctor do that. Convict tattoos come up actually quite a lot in Faction Paradox. You can attach a snake tattoo to a person and speak through them and see through them. See, this is what Doctor Who Cannon does to me. You get a bunch of talented, really excessively geeky writers to talk about fan minutia, and then eventually, at some point, the fan minutia might become interesting. John Pertwee's drunken Navy friends. Getting a tattoo on his arm as a prank has influenced culture actual literature for years to come. Personally, I prefer the idea that John Pertwee just got blackout drunk one night. 
That can be canon. That can be canon too. A dragon tattoo would later appear in the series Class, but I'm gonna dismiss that because I don't really want to talk about Class either. I want to talk about... I want to talk about my jammies. Alright, so while time also had a tattoo of a bumblebee riding a bike, I'm onto something here. May and me used chronolocks in the form of tattoos, and the ape dog that had a convict tattoo all of his own. McGann seems a bit too squeaky clean to go to prison. His is of a man turning into a jaguar. And look, I'm saying, I know my tattoos don't have any significance, but that's fucked. So if you're ever in a place in life where you want to get a Doctor Who themed tattoo, that place where I currently am, I'm currently there. It's fine, we'll get through this together. Get a Navum and Snake tattoo with the letter C. What does the C stand for? Stands for canon. Fact number two. The Whitechapel murderer, leather apron, Jolly Jack, Saucy Jack, Jack the Ripper. We all know Jack the Ripper, except do we? There are still many suspects to this day. Fun fact, uh, they found out just a couple years, but like biologically somehow. DNA evidence from the Victorian era emerged that it was a Polish 23 year old barber called Aaron Kosminski. Ah. Uh, I don't get it either, but kudos, you caught Jack the Ripper. In the Hooniverse, there's a whole other list of suspects that they didn't take into consideration in the real world. Because surprise, surprise, a British historical icon, a staple of pop culture, has been tackled a couple times in Doctor Who. Shocker. You may remember in our Halloween episode, we spoke about the Lovecraftian Elder Gods. Well, this book involves Jack the Ripper and the Lovecraftian Elder Gods. Yzgaroth had to be summoned into the universe somehow, and how better than female prostitute sacrifices. So in this book, Jack the Ripper is a collective of people. The... the Fellowship. The Doctor caught them red-handed only during their third murder, even though there's five canonical murders, and the Doctor himself would later acknowledge that there were probably much more. That's dodgy. And all of the Jack the Rippers burned in a fire. But then in Matrix, it turns out it's the Valiard. I don't... Turn around, little Harry. This is not meant for your tiny bear ears. The Valyard has a number of evil villain plans, even outside of Charles the Time Lord. The fake stick-up courtroom was only his fifth plan. One of his others involved using the Dark Matrix to make a fake timeline where Jack the Ripper was still out claiming victims. But tasty all the same. So did he go round in his big Time Lord garb with the knife himself? No, he summoned 12 conduits in the form of 12 of the Doctor's spirits. Was it spirits? Yeah, 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 spirits. And killed the prostitutes that way. Just imagine Patrick Trousen bent over a dead prostitute with a knife in his hand. Jago and Lightfoot meet him at one point. He's actually apprehended, but then let go because of his relations to the royal family. The fifth doctor said he always wanted to get to the world of mystery and find out once and for all because he wrote books under the name Doctor Who. But by the time of his eighth incarnation, he's confirmed that he does know who did the killings. He doesn't tell us which of those suspects it was, of course. Yeah, no, that's weird too, because the Eighth Doctor then met a gargoyle-like alien creature in the streets of London. Turned out he was kind of a good guy, killed the odd person. And the Doctor just left him to his business, didn't take him home, just left him to stalk the streets of Soho. And then you get to the new series, and for some reason the annuals feel like getting involved. The Eleventh and Amy storied... Ripper's Curse. I read that, I read, okay, I googled that. I used the wiki for that, fuck you. <laughs> takes place in a post-Time War world where the Rena, hang on, the Rena war criminal Makatide uh, was connected to the final three murders. I don't always do this. Sue me, I didn't read the annual for, for babies. spring Jack wasn't even on the wiki actually, so... Despite the repeated returns to Victorian London, the revival has not come back to Jack the Ripper. Probably because Madame Vastra found him and ate him. Jack the Ripper has claimed his last victim. How did you find him? <sighs> Stringy, but tasty all the same. They were so desperate for that spin-off. Oh, and the towns of Wang Chiang. Why did we need to have any of these expansions? It was answered in the towns of Wang Chiang. Just, just settle. You did that one already, Doctor. You did that one. In truth, I only did this section because I wanted to recommend the far superior movie, Time After Time, where the historic H.G. Wells and his self-created time machine has to travel to modern day to capture Jack the Ripper. What do you want? My letterbox? It's a goddamn film recommendation. You're welcome. 
Omega, or Omegon for legal reasons, once told K9 Mark I that he invented time travel all by himself by harnessing the power of a thousand suns. Other times they'll tell you it's by unleashing the untapped potential of a supernova. Or a black hole. In fact, his story does seem to change quite a lot. In some stories, Omega had nothing to do with the actual process of time travel itself. Um, so maybe he's a hack fraud. Going from Time Lord mythology, I would not be surprised. It also may or may not have been as a result of Faction Paradox. The second book of Interference tries to claim time travel as being of their design as well, as he gave in some state propaganda that was put out there by the Faction. But I don't want to talk about any of that, we covered Omega last time, he's a massive dork. Every reappearance in the series just gets a little bit more pitiful, until you realise why we'll be scared of this guy in the first place, he's just a regular Time Lord. Oh yeah, he's all high and mighty when he's in an antimatter dimension of his own design. But take him out of it and he's just a melty boy. With Chicken Man. In the Big Finish audio Omega, yeah we're doing that one today. We are in the far off museum of time travel. An entire exhibit devoted to Omega and his pff, tragedy. His betrayal. A betrayal so bad that he cut off both of his hands that both became like uh, nuclear weapons. Or something, I, I, I hate this show. In creating time travel, Omega gained a conscience and realised that destroying that star would destroy a species called the Skintillians. They would all be destroyed in the blaze, and realising the guilt of this, but then still going ahead with it anyway, Omega believes he cut his own hand off in... guilt? Fury. He's cutting off hands, and then used his other hand to go ahead and kill them anyway. And that's why we find him in the story Omega, ruminating over the decision, the sacrifice he had to make. It's a really tragic, affecting story, uh, probably one of the best big finishes ever put out. But then spoilers. Don't let me spoil Omega for you, that final part is... gold. I know my series is just spoiler material, but trust me. Click off. The Fifth Doctor wanders in, in part four, during the final ten minutes of the story, and says that he wasn't really in the story the whole time. The entirety, the conflict, the struggle of Omega was entirely in this mad despot's brain. It's a very sad and tragic story. If it were true. What are you saying? You made it up. You didn't kill the Scintillans. You've created a fiction. A story in your mind to explain away what Vandekirian did to you. I don't understand. You didn't kill the Scintillans. It was me. I killed them. You? You? Roleplay based, audio serialized schizophrenia. After his humiliating defeat at the end of Ark of Infinity, there's a looming Fifth Doctor voice in his mind. A psychological Peter Davison crushing him, torturing him, just as a result of, it turns out, mental illness, madness. But also mainly the fact that the Doctor corrupted his memories. And his memories have fused together with the Doctor's. And it turns out that Omega's source of guilt, that horrible genocide he committed on the Skintillians, was actually a memory of the Doctor's. Meaning, the Fifth Doctor committed a genocide, felt bad about it, but then passed it off onto Omega, making him feel madness-inducing guilt for a horrific crime that his rival, the good guy, committed. It's messed up. It's messed up! There was a Lerman colony just outside the Stegoran asteroid belt. I arrived there whilst they were being attacked by a band of pirates. Unfortunately, what I didn't know was that the asteroid belt was also home to the Scintillans. They were beings of pure thought, Omega. And I made a terrible mistake. They were completely destroyed. You must have taken my memories and made them your own. He did it all along. Poor old Omega was completely blameless. Perhaps he is a hero after all. Remember that Omega was the Doctor's childhood hero. Taking the phrase, kill your heroes, really to heart. But then I remember that the Doctor is the other, one of the other creators of time travel, and that he and Rassilon probably executed him, and it makes a little bit more sense. So that makes zero genocides on his end, and three on the Doctor's? Four. Ah, uh, no, maybe five. It's still shocking to me that the Time Lord Victorious event ends with ten going, whoops, 
commit another genocide. I feel kind of bad about it though. And then he flies off triumphantly to the next adventure with no repercussions. Boggling. The doctor killed an entire species in cold blood. It's not like there's no precedent for it. This fact goes out to the late Bob Baker, creator of Omega and K9. I'm still waiting for the feature movie where the two meets. It's gonna happen one day. I know it. And Brian Blessed is canonically Omega. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Good night, sweet prince. Don't come any closer. Stay away. Why? Hmm. I don't feel like reading these books today. <gasps> I know. I'll read someone else's books. Yeah. The library. The library. It's the place where books are free. The library. The library. Horribly funded in this economy. Having fun isn't hard when you got a library card. Okay, so I've been here half an hour, and the closest thing I could find to a Doctor Who book was this Quick Reads. Wow, this place really took a hit. It used to be three times the size of this. That's incredibly depressing, but today I decided I'd spend a whole day at the library, and I gave myself a challenge. Make a broke can of fact using only what you find in these four walls. So today, Jamie Oliver's first job was a pastry chef at Antonio Coluccio's Neil Street restaurant, where he first gained experience preparing Italian cuisine and developed a relationship with his mentor, Gennaro Contaldo. Uh, look, they didn't have many books here, right? Biographies is all this place has. Alternatively, if you wanted a Doctor Who one, let's talk about the Weeping Angel who had a talent act. It's the place where books are free. The library, the library. Speed reading to avoid late fees. This novel features Amy, Rory and Eleven arriving in modern day London. And they want to catch a show. There's a new magic act in town. The guy off the telly from Britain's Got Talent. Sammy Starr has an amazing new act, but why are there missing posters of young women appearing all over town? Um, it's because there's an angel. Because there's an angel in his act. The Doctor and his friends team up with residents of an old people's home to discover the truth. In this, there is a grand total of one single weeping angel, but it can replicate itself. It's on the West End! Nobody's saying a thing because when this statue appears, it can make his glamorous assistant disappear. Problem is, he's burning through one girl a night. You can kind of tell it is a kid's book, but only in the most charming of ways. I actually like stuff geared towards the younger fans. Not because I'm illiterate, but because that's usually where the more fun, wilder ideas lie. In Magic of the Angels, we find out the Doctor has met Mary Poppins. The Doctor yet again outright says he can sense evil. Ding, ding, ding. Amy spends the majority of the book in a sexy cat suit. Is, was, that, was that necessary, Doctor? But the main premise is the funniest of all. Why is Sammy Starr? TV magician actively allowing a weeping angel to kill women during his act. It's because he was laughed at when he went on TV for Britain's Got Talent. Vengeful, disgraced, a blow for all TV magicians everywhere. Sammy Starr vowed he would do anything to get back in front of not Piers Morgan and not Simon Cow and make them pay. Making countless young women disappear because he didn't win Breeden's Got Talent. Jesus Christ. I think we found the most evil person in the entire series, guys. See, it's very silly, but also for the same reason really deranged. It's like JLS being the villains of this book. Yeah, you can mention this. We to the first time in JLS. The Weeping Angel and Sammy Starr have quite the business agreement. Their plan is to get world famous that their show will be broadcast on all TV across the world as the image of an angel itself becomes an angel. Hang on, ha no, that doesn't work. A Weeping Angel has to become world famous it, for a magic act to do this? I'm pretty sure a Weeping Angel could just like appear on the news, just photobomb a local reporter, transmit billions and billions of yourself in a second. It's, 
surely just that easy. Also, not a great plan, how does the angel intend to move when every set of eyes on the planet Earth watching TV is watching this angel? Not every TV watcher in the world is going to blink at the same time. Bad plan, dude. And it's an even more embarrassing defeat. The doctor smiled. Oh, I think I found something to put on the fourth plinth. A statue of two angels facing each other. I call it Monument to the Missing. You're telling me that in the middle of London, there are two weeping angels staring at each other. Don't get me wrong, I believe it. London is filled with statues with creepy auras. But all it takes is for a pigeon to fly in front of their face, and those angels are absolutely free. Ah, scares kids though, doesn't it? On to the next fact. I've been making a bit of a reputation for myself, it seems. The other week I met so many friendly fandom faces in person for the first time. Unbelievably fun. I got to sign something. Me. I asked beloved old man Peter Purvis about his radical anti-mask views on stage. Nah, not really. But there was a bit of a pattern to the day. Oh my god, hang on. If we're recording this, <laughs> and I've got, I've got you here, uh. I would just like to tell you the fact of the matter that when we met at the BFI, right? So it was, it was you, me, Tharys, George is Lost, and my dad, <laughs> right? I recall. And we started talking about Broke Cannon, and one of the anecdotes that came up was the one where you talked about um, the Paul McGann smut fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which describes Paul McGann as having a swinging penis. Um, after you left, um, when I referred to you by your name, my dad couldn't remember who you were. Mm -hmm. So multiple, this happened multiple times to be clear. <laughs> People just naturally over the course of the conversation reminded my father of who you were with the words, the swinging penis man. <laughs> that is 100% what my dad knows you as now. Seems to me like I'm getting a bit of a reputation. It's not as if I made an entire video essay about the ramifications of sex and asexuality in the Dog 2 series over the years. It's not as if I uploaded a video called Ranking Monsters as Daddy Material. Just because I made a list ranking all the doctors by length. Suddenly, oh, I'm the Doctor Who Willy guy. Grow up. Anyway, today's fact is about uh, uh, kinks. Kinks in the Doctor Who universe. Right, uh, let's just put this to bed, all right? Did you know that certain incarnations of the Doctor are incredibly vulnerable to their erogenous zones? Fourth wall breaking minx Iris Wildtime claims to know all of them in great detail. On one far off planet, the fourth Doctor is considered a sex symbol and his likeness taken for the use of sex droids. A whole planet of titty tingler Tom Bakers. Oh boy. In the novel Rags, the third Doctor envisions a naked Zuri Harrier, a dubiously young girl. Thanks, Rob McClory, for bringing this one to my attention. Zuri was mincing up to him, and her rags were dropping away, freeing her to dance naked and wild before him. She threw her arms and head back and moved sinuous as a snake to the sound of his screams. These were the thoughts going through the Doctor's head as he was being burnt alive at a stake. Maybe the fumes got to his brain? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make excuses for the third Doctor. This is sus. In the Doctor Who magazine comics, Ryan is a little bit of a player, which I guess happens a bit on screen, but I really like this angle of his character. You know, he's a nice boy. Tall, good looking, completely made of cardboard. You could do much worse. At the ending of the Mistress of Chaos storyline, the fam can't go on to their next adventure in the TARDIS because Ryan's pulled. Oh, uh, well actually, Sandola and I were going to... We're gonna check out this little club I know. It's got a zero-G dance floor and serves draconian cocktails. Don't wait up. Blimey. Keep an open mind, Graham. This happens twice. I hope Ryan Sinclair has fun back on Earth, where none of the girls are made of metal. For context, I also need to say that Sandola was one of the villains of this arc. Like 15 pages earlier, she was trying to kill everyone. So, you know. Get in there, me son. Ryan, I think he screwed up. She was wifey material. In the class range of books, April McLean guiltily started to wonder about what it would be like to be with a shadow kin. By the way, this is the real scene from the series class. Oh, 
Are you not into it? No, it's just... You're regretting it. As is the king's prerogative. No, it's not that. I trust your majesty satisfied. I don't suppose we could have a moment of cuddling. What do I do with that? Well, what is a satirical guy like me meant to make of that? There's the planet Kragoom, which is another one of these Lovecraftian elder gods we keep running into. Kragoom wasn't evil per se, but this planet is incredibly horny. According to Iris Wildtime, Kragoom would shag planets to death. In the Iris Wildtime Appreciation Society, Irish has to stop the planet from doing business with the planet troll. No horny. Bad horny. Weird fact. All Time Lords are supposedly sterile. Everyone thinks Lung Barrow is this epic season finale, and in some ways it is, but mostly it goes to great lengths to talk about Time Lord reproductive cycles. Due to something called Pythia's Curse, Rassilon had to create the looms. And as we know from the beginning of this series of Broke Cannon, all the wombborn of Gallifrey were then exiled or wiped out entirely. <coughs> and lastly, Ace has a foot fetish. Seven wicked things you need to know about Ace. She's an action-packed companion. She collects badges. She has a, a foot fetish. Look, I didn't make this segment to be a kink shamer. I just think it's bizarre how these elements end up in Doctor Who stories. Like, someone published that. People say Stephen Moffat was too overtly sexual in his series. Imagine just casually finding out that Rory had a piss fetish. That's a personal detail. Unfortunately, I don't remember exactly what book this was from. I'm sorry. I just know somewhere that I've read that Ace was fantasizing about a boy and in her internal monologue said she wanted to nibble on his foot. I don't have any proof of this. I can't reference this. Now I look like the creepy crazy sex pervert. It's real, I, I promise you. Lucy Miller has also seen the Eighth Doctor naked. No comment on, you know, what's going on. But she did confirm human genitalia. Yeah, it's valid. Write it down. And hopefully that is the last we have to say about sex in Doctor Who. An upsettingly deep rabbit hole. Take that, JX's dad. Oh my god, it's a class fact. These are rare, you know. It's been said in this series recently how the Doctor will weaponize school children if it's convenient to them. They're like guinea pigs. Or sometimes, the Doctor will randomly assemble a, a team of very young humans. In Class's case, this was the premise of an entire spin-off. Hey, did anybody tell the Doctor that kids in college stay for like two years max? Seriously, have you seen these kids? Just get unit. But as strange and forced a premise as Class is, there are some high points in there. I was actually meant to make a video reviewing it back in 2019. But it's such a batshit ride, I didn't know where to start. I genuinely was stumped and could not organise my thoughts. But did you know that in Canada, there was a Doctor Who class-themed escape room? <laughs> I've been sat on this one for years. A marketing ploy at the peak of escape room's fame, this existed before even Doctor Who ones did. I haven't done any of the Doctor Who escape rooms. My general goal when I enter any room is to escape, so it's really just not for me. Almost no details of this remain online. The escape room situated you in Coal Hill School, where the Doctor has planted a bomb. Thanks, Doctor. The first room is Mrs. Quill's science class, which you come upon soon after it's been abruptly evacuated. Placing an explosive device in a school and trusting it with kids by definition, that makes the Doctor a terror threat. And he couldn't even make things easy. Just give him the password. If there's a bomb, just give him the activation code, please. Miss Quill, the closest thing to an authority figure in class, as her student, she has left you three sets of science-based puzzles, all of which contain clues to throw out the code and detonate the bomb. All of humanity rests on the 15 minutes you are given to complete these. From what I've told you, it sounds like quite a small escape maze. But they made a decent amount of sets. They recreated a good portion of Coal Hill for this. The only existing footage of this thing is the official video on YouTube with 10 views. Shocking. Are there any big contributions to canon here? Yeah. Coal Hill was very nationalistic. 
with huge unavoidable British flags adorning the halls. Remember, this was made in Canada. And also, hey, the 12th Doctor does fraternise with the class crew. We just never saw them again, as the entire cast of class had to return home to their home planet. The destiny of the Doctors is in your hands. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Last time on Brooke Cannon. And hopefully that is the last we have to say about sex in Doctor Who. An upsettingly deep rabbit hole. This time on Brooke Cannon. Um, so according to Robert Holmes, the Sontarans have sex via the back of their neck. The probic vent is how they get off. The Sontarans get off. With each other? I don't know. Sontarans do refer to each other as males. There's that cover where they blatantly have male genitalia. Masculine coded, especially with the goatees, but for the most part, genderless. They're also a clone batch species, so where did sex come into it? Preservation? No. Kinky neck sex is completely recreational. Hey, Bob Holmes, um, why'd you put that in there? <laughs> yeah, sorry, welcome back to the uh, Davis show. Turns out I wasn't even nearly done with all the weird amount of sex references in Doctor Who. Joy. For instance, there is a canonical account of the Master's Junk. Nothing you have experienced on this planet before shall compare with what you are about to witness. In the Faction Paradox series, the Master was stripped nude. Parts of his anatomy seemed kind of withered, like he hadn't had a reason to use them in centuries. <laughs> Excuse me? You're telling me that this man doesn't fuck? Lawrence, you are out of your mind if you think that this incarnation has not got down and dirty. According to Faction Paradox, the Master prefers a bit of... Masturbation. Yes! This is why I've got the series! 500 views, just like that! Then there's Iris Wildtime, who carried a time cock. A Gallifreyan time ring disguised as a black dildo. Can you wilderness years kids behave for like five seconds? I'll, I'll put you in time out, Paul. I wish it was just the wilderness years. Ever since the sex button got turned on, Doctor Who as a franchise has never really been able to turn it off again. In the Gareth Roberts book, I am a Dalek. Uh, quick reads for, for children? The titular Dalek was defeated by the memory of half-hearted sex. Kate's mind was divided. On the Dalek side, there was power, glory, calm. On the human side, there was muddle, darkness, regrets, accidents, headaches, and lost tickets, and scratched DVDs out of their cases, and missed appointments, and embarrassment, apologies, and blown chances, being ill, Christmas, half-hearted sex, Wogan, Ter Terry Wogan, two mental images that do not go together. And with that, the main protagonist of this book overcomes the Dalek programming in her brain. Mummy, what's half-hearted sex? Hell yeah, let's get this guy to write Sarah Jane Adventures. In fact, this whole book is a really weird energy. On page 11, the main character's boss is described as a woman pulling a cardigan over her enormous, unforgiving breasts. I officially apologize to any women watching that you had to hear that in my voice. I hope that in turn, you and your forgiving breasts can forgive me. Quality literature. You want to talk about sex pests? Here's two of them in their own audio adventure. Captain John has his own mini series, as I've said before over on Big Finish. It's quality stuff. So when the obligatory Orgy Planet episode appears, it feels kind of obligatory. <laughs> I take it for granted. Of course there was going to be a sex Orgy Planet. In this, Captain Jack and Captain John are traveling together and resolve pretty much every story by sleeping with that adventure's villain. In this installment, it will not surprise you to learn that Jack and John teach the inhabitants what sex is, freeing them from martial rule as the entire planet gets addicted and breaks out in one giant orgy. This is a real story that you, that you can listen to. Somebody was paid to write it. And no, I know what you're thinking, it was not written by one Jay Barrowman. Thank God. Somebody else was also in my comments telling me that the Doctor had sex with an entire planet. 
Uh, but I've read Interference and I do not remember that. It was part of the novel's framing device on Foreman's world. I just assumed I am Foreman was a... was a man? I'm also told there's a time-traveling killer penis robot knight. So now, now I am done with the sex stuff. I want to move on to a different part of my career now. A new era for the channel. Let's hope I can save what little is left of my public image. Fact number two. Oh, Christmas is starting to come round the corner. It's November. And yesterday I heard Fairy Tale of New York on the fucking radio. Trenzalore! My favourite setting in all of Doctor Who because it hosts my favourite story in all of Doctor Who. Which is why when they released Tales of Trenzalore, I was over the moon. A short story collection of other foes. Big enemies from the Doctor Who roster who tried to man invasions of the town Christmas. Over the centuries, the 11th Doctor stops invasions from Autons, Ice Warriors, the Mara, and Crinoids. All of which, naturally, able to get past the no metal allowed barrier through clever means. Like, uh, not being made of metal. The most interesting story in here is the dreaming. The Mara is more about playing on the minds of the humans that the Doctor has settled down with. Why won't he tell us his name? Does our sheriff think so little of us that he won't even tell us who he is? Ah, uh, no, that's how you get tegan The Mara, the giant snake, sometimes convincing, sometimes unconvincing, arrives on Trenzalore. And it may, <laughs> emphasis on the may here because it's quite unclear, it may have tried to use Tegan's body to manifest itself there. Tegan, arriving on Trenzalore. I'll spare you the impression this time, because I can't do the accent, but I'm sure you can imagine the angry Australian confusement. According to other accounts, Tegan and the Mara are connected for life, merging with its host, becoming a hybrid, even after it was defeated. Because these stories are so surreal, it's not entirely clear. But I have to pray, I have to pray that Tegan was on Trenzalore for like five seconds. Please, God, give me this one thing. In the Auton story, all of the plastic replicants resemble the Doctor. Five Matt Smiths storm into your town. What do you do? Handles defeats the Crinoid, because as we all know, he's the longest lasting companion that the Doctor has ever had. And then somehow ends up in modern day in the Unit Black Archive. Because, I mean, I saw him in person when I went to Time Fracture. I guess he fell into the Time Fracture? Fucking hell, he's got a real story to him. Oh, and the 11th Doctor lost a leg. In time of the Doctor, he's not limping out of old age. He's limping because he lost his leg to a tsunami snake. And this happens kind of at the midpoint of the Siege of Trenzalore. I guess you can do what you want with a Doctor that's about to regenerate, but that's very downplayed on TV. That the Doctor's lost an entire limb. Uh, yeah, and that's Trenzalore. Best story ever, don't at me. And fact number three... You think the Doctor's the only one who got to visit the land of fiction? The Master tried to join Villain Club. A giant round table of all of literature's greatest villains. The Delgado Master comes before the Sisyphean Society. A social club for all of the bad guys of Victorian era fiction. Also in attendance we have Mr. Hyde, Fu Manchu, Dr. Morio, Captain Nemo, Phantom of the Opera, The Invisible Man, Long John Silver, Smee, and the Tiger, Shere Khan. They all come together at the weekends in the land of fiction. The, the council, council will decide your fate. The master begs to join them and is promptly outvoted. Completely whiteboard, which he doesn't take kindly. Challenging them to a battle, he kills a pirate, a tiger, and then is faced with Professor Moriarty leader of the council. The master, with his apparently withered penis, denounces Moriarty. You're just a plot device. Get rid of that Sherlock Holmes. Sending him back to his, sending him back to his untimely fate in the Reichenbach Falls. Suddenly, Dracula appears. Hell yeah, it's not a good Doctor Who story until Dracula appears. Please master, stop killing our council. Dracula offers him the role of chairman, but the master declines because he's just that petty. 
and gives them all a vision of what the 20th century will bring in the way of fiction. Summoning spaceships and War of the World tripods to swarm and kill them all. On one account, I'm glad that the Master gets to meet Dracula and Captain Hook and insult Moriarty. But on the other, it's like, does this guy have any self-awareness? My dude, you are literally a knockoff Moriarty. And wait a second, Moriarty is also a real person in Doctor Who. Oh god, now I've got to look up James Moriarty. Oh, right! Faction fucking paradox! Faction Paradox turned all of the Sherlock Holmes canon into fiction, including James Moriarty, meaning he was a real criminal mastermind who was then turned into literature. Even though some Sherlock Holmes characters still exist as real people. Yeah, don't think I'm forgetting that comic. Oh, I'm giving up. Just know that there are Moriartys in the Doctor Who real world, in the Doctor Who fictional world, and in the Doctor Who afterlife. In the City of the Saved, there are, like, a whole army of them. Sherlock Holmes villain, Professor Moriarty. Hello. I'm Doctor Who. Welcome back to <gasps> The Matrix, and welcome to the Rogue Cannon Rap Party. It's season two, we're done, year two. 50 episodes, 50 billion episodes of this. And you know what's maddening? I still feel like I haven't dipped my toes into the madness of Doctor Who mythology at all. How long is this going to keep going? Am I going to be 75 years old talking about dogmen on the internet? I mean, yeah, that actually does sound very in character. Doctor Who or no Doctor Who. But as a special treat, I decided to use all the Kofi money that's been tipped to me over the past year and commission some help from my favorite online digital artist, Lofi at LaFile Arts. So everything you see in this video is her. Oh my god. The illustrations for these facts are wonderful. Matrix, generate us the good stuff. Over 50 episodes, 200 plus facts, and we've never gotten round to the Sarah Jane adventures. Recently, I found all the audiobooks online. <clears throat> Purchased responsibly back in 2008. There are some absolutely wild stories in here. She heard Clyde busy bragging to his friends about a scheme to spy on the girls' changing rooms. You can imagine Maria's reaction to that. And once Clyde had finished backing away in alarm with his hands guarding his vulnerable areas, he quickly justified himself. I'm not being a perv, he protested. In these, the Bandman Road gang end up battling computer viruses, evil antiques, and wolf aliens and a loving homage to Hound of the Baskervilles? But the absolute wildest is the tenth and final story, Judgment Day, written by Scott Gray. Ah, that explains it. Banman Road, 2011. An alien species beams down to Earth, invading a local car park called the Veritas. <laughs> yeah, they even look a little bit like the monks. The Veritas are an ancient force for justice searching for anybody who does not tell the truth and meeting out painful, harsh judgment. Come to Earth to bring the planet's biggest liar to justice. And this person, no, no, not you, is apparently Miss Sarah Jane Smith. I mean, hey, she is a journalist. Oh, come on. Operating from Manwin Road, having to deny the existence of aliens? has apparently racked up and Sarah Jane Smith is on the Veritas's naughty list. It's boggling to me. There are people on the planet Earth who aren't who they say they are, who live every single day as a lie. Sarah Jane, all credit to her, is running a massive alien fighting operation from her attic. If any old kid stumbles into it, Sarah will be pretty open and say, yeah man, Slitheen, aliens. Here, take this acid, throw it on their face. <laughs> She is liable to the odd cover-up, getting Mr. Smith to change the story in the press. But I insist there is much, much worse than this do-gooder. And it's hilarious to me that <laughs> these arbiters of justice, this ancient form called the Veritas, need to be told that sometimes there's such thing as a good lie. Absolutely adorable. It's very fitting for a kid's show, but it makes a broad generalization about the whole verse. And those are my speciality. There's a lot going on in this story. Uh, Rani and Clyde are being harassed by a, a stage magician. 
whereas Sarah Jane and Luke are being shouted at in a parking lot by these new aliens taking the moral high ground. Apparently the Veritas are so powerful, they can fix all the changes made by her lies. They undo Sarah Jane Smith's impact on the world in seconds. All of this power! And they watch on as the human race goes mental with the knowledge of alien invasions and the paranoia of the next attack. Don't you see? I was only lying to protect the humans. And they listen to her and they change their mind. The power of a god bestowed on a species with a child's sense of judgment. You just found a morality test for toddlers. Instead, the Veritas decide that the second most guilty person on Earth of lying is the stage magician, the great Zando. So then they have to explain to the aliens why he isn't lying either. <laughs> it's just magic. It's just entertainment, guys. Please, dear God, I hope these aliens do not discover cinema or the theatre, because then I think the human race is done for. They won't understand. Why are all these people lying to us? And that's the final Sarah Jane story. Such an adorable child's fable. That's what Sarah Jane is for. There's a really nice send off, a tribute to her character, where we see Sarah Jane writing the cover stories for dinosaurs invading London or the Loch Ness monster destroying oil rigs. You find out that Sarah Jane Smith's entire life has been covering up the doctor's tracks and sometimes doing a much better job than he does. Haha, oh, look at that. Fact number two. River and Javik. Sorry, Javik, I meant Captain Jack Harkness. <laughs> yeah, this was a fun one. It may have become harder to root for Captain Jack Harkness in recent years, but not even John Barrowman's egomaniacal midlife crisis can ruin Jack for me. <laughs> no matter what you say or what you do, they still love me! Late career Jack past Miracle Day is just a washed up sad loser and my favourite iteration of the character. The scapegoat fool guy for some of the universe's darkest stories and unfair tragic fates. The Jack portrayed here by James Goss and John Barrowman is one of my favourite fictional characters ever. And I'm so disappointed we won't be exploring more of that in the near future. One such example of this man's tragic, just awful life is his involvement with River Song. River may get everywhere these days from here, here and here, but River isn't making like a quick tortured cameo in this. She's more like um, Jack's reason for living. <laughs> Get ready to hear Jack appropriately simp like never before, without crossing any inappropriate legal moral barriers. From ancient battles to eternal wars, a pair of time-crossed lovers take the stars. It turns out that due to a bunch of timey-wimey encounters, Jack, Harkness and River Song have known each other for longer than either of them have known the Doctor. And that's pretty wild. The two just keep popping in like a screwball comedy doing the whole Dr. River meeting out of order romance on Fast Forward. And in my opinion, better than Moffat did it. Whoa, high praises today. For instance, did you know that River Song named Jack? Accidentally calling him Captain Jack Harkness? Boom, bootstrap paradox. I'm going to call myself Jack Harkness now. River first met Captain Jack as a little girl, like just mere moments after she regenerates at the end of Day of the Moon. He picks her up, takes her off the street, looks after her. It's adorable. In return, River Song starts showing up all across the Rusty Davis era. Blitz London. Boomtown. <laughs> River fuels the TARDIS up in Boomtown when the Doctor's out on his Slovene date. River Song is jealous of Margaret Slovene. And then in Series 3, River pops into the Valiant to give Jack a hacksaw. Hey River, you think you could like... Help out. Hurry things along a bit. I've been tortured for a year. But it's not all just fan service. You start getting a real kind of kinship between the two. As River tells him about this man she loves. Whilst the two clearly have romantic, deep chemistry. 
Jack is unknowingly giving River relationship advice for the Doctor. And Jack's in love with both of them. Isn't that the most tragic, pathetic thing you've heard? So in a series of space-time dates, they ride a Triceratops. They go and help Jackie Tyler wash a duvet. They attend the face of Bo's funeral. Jesus, is he still not worked it out? And they go to prank Oswald Pink. Shall we go and... Bang on his door? And give him the fright of his life. (laughs) (laughs) The knocking they hear outside and listen, that's Jack and River teasing Orson Pink, giving him a traumatic breakdown. Jack also says that in the other direction, there's an ancient immortal waiting to play chess. There's very few people this could be other than a shielder hanging around in hell bents. Implying, and these aren't my words, that Oswald Pink is stranded on Gallifrey. That, uh, mmm, that really changes that story. And sorry, just how mad is all this? James Goss is a genius, don't get me wrong, but I feel like he's being made to pump out all these big finished stories so fast that there's nobody on quality check who can tell him no. They can't keep up with the man. And are we thinking these two very sexually charged beings do not, do not hook up? But eventually we arrive on Derillium, where River bumps into. <laughs> what a surprise! You're here, Jack. Hey, yeah, I'm. I'm not stalking you. I'm not stalking you. And it's here, realizing that River Song's husband is Peter Capaldi, that she finally gently lets him down. Mere seconds before she goes to join the Doctor on the balcony. (laughs) He's right there. In this scene, he's right there. Thank God we were spared the awkward version where the Doctor spots him and makes eye contact. All in all, this story takes such a weird concept as Jack and River are lovers and convinces me that it's a better romance than she shares with the Doctor. I don't know how he quite did it. Ah, you can't change your DNA, Melody. Though in some ways... Maybe she dodged a bullet. They still love me. Fact number three. All right, so this one's just about sphinxes. <laughs> you mind if I talk about sphinxes for a bit? The sphinxes are probably the strongest gods in the universe. Yes, they were an actual species that existed before the dark times. Living creatures of magic who lived on Earth? <laughs> I think forget faction paradox. Forget Iris Wild Time, the strangest Wilderness Years edition, the most fun one, are the fact that the kings of space are giant sphinxes. Ah, oh, god, sphinx space. Uh, sphinx space is an area of the galaxy controlled by the gods with a bunch of giant lions flying around the place. In Faction Paradox, the evil renegade, <clears throat> the master, supposedly took slaves into that area of space and waged a one-man war on the great gods, who, in this instance, in this verse, apparently are sphinxes. So why don't we hear about them more? Well, actually, we kind of do. Ten and Donna battled a sphinx person when they teamed up with Jason and the Argonauts. Shot dead. There's the Sphinx of Thule, an ancient creature, the most powerful augur in the nine corners of the universe. Right, so just... The strongest thing in the universe, then. This villain took over galaxies, controlled minds, and worse, spoke entirely in riddles. Eventually, it was slayed by the Gallifreyan hero Pridonius, who took its head back to the archives to study. The Sleeping Beast! You know the Great Sphinx? One of the fucking wonders of the world? It's a Doctor Who villain. That very same Sphinx was put there by the Kryptolians. A bunch of aliens whose evil plan was to plant billions of leonine stone robots. Huh? Sure, okay, I've heard worse. Basically planting killing machines to overthrow whatever species evolved around them. And there's a ton. There's Sphinx statues left in Egypt, Atlantis, and Mars. Relegated to non-sentient stone statues. But uh, also, uh, depending on who you believe, I guess, the Asirans built the one in Egypt. You can't both claim the same villain plan, guys. The funniest example is in the Missy book. Look at her up there. 
Cut to Missy, who has tracked one down in the middle of 19th century London. There's still a little bit of life left in this lion statue. Now, despite going to war against the Sphinxes in a previous possible maybe form, Missy decides, naturally, to free this god and let it loose upon London. Using a blood ritual. <laughs> she woke up an inert god and only then thought, ah, hang on, that's actually quite dangerous. So yeah, God lived on Earth and the gods were giant sphinxes. Because, you know, anything that our culture didn't make was probably... probably aliens, right? I'm sad to say, all the sphinxes disappeared back in the olden days. Rassilon and company hunted down anybody who used sorcery. They had to make a nice rational world so there was no place for witches and sphinxes. <laughs> the dark time sounds wild. And we never get to see the fun stuff. So they swapped their magic for technology and became endangered stone statues. To me, that makes total sense. Ah, look at those drawings. I feel honored. I want to put them up on my wall. I command you to check out Lofi's portfolio and Twitter page. All links will be in the description. Absolutely blown away by these. Not everybody would be so chill. We've asked you to put a Victorian dressed woman on top of a flying sphinx. You know, there's no reference for that. And that brings us to another good year of Broke Cannon. <laughs>